Welcome to the fifth and final day of the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit. Today, we'll be kicked off by Sienna Castellan's keynote presentation in a couple of minutes. Then we'll have a neurodiverse employee panel. Before lunch at 11, Marcel Champy, uh, also known as um, Samantha Kraft, will talk about tips for job seekers and employees on the spectrum. For those of you who have signed up for your networking sessions, please look for the email sent by the speaker that you have signed up to meet. In the afternoon at 1 p.m. Pacific time, we will have three hours of discussions on entrepreneurship opportunities and uh, its relationship uh, with neurodiversity. At the end of the conference from 4.30 to 6.30, we'll have our final concluding session where moderators will summarize the key points of the sessions of the entire conference and bring out actionable proposals relevant to the theme of the summit, scaling up the neurodiversity at work initiatives. The audience will be invited to ask questions and make comments and reflections on the materials they have learned and provide feedback to us for consideration. We would like to let you know that all sessions are recorded and transcribed. The recordings are um, partially available on our summit website already and will be posted um, in entirety after the summit. All questions from the audience will be submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The moderators will try to cover as many questions as possible. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Sienna Castell. Sienna is an internationally recognized neurodiversity advocate who is autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, and also has ADHD. She is the founder of Neurodiversity Celebration Week an international campaign that encourages schools to flip the, narr the narrative from focusing on the challenges and drawbacks of being neurodivergent to focusing on the strengths and talents. In 2020, over half a million students from over 760 schools took part in the Neurodiversity Celebration Week from around the world. Sienna is also the best-selling author of The Spectrum Girls Survival Guide, How to Grow Up Awesome and Autistic. Sienna has won many awards for her work, to name a few of the numerous that uh, she has won. Uh, she has won the BBC Radio uh, Teen Hero Award in 2018 that's selected from across the uh, United Kingdom. She has, um, uh, BBC also created a short film about her and her autism advocacy and anti-bullying campaign, which was aired at the Teen Hero Award at Wembley Arena in front of 10,000 teenagers and was televised on BBC to millions of viewers. The Prime Minister of, you, uh, of the United Kingdom also um, gave her a, an, a Points of Light Award in 2018. Um, so Prime Minister uh, Theresa May uh, uh, noted that she, she is an outstanding, Sienna is an outstanding and inspirational volunteer for making a positive change in the community she is serving. The Shaw Trust in uh, London also selected her as one of the 100 most influential, dif differently abled people in the United Kingdom, working towards to change society's attitude towards disability. She has won the um, Neurodiversity Genius Within Awards, Genius of the Year Award, and uh, she is one of the uh, she, she, is, uh, she also won the Shine a Light Award in 2019 and uh, was Young Person of the Year, um, was given the Young Person of the Year Award for her anti-bullying campaign and neurodiversity advocacy. She was uh, 
She is one of the fi three finalists for the International Children's Peace Prize. Past winners of this prize include Greta Thunberg, who, who is uh, the Time Magazine Person of the Year last year, as well as Malala uh, Yousafzai, the uh, Pakistani activist for female education and the youngest Nobel Prize laureate. Sienna was recently chosen among over 7,000 candidates as one of the 17 United Nations Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals. She is using the United Nations Global Platform to raise awareness of neurodiversity and recognizing, supporting, harnessing the uh, overlooked strains and talents of people who think differently and perceive the world differently. With this, I'm going to uh, pass it to uh, Sienna, who, who is going to give this uh, keynote presentation titled Autism Addressing Pre-Employment Challenges and Barriers. Please join me in welcoming Sienna Castellan. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for that amazing introduction. I'm just going to share my slides now. Good morning, everybody. As Lawrence mentioned, my name is Sienna Castellan. I'm thrilled to be speaking to you from the UK and excited to be reaching so many people from around the world. If COVID has shown us anything, it is that we have been under using virtual platform technology. The virtual Stanford Neurodiversity Summit is a perfect example of how we can use technology to reach across oceans and borders and make conferences available to disabled people who may not have otherwise been able to use them. Today, I will be talking about how companies can address the pre-employment pre barriers and challenges that prevent many autistic people from accessing job opportunities. Although I am autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, and have ADHD, I will be focusing on autism rather than on other neurological differences because the communication difficulties and sense challenges associated with autism present much bigger barriers to employment. Although all neuro-minority groups face employment challenges, autistic people are particularly disadvantaged when seeking employment. According to the National Autistic Society, only 16% of autistic people are in full-time employment. Many autistic people have the ability and desire to work Yet despite the rise in inclusion and diversity initiatives, autism employment rates remain stubbornly and alarmingly low. There are many reasons for this. For one, companies still base their hiring initiatives on outdated and rigid models that do not allow for flexibility and are inadvertently designed to weed out neurodiversities. <laughs> around autism, which can result in discriminatory employment practices. I will caveat that I just turned 18 and so have limited employment experience. Having said that, my experience has been that many autism-focused employment initiatives focus on stereotypical autistic savant strengths and talents, such as mathematics and computer programming. The programs also revolve around recruiting autistic white men. Although these autism focused employment initiatives are needed and are a step in the right direction, these initiatives are far too narrow and exclude a large sector of the autistic community. I happen to fit into the autistic stereotype in that I am good at math and physics, but I'm in the minority. Autistic people have much wider strengths and talents. And so pigeonholing us and depicting us only being good at STEM 
is doing the majority of the autistic community a huge disservice and is preventing companies from accessing a huge talent pool. If we are to increase employment opportunities for the autistic community, we will need to reframe the limited and myopic way in which we look at autistic strengths and talents. Many of the same qualities and attributes that make autistic people so successful in the fields of science are transferable skills that will be valuable in almost every other sector of employment. As Dr. Nancy Doyle mentioned in her keynote talk, many autism focused employment initiatives are also focusing on mining autistic people who are already highly desirable and competitive in that they have graduate degrees in sought after fields. People are very likely to find employment because companies are falling over themselves to hire them. However, these autistic people represent a minuscule percentage of the autistic community. There need to be more initiatives aimed at supporting the employment of average autistic individuals. Individuals who may not be the next Einstein or Hawkins, but who can still be a valuable asset to, um, to, to an organization. In particular, there need to be more initiatives aimed at supporting autistic youth. I have a friend who I believe is listening to my talk, who has applied to dozens of apprenticeship jobs. However, since many of the jobs have unnecessary online maths and English proficiency tests, green he's applied to. Yet I have no doubt that if he was given a chance and was able to get his foot in the door, he would be a model employee. Finding employment for autistic graduate students from prestigious universities is easy. The greater focus should be on providing employment opportunities for autistic individuals who are eager to work, but who may not have a college degree. In this presentation, I will be focusing on the pre-employment challenges and barriers that are contributing to low employment rates. I will also be talking about some of the policies and procedures that may deter autistic people from applying to jobs and the steps companies can take to address this. In addition, I will be discussing how companies can create more inclusive initiatives that will set autistic people up for success. Finally, I will tell you about my Neurodiversity Celebration Week initiative and invite you to become part of the worldwide movement to create more neuro-minority inclusive schools and environments. Many autism employment initiatives focus on the actual interview and how to create an autism friendly environment for autistic employees. However, in order for autism employment rates to rise, these employment initiatives need to begin much earlier in the recruitment process. Although challenges and barriers to employment exist at all stages of recruitment process, it's important that companies don't overlook the early beginning stages of the re recruitment process, such as the wording of job description and the content and design the application forms. I am really sorry. I just discovered I'm using the wrong presentation. Um, I'm just gonna stop share and I'm gonna be back in one second. I'm so sorry, I can't believe I didn't realize this earlier. No worries.
I am so sorry. Does somebody have my slides? Um, yes, I can. I can right? share. I can share. Would slides. it be okay if you shared the slides? Yes. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what's no. happening. I've never had these. No worries. No worries. I'll start. So sorry about that. Um, could you go to slide four, please? Thank you. Um, so like, I, I don't know what happened. I've never, that's never happened to me before. Okay. Um, move on to slide five. Thank you so much. I urge companies to be particularly mindful a job description that emphasizes skills that autistic individuals struggle with and that is an inherent aspect of our disability is going to be a red flag and is going to discourage us from applying. Next time the opportunity presents itself, take a moment to read the average job description. It is likely that the job description will include lots of default skills that are not essential for the job such as being a good team player, That's not the right presentation. Um, having a good, excellent communication skills and having strong leadership skills, tact and diplomacy. To give you a concrete example, I'm going to read the description for a part-time personal assistant job that I randomly found online. knows how to manage multiple tasks while providing customers with the best possible service. You also need to be a good communicator with the ability to build strong professional relationships and emphasize with people's needs. Lawrence, would it be okay if you move to the first slide? Um, the one at the very, that, thank you so much. As an autistic person, this job advert would send me running in the opposite direction. Ask yourself, what do these terms actually mean in this context? How is this company defining empathy? What is meant by strong professional relationships? As used, these terms are very broad and ambiguous. Ask yourself, does a job as a personal assistant real, really require empathy and the ability to build strong professional relationships? Additional examples that I've lifted from the UK government job website earlier today. In a job ad for a clerical assistant, the description states that the person needs to be able to deal with sensitive issues with tact and diplomacy using effective communication skills. In a job ad for a customer service job, the description states that they are looking for someone with a general passion to please and seek resolutions with the ability to influence and push back in a polite and professional manner. In a job ad for a night concierge at a youth hospital, the description states that the person needs to have good teamwork skills. When drafting job descriptions, companies have to be clear and precise about the skills that are truly essential for a particular job. Does a clerical job involve, does a clerical job that involves filing and making photocopies really require the able to deal issues with tact and diplomacy while using effective communication skills? Does a night concierge really need good teamwork and skills? Does a customer service job really require someone with general passion to please? Companies could be losing lots of excellent candidates simply because of the way that the job description is worded. Many of us will read between the lines. If I were to read a job description that heavily emphasizes empathy, strong verbal communication, and being a team player, it would be a strong indication that the company environment and culture would be unsuitable for someone who is autistic. Is this the message that a company really wants to convey? In terms of finding job opportunities, online job searches often produce results that are vague and misleading, which can make it difficult for autistic people to know whether a job is 
Methods with withhold key information, such as their name, the job location, salary, and working hours. Since autistic individuals lack certainty, we may be put off by applying to a job that contains little to no substantive information. What can you do? For starters, make job descriptions clear, precise, and easy to understand. Cut out the flowery, superfluous language. Include a much more concrete information about the job as possible. Include details about the job role, the company, compensation, and working hours. For example, set out the responsibilities and duties the person will be expected to fulfill and any essential skills and qualifications. Avoid using desirable criteria or personality traits, such as must empathize with people's needs, since these companies base their recruitment strategies on hiring employees to fit a company's atmosphere, environment, or culture. This type of recruitment is commonly referred to as cultural fit. Cultural fit is the likelihood that a person will be able to conform and adapt to the core values and collective behaviors of the existing people in the organization. In other words, cultural fit is an autistic person's worst nightmare. Expecting an, an autistic individual to blend into the culture of an organization is basically setting them up to fail. Expecting autistic individuals to expend their energy on masking, hiding who they are so they can appear to fit into your company culture, and expecting autistic individuals to act like everybody else will lead to job dissatisfaction, mental health issues, and their eventual rest. This corporate ideology also misses the point. One of the many benefits of hiring an autistic person is that we walk to the beat of a different drum. We see the world differently. We approach things differently. We go against the grey and can challenge convention. It is these qualities that lead to progress and innovation. Creating a culture in which everyone is the same, in which everyone fits in and everyone behaves in the same way, leads to stagnation and maintaining the status quo. I believe that echo chamber thinking prevents progress and innovation and that organizations should strive to have a diverse and inclusive workforce. One of the big challenges that companies face in relation to hiring autistic individuals is that many of us are very reluctant to disclose our diagnosis. Given the significant stigma that is associated Many of us are afraid of how they would react. In particular, we may be concerned that disclosing our autism diagnosis may reduce our chances of getting the job. We may also be concerned about whether disclosing our autism will lead to prejudice and discrimination. As a consequence, many autistic people choose not to disclose. So what can companies do? Instead of waiting for an autistic individual to disclose their diagnosis and expecting them to ask for interview accommodations, companies should be proactive in adopting and implementing inclusive recruitment procedures and language. For example, in job ads, affirmatively state that the applications are welcome from people with disabilities. This sends a signal that your company is inclusive. Highlight your company's inclusion practices such as when we undertake mandatory autism awareness training, disability training, equality and diversity training, invite applications to be open about any accommodations they may need. By emphasizing your company's initiatives that support disabled people, you are signaling that your company is a place that welcomes and values autistic people and other neuro-minorities. Another challenge that autistic people face is that many application forms are inaccessible. Filling in an application form can be a daunting prospect for most individuals, but especially for autistic people. Most application forms have lots of boxes to tick in and lots of different types of questions. This can be overwhelming and can leave us feeling disheartened and unable to fill the form to the best of our ability. Some simple changes can mean the difference between an autistic person being able to fill the 
to the best of their ability or not to fill it out at all. Forms and accompanying instructions are unclear and confusing. Each section should be labelled clearly to emphasise where one section ends and another begins. This enables the applicant to break down the form into its component parts and fill in each one as they go, knowing that they have finished one section before moving on to the next one. Companies should also try to avoid jargon and acronyms if possible. Be specific on the application form and try to avoid abstract terminology. For example, asking the applicant to give five weaknesses or strengths can be interpreted in multiple ways. A better way to word this question is such a way to elicit the information the employer is looking for is to reword the question to state, give five strengths you can bring to this job and explain why you allow benefits company. This statement is more specific and focused than the previous one and points the applicant in the direction that you want them to go in. Much too often, it's not obvious what information the applicant is being asked to provide. For example, some forms will ask for additional information or for other relevant information. What does relevant mean in this context? It is important for companies to keep their forms simple, to use clear and precise language. Instructions should also be written in a plain language that most people will understand. What can you do? Be specific about how much information you want and what you are expecting the candidate to write in their answers. For example, instead of asking what do you have suitable for this role, rephrase to provide more structure and guidance. Instead, the form could state, we are looking for an individual who is able to work independently using their initiative to complete tasks. Please give us an example of a time where you've used your initiative. Replacing open-ended and ambiguous questions with precise questions can cut to the heart of what companies really want to know. It will not only help autistic people, it will benefit everyone. Many companies still use applicant screening tools, such as aptitude tests or personality tests. Most autistic individuals and neurominorities underperform on these tests. These tests are often unclear and people are often not given much information and guidance about how to complete them. The strict time limits under which the test needs to be people and other neuro-minorities. Personality tests are likely to flag and filter out autistic individuals for being antisocial, being loners, and for not being team players. What can you do? Get rid of these screening tools when possible. If necessary, ask direct questions about a candidate's personality in the body of the application form. It probably won't come as a surprise to you that the majority of autistic people suffer from social anxiety. While the prospect of attending a job interview is something that most people find quite daunting, the uncertainty and social emphasis is particularly challenging for autistic people. For example, it is difficult to anticipate the kind of questions which may be asked or even the format of the interview. It can be particularly distressing for autistic people. Concerns may include who is going to be interviewing me? How many people are going to interview me? What is the environment going to be like? What can you do? Adopt a recruitment procedure that makes it clear about what kind of interview style the candidate can accept, can expect. For example, is it a formal or group interview? Will a presentation be required? If the person discloses a disability, consider whether accommodations or adjustments can be made or whether an alternative format can be offered. For example, instead of a formal interview, a work-based two-day trial may be a better option for someone who finds it difficult to sell their skills and abilities through verbal communication. Include as many details and information about the interview as possible 
process, providing interview questions in advance of the interview, providing direction to the location of the interview, including a map and photographs of the entrance to the building, the procedure for arriving at an interview location, the names of the people who will be on the interview panel, and information about what their role will be during the interview. How long the interview is expected to last. A clear timetable of events during the allocated interview time. Guidance about what candidates are expected to wear. If possible, offer to provide a quiet and calm space for the candidate to wait prior to their interview, away from other visitors or general staff. Much of this information will benefit all prospective employees, not just autistic ones. By way of example, one week work at the CL Center for Autism, for research in autism education. When they interviewed me, they sent me an email. It included the address, a map, and photos of the exterior of the building. The email also told me who to contact once I arrived and stated the, the, the time and the meeting would take place in an office on a fourth floor, but that if that were unsuitable, the meeting can be moved to a room on the ground floor. The tone and content of the email served to reassure me that I was going to be interviewed in an environment that was inclusive and sensitive to my needs. In advance of an interview, it can be extremely helpful to provide as much information about what will happen on the day as possible. This will help to eliminate surprises that could induce anxiety and hinder the person. Consider any sense. For example, are there any scheduled fire alarms? Are there going to be any events happening? Do you have building work going on outside? Encourage the candidate to tell you if there are things that distract them or if any environmental changes are required. To circle back to where I started this presentation, as I previously mentioned, most autism recruitment initiatives focus on hiring in the tech fields, such as software, coding, and machine learning roles, and focus on recruiting and hiring autistic men. Too many autism-related initiatives pigeonhole all autistic people based on stereotypical autism skills. It's important to look beyond this. Keep in mind that women can be autistic, although we traditionally have been undiagnosed, this is slowly starting to change. It's also important to remember that there are many types of autistic brains, which means we have many different strengths and talents to offer. We are not all pattern thinkers and mathematicians who will excel in IT. There are those of us who are visual thinkers who will be great graphic designers, artists, and photographers. And, all, and those of us who are verbal thinkers will make excellent journalists. Organizations need to become more open to hiring autistic people for a wider range of appropriate roles beyond tech. Common skills and attributes often associated with autism include highly focused concentration, innovation, creativity, having unique problem solving skills, careful attention to detail and accuracy, out of the box thinking, being honest, reliable, and dependable. These are highly transferable and can be applied to a wide range of jobs beyond just the tech industry. To recap, organizations should clearly state that they encourage applications from all candidates with the right experience and qualifications. They should also encourage individuals to request accommodations, reasonable adjustments that will help them to perform to the best of their abilities. If you want to attract neuro-minority candidates, make it known that your organization has sound neurodiverse policies and training in place and give assurances that your company will provide a supportive and inclusive work environment. Since the pandemic is likely to disproportionately um, affect marginalized groups, such as the autistic community, autism inclusive recruitment initiative, 
something more. In order to change the significant social and employment disadvantage experienced by autistic people, we need to start focusing on their strengths rather than focusing on their deficits and their weaknesses. By rethinking their management attitudes and practices and making small adjustments, companies can begin to harness the strengths, attributes, talents, and skills that make autistic people huge assets in the workplace. Some of the greatest inventions and some of the most revolutionary contributions that transformed our lives and the world we live on were made by people who are autistic, by people who think differently and see the world differently. So when we squander this resource, when we squander the strengths and talents of autistic individuals, everyone suffers. We are poorer for it. In 2018, I launched my an initiative that aims to change the way neuro-minorities are perceived and treated at school. As someone who is autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, and has ADHD, and just graduated from high school, I know how demoralizing our school experience can be. My initiative has three main objectives. The first is to flip the narrative from only focusing on weaknesses and challenges, and also recognizing and nurturing strengths and talents. Since most classroom teachers do not receive any training on how to identify and support neuro-minority students, my second aim is to educate teachers by providing free and easily accessible resources that they can download from my website. The last aim is to change existing stereotypes and misconceptions about autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and ADHD, so that teachers and students can be more taught Most school curriculums are focused on identifying and working on our weaknesses and perceived deficits. This means that we spend most of our time at school being told what we are bad at, which affects our confidence and self-esteem. Although it is important to address key weaknesses, it's just as important to recognize, nurture, and develop individual strengths and talents. There is a societal misconception that we should spend most of our time working on improving our weaknesses which means that we often neglect our talents and strengths. However, studies have shown that we gain the most from focusing and developing our strengths and talents. We also experience increased satisfaction, happiness, confidence, and self-worth from nurturing our strengths. For example, the Corporate Leadership Council studied nineteen countries. It found that an emphasis on performance strength and appraisal was linked to a 36.4% improvement in performance. In contrast, an emphasis on performance weakness was linked to a 26.8% decline in performance. So why aren't we focusing on strengths and talents? Most education systems also focus on areas that aren't that important in real life, and yet overlook skills that are key to a successful career in most sectors. For example, Many neuro-minority students excel in areas such as problem solving, creativity, innovation, and outside the box thinking. But these are not skills that are valued by schools. Most of the time, we're expected to learn parrot style by regurgitating information verbatim. Since neuro-minority students are not good at this type of memorization learning, we focusing on what we can't do without balancing this by also recognizing many things we can do often causes neuro-minority students to feel demoralized and dejected. Many simply giving up. It doesn't have to be this way. Our schools should be uplifting and encouraging all students, not just neurotypical ones. Another area my initiative focuses on is creating resources for teachers. Most teachers in the UK don't receive any training on how to identify autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and ADHD. This is shocking, given that 20% of students in their class have one of these conditions. Unfortunately, this means that many students who have a learning difference are missed. For years, I was called stupid, lazy, and scatterbrained by my teachers. I would write really imaginative 
I teach really emphasize on my poor spelling. Over the years, my parents repeatedly asked whether I could be dyslexic, and they were definitely told that it was not possible because I was an advanced reader and dyslexic children can't read. This misconception delayed my diagnosis. When I was 10, an amazing teacher recognized that there was a significant disparity between the quality of my writing and my spelling, and noticed that when I read aloud, I paraphrased and couldn't pronounce proper nouns, such as uncommon names and unfamiliar cities and places. She suspected I had visually memorized all the words, which turned out to be true. I mention this story because it goes to show how much damage a teacher or school can inadvertently do to a child simply because they don't have any knowledge on learning differences or because they are relying on I suspect the teachers who called me stupid would never have thought I was capable of writing a best-selling book at the age of 16, yet that is what I did, which goes to show that teachers need much more training on, so that they can have the tools to identify and support students like me. Finally, the third aim of my initiative is to challenge prevalent misconceptions and stereotypes about people who are autistic or have learning differences. I was bullied at school for most of my life. In fact, I had to change school two times because of bullying. A 2017 study by Ditch the Label found that 70% of autistic students report being bullied. This has to change. My experience has been that instead of addressing the bullying behavior, schools expect me to change. I was told that I needed to work on fitting in. Victim blaming someone for being bullied for a disability is wrong and only serves to compound their sense of helplessness. Instead, schools need to redirect their focus on addressing and preventing bullying behavior. Schools shouldn't expect autistic students to mask and repress their autism so that they can avoid being abused. Schools should focus on fostering and teaching tolerance, acceptance, and inclusion of all types of people. I hope to play a part in bringing this about. I am particularly excited about having recently been appointed as one of the 17 young leaders for the Sustainable Development Goals, because this new role will give me an opportunity to collaborate with the United Nations on projects that amplify and support my Neurodiversity Celebration Week initiative. I currently have over half a million students from around part in Neurodiversity The next step Neurodiversity Celebration will be, will be on March 15th to 21st in 2021. If you are school, please register to take part. Finally, earlier in my presentation, I mentioned that women can be autistic too. Unfortunately, there is still a concept that only boys and men can be autistic. I'm frequently told I can't be autistic because I'm a girl. The fact that most initiatives and resources are geared around supporting autistic boys motivated me to write a book specifically aimed at supporting girls. My book, The Spectrum Girl Survival Guide, How to Grow Up Awesome and Autistic, contains the type of practical information that I wish to Since autistic girls face different challenges to autistic boys, I felt it was important to address this. I also felt it was important to write a book that wasn't aimed at parents and that was written by a teenager with lived experience. In writing the book, it was important to me that everyone who, who was involved was female and autistic. The awesome Dr. Temple Grandin wrote the foreword and Rebecca Burgess, an incredibly talented autistic illustrator, did the drawings. I hope that my book will play a part in broadening people's perception of autism beyond the male stereotype so that autistic girls and women do not continue to go undiagnosed. In closing, if you take one thing away from my talk, I hope that it is, whatever the industry, whatever the sector, we can't afford to waste the talents, 
minority. If we are to solve the global issue that we face, such as pandemics and climate change, it will take all kinds of different minds. Thank you. Thank you, Sienna, for such an inspiring and thoughtful talk this morning. I um, particularly enjoyed your uh, specific examples that you gave of um, some really simple changes that can be made uh, to the different uh, part of recruiting and hiring processes. Um, so thank you for for that and for really um, laying it out in great detail, kind of what are some of the things that can be done. Um, we have some questions from uh, attendees. Um, so I will uh, just jump right into those if that uh, that works for you. Of course. Okay, um, so this one is about, I think the term company culture. Um, the question is, do you see ways to change company culture? And that's in quotes, to be more accommodating of autistic individuals so that the term is no longer as discriminatory? I think that it's really um, to talk to those companies and explain the impact that it's having. Because many companies just think, oh, well, we want our employees to feel happy, to feel part of the community, to feel accepted within the work environment. What they don't understand is they're actually having the opposite impact on autistic and neuro-minority groups. And so trying to convey that and get the message out there that that community atmosphere can be very damaging is really important. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, another one, this is also on uh, communica communication styles asks, uh, notes, it is worth noting that um, a lot of neurotypical communication tends to mean something other than what the literal statement would apply. Have you had any experience establishing clear communication between neurotypical employers and autistic can candidates that focused on this aspect? Yeah, I've, I've talked, um, I work for the Mayor of London with the GLA and I talked about how to have inclusive interview practices. And it's very important to just say what you mean. Um, one example I would give is one time I was doing a talk and somebody asked me, how can you build a bridge between autistic and neurotypical people? And I immediately froze because I thought a literal bridge because I'm, I can be rather literal, especially when I'm nervous and I'm not kind of focusing on that. And so I didn't really know how to answer the question. And even though know what they meant it wasn't specific enough for me to answer and so I think that really considering what you're what you're trying to say is very important and coming across clearly and concisely thank you and I I again think that your examples were so helpful in that and really un, and really thinking through because I think so often um we don't consider what it is that that we're truly intending um, by the communication. So that was that has been really helpful in thinking about. So we have another question here from a parent um, or a parent coach actually. Um, and this one says, I'm a parent coach and a lot of the parents I work with have children who are autistic, ADHD, Asperger's, dyslexic, dyspraxic, dyscalculic, have sensory and or auditory processing issues and more. A prevalent theme is the struggle to open up the dialogue between school and young person and family as to a strengths-based approach rather than purely remediation. What would you suggest for encouraging schools to support autistic young people? That is something that I have definitely struggled with throughout my whole school experience. Um, and, you know, I remember being, you know, eight years old and having conversations about my learning and the way I didn't know I was autistic, but how my symptoms were impacting me. And a lot of times, um, you know, that conversation is made more difficult by misconceptions that teachers may have. I mean, I was told once um, when I was, you know, when I disclosed that I was autistic to a teacher, she said, everyone's a little bit autistic. I'm a bit autistic, she said, I'm a bit autistic because this morning, you know, I made a bit of a social mistake 
And so everyone has that. You've just been diagnosed. Everyone can. And I then tried to have a conversation with her about how she could help me with my autism and how she could help me by making little reasonable adjustments in the classroom. It was very difficult to do because we were on different platforms. I was going in with a, I am an autistic person and I need these adjustments. And she was going in from a, everyone's autistic. Everyone would love to have these little adjustments here and there, but that's just life. You can't have them. And it was very difficult to do. And so I think the most important thing is to just crush those that narratives and crush that like misconception and stigma. And I'm trying to do that through my neurodiversity celebration week through, um, you know, my book, just talking more about autism and girls, because some people still believe that you can't be a girl and be autistic. Um, but it's, it's really hard. And I can completely sympathize with people who are struggling with getting through to people who just don't understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a process. Um, to do that. And actually, as part of that, we've had a number of questions um, or people asking, how can they um, get access to your resources and your website? Yeah, so you can, um, you can look me up and I have links all over. Um, you can go to my QL mentoring website. Um, that's a website where I mentor and support children with learning differences you can go to www.siennacastellon.com where you can get my book and you can look up Neurodiversity Celebration Week to sign up to my week. Great, thank you. I think a lot of people will be taking a look at that. Um, so back to the uh, some of the other questions. Um, one question a uh, person states, I'm really glad that you mentioned what is good for autistic candidates is good for all candidates. Do you have recommendations for universal design resources? Um, as in like websites that they can visit to get more information on that? I think it might be, yes. I think just sort of how, how you conceptualize universal design and what might be resources people could go to to think about how, how to make um, changes that are good for all candidates, including autistic candidates. Are there resources out there that you use? Definitely. Um, I worked with UCL on their disability service project. And as part of that, they wanted me to come in and give the perspective and autism as an autistic person and just kind of help them figure out how to make, um, you know, their university um, better suited for autis autistic and neuro minority groups. And through doing that, I was on all the different websites trying to find as many resources as possible. Um, but I find that it really depends on what you want. To look for. When I was doing that, I found that Cambridge and Oxford in the UK have really good um, autism, you know, resources. They have departments that, um, you know, help students with any problems that they're having. They have computers that they give to um, their students who have reasonable adjustments for that. Really incredibly supportive. And I was finding other universities all over the place. And it was just through looking it up and trying to find um, other people who were doing good work. And so I think that it just depends what angle you're coming from. You know, if you want to look at how a university can be better suited, how a primary school, just um, just really research it and try to find people who are, who are doing good work because there are quite a few out there. Thank you. Um, this is a question returning to um, recruitment and the topic of recruitment. Um, does the move for recruitment to to become more virtual gives scope for hiring to be more inclusive. Um, and a second piece of that is, does technology itself need to do more to help? Um, just through you know, the COVID lockdown, I have found that um, it's really improved my life in, in some ways and in other ways it's been a bit difficult, but definitely through using virtual platforms, it's given me, um, you know, it's broadened the opportunities that I have. As someone who is autistic, has a sensory processing disorder, really struggles with public transport, struggles with you know going to meetings and meeting people face to face and having to have the right body language and the right posture and shake someone's hand in the right way, to just join a Zoom call and to see them face to face and have the same conversation, present the same ideas, but without all of that kind of the social aspect 
And also without the sensory aspect. I remember when I would go to award shows, there were times when they would have bright lights that they would light the stage with. They would have microphones that were really loud. And I, with my luck, I was always right next to the speaker. And so I had to deal with that. And I would have you know, panic attacks sometimes at these events that weren't autism friendly. About an hour ago, I joined, um, I joined an award show that was virtual. And I was able to do it in my own home, which you know I've set up so that I don't have the same sensory problems. And there was no anxiety to it. And that was the first time that I've done an award show without having that anxiety. Um, and also just you know going and having, you're talking to people and having conversations. There's no longer all of that stress that comes with the sensory and the social. And it's really given me more opportunities and also helped my mental health because I no longer have that same anxiety that I used to. And so I think that, that definitely there are more opportunities and just benefits to this virtual platform that we've been using. Yes, it really does sound like it. And that actually leads to another question. Um, it's sort of a, almost a follow-up to, uh, to your response on that one. Um, this is from someone who says, as an autistic individual, can you help me understand how you are able to do what you do? Um, so sort of a, a follow-up to how, how do you go to all those award shows? How do you speak in public? What are some of the things that, that, you're, that are helpful to you? Well, I think that, um, that one of the best things that happened to me was starting really slowly. I remember when I first started my advocacy, it was a website, my first website, QL Mentoring. And then I started getting some invitations to give a speech. And so I would go and it would be a speech to three people and they'd all be on their phones, very small things. And I would get incredibly anxious about it. Like just to talk to three people, it would, I would worry about it the week before and, and then I'd do it and it would be really stressful. And then maybe a month later, I'd get another opportunity and I'd give another speech to a very small group. And then eventually, as I started doing more speeches, the audience grew. And because I was kind of, you know, going in very slowly and it was a gradual progression to bigger audiences, I didn't have that increased anxiety. The most anxiety I've ever had giving a speech was that first speech I gave in front of three people. I later gave a speech with the BBC and I accepted an award in front of 10,000 people who were there in person and then millions of people who were watching. And I didn't have anywhere near the same anxiety I had to that group of three people. And it was because I had slowly worked myself in and slowly gotten used to it. And another thing that I found valuable was also just realizing my worth in many ways. Um, before I would, I wanted people to like me when I was, you know, reaching out to people for the first time. And I didn't want to appear as difficult. I didn't want to appear like I was going to be a challenge. And so I wouldn't ask for reasonable adjustments. I wouldn't ask for lots of little details. If someone told me, oh, I want to meet with you and this is the location, I wouldn't say, okay, well, I'm directionally challenged. Can you send me directions? Can you send me a photo of, the, of where you want to meet? I would just show up an hour in advance and like worry about trying to figure out where it is. Um, I wouldn't ask people like, okay, you you want me to meet you here? Is this going to be a sensory? Is this going to um, help with my sensory processing disorder? Am I going to get stressed? I wouldn't ask any of that. And I'd get really stressed out. Mm -hmm. But then as I started doing more of it and I started gaining confidence when people asked me, um, oh, do you want to meet up? I would say, yeah, I would love to meet up with you. These are the things I need to do. This is the information I need. Um, and this is the kind of environment I want to meet up with you in. And this is what would help me. And it meant that I no longer had that same anxiety because I wasn't worrying about, you know, just showing up and not knowing what was going on. Because that's something that's incredibly stressful to me, to just show up and be in a waiting room and to not know what's going to happen next, just to not know who you're going to be, to not know if you're going to be led into a room with fluorescent lights, mm -hmm. because that's my worst nightmare. And so just through talking about my about the challenges I was having, I was getting those adjustments and it really helped my anxiety. Thank you. That is so um, helpful and inspiring to hear kind of how, what, what are the things that you did. Um, to 
to be able to do all that you're doing now, which is amazing. And um, just as we're, we're about out of time um, and maybe just as sort of a last thing, we've got a question here. Um, if you can share with us, what are you, what's coming next for you? What are you, what are you doing next? I'm just um, marketing my book more. I, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm talking about my book a lot. I'm also doing tutoring as well. I'm, um, I'm tutoring girls in STEM. Um, because that's something that's very dear to my heart. I have A levels in math for the math and physics, and I hope to study physics at university. Um, and so I want to start talking more about girls in STEM because that's another group that isn't represented. Well, thank you so much for being with us, and I'm sure we will hear more from you um, as we go forward. I certainly will. Um, will be interested in in hearing more of what you're doing in the future and um and uh, look forward to that and i'll turn it back to dr fung i just want to also uh, point out that um sienna is not only uh good at neurodiversity efficacy she, she is actually very good in math and physics and all that and uh, she actually got uh the the highest possible grades in the uh, the A level exam in uh, the UK, which um, is quite an accomplishment just by itself. And um, what I want to also say is that uh, Sienna is so effective in the neurodiversity advocacy work, not only because uh, she is just genuine at uh, what she is talking about. She was actually trying to really build the bridge. Uh, I, I, now with Sienna, understand what I've been talking about. Um, she, she actually would, uh, would walk halfway instead of getting accommodations um, all the time. She was actually trying to compensate um, and try to get the uh, neurot neurotypical people to be understanding that uh, she is actually trying her very, very best. And because of that, she gained a lot of respect from people. And because of that, uh, she's so uh, effective and she is going to be a really strong and effective voice for neurodiversity for many years to come. So uh, with that, um, just want to thank you, uh, Sienna again for um, bringing us together. And also uh, for the viewers, uh, we are going to have uh, the next session at 9.45. So we have just about 10 minutes uh, break. And the next session is Neurodiverse Employee Panel. See you in about 10 minutes.
Welcome back to the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit. For those of you that just joined the summit, welcome. We'd like to let you know that all sessions are recorded and transcribed. The recordings will be available on our website. All questions from the audience will be submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And the moderators will try to cover as many questions as possible. The, this session uh, that's coming up is uh, going to be moderated by Dr. Quinn Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen. You can unmute now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Um, so welcome everyone and join us in um, welcoming our excellent panel today. So um, I apologize in advance if I am unable to pronounce your name correctly, um, but I would like you to introduce yourself. Um, and then after that, we'll get right into the questions to start the discussion today. And um, attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put it in the Q&A, which we'll get to towards the end. Um, so why don't we start with Patrick? Okay, um, so I'm trying to start my video, but it says uh, the host has stopped it. It should work now. Oh, there we go. Oh, I am uh, Patrick Hilong. I'm a software engineer at Salesforce and I've generally been working as a software engineer on and off for uh, seven, eight years now. I have um, education in like all, all online, mm, like digital marketing, business, machine learning, computer science topics. I am into high intensity interval training, meditation, and um, some machine learning personal projects recently. All right, thank you for that. Um, and Andrew? My name is Andrew Camaro. I'm an autistic certified financial planner among many other letters in case anyone's seen my email signature. Uh, founder of Planning Across the Spectrum. Uh, we work with employers who are looking to hire neurodiverse employees and make their benefits package inclusive, passionate about neurodiversity employment, working with employers to customize employee benefits and employee wellness programs to hire, recruit, and retain talent. Thank you. Haley, welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley Moss. My pronouns are she, her, by the way. I am an autistic attorney. I am an author. I am an activist, and I'm also an artist. So a little bit about what I do professionally is I was previously a litigator doing healthcare law. So I basically represented hospitals. I also worked in an international law practice inside that last firm that I was at. And currently I am a small business owner. So what I do is as using my legal background, I also do a lot of advising on neurodiversity and also compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So things that do come down to disability issues in the workplace. And I also get to be an educator and get to help educate folks. So usually HR or even just other like teachers and special educators and students and whatnot when it comes to issues surrounding autism and neurodiversity. So that's kind of a little bit about what I'm up to for fun. I love to play games. I love to read. I love just getting to draw and paint. And also I am, I love that Patrick earlier mentioned high intensity interval training because once upon a time I was a huge fitness fanatic and hit was the one thing that I never quite got into because your girl can't run. So just a, that's just a little bit of who I am. And I'm also really obsessed with neurodiversity for lawyers. And I just turned in a book manuscript about that. Thank you, Haley. Uh, Sridhar. Hello, thank you for joining everyone. I'm uh, a uh, 38 year old um, software developer living in Silicon Valley. I have a master's degree in computer science. Uh, I've been working for uh, uh, almost 15 years. I, uh, I be, being on the spectrum, 
I struggle with uh, multitasking and speed of uh, finishing uh, work, and that uh, causes job uh, me to uh, lose my job uh, every one one to two years. Oh, um, thank you for joining us today to share your thoughts and perspectives, um, Wes. Um, sure. Hi, I'm Wesley Strickland, and I go by Wes. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I've been um, uh, a lot of different things in my lifetime. I mean, I, I worked as a volunteer for quite a long time with the um, Child Welfare Associations in Florida, where we worked on kind of changing the systems for LGBT kids in here. Um, currently, though, I'm working at E-Trade, and we are... Um, and my job there is business and product compliance. And so what that is, is basically uh, advising the business on um, rules and regulations that apply to um, their business lines. Thank you. Selena? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Selena <laughs> Sparks. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am with the Neurodiversity Center of Excellence at EY and I, um, I'm with the San Jose team. So I am in California. And Magnus. Hi everybody. I'm Magnus Adamark from Raleigh, North Carolina. My pronouns are he, him. I am autistic and it runs in my family. Little science fact, reproduction causes autism. I'm also a trauma survivor and I have PTSD, which also colors a lot of my life experience. If you know me or follow me online, you're probably thinking pathological demand avoidance, but I don't think there's anything pathological about it. It's actually served me pretty well to protect myself. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's not the beginning or end of my neurodivergence, but that's all I really know officially. My day job is senior director healthcare cloud at Optum, which is a United Health Group company. That basically means I'm middle management of technology teams. I also host two neurodiversity focused podcasts. I serve on the Stanford Neurodiversity Projects Consortium on Employment, the professional advisory board for NC State's excellent Students Moving Forward program run by Wes Wade that helps autistic students prepare for their careers. And I also serve on Ultranauts advisory board. In my spare time, I really love photography among many, many other things. Uh, someday, I think I'm likely to start the kind of company I want to work for because I haven't quite found it yet. Thank you. And we have uh, such a diverse background of speakers today. Um, and we have some prepared questions. I just want to get jump right into them to start the discussion. And again, I welcome any questions in the Q&A below that we can get to towards the end. Um, so Selena, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us about your journey of self-discovery as a neurodiverse individual? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I was diagnosed with autism at a young age. Um, I was recently received a diagnosis of ADHD. So it's quite the fun combination, <laughs> to say the least. Um, socially uh, is where I tend to um, struggle. And I've, I've had to really learn, learn how to communicate and then utilize that communication in, in the typical interview process at work, you know, when, when doing, dealing with jobs um, and such. And just while also l trying to understand uh, how I can use my perspective and my skills um, to do something to provide to a company. Um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> um, and kind of similarly, uh, Haley, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how did you find out about your diagnosis and um, how old were you? What kind of background? So I think I was one of those luckier ones, so to speak. So I was diagnosed at three with autism. So I was a kid who wasn't talking. I was difficult to say the least. And I think I look back and I think about the late nineties being what they were when it came to getting a diagnosis. And when I look at how kids today have it, it was definitely a lot different. And 
for me, I got told when I was nine years old, because at the time my special interest in life was Harry Potter. And my parents sit me down one day and they go, you have magical powers, just like Harry Potter. And of course I'm going to buy it. Like, that's just how it is. I'm nine years old. I'm totally going to appreciate an opportunity to talk about Harry Potter. And they end up explaining to me basically that being different is neither better or worse. It's just different and different could be extraordinary. So I don't see it as a bad thing. And even like growing up, I never thought of myself as just like different or the weird kid or anything like that. So in my house, I always thought that everyone else was just strange for not wanting to be friends with me growing up. I thought that I was like the coolest person there and that just nobody like quite understood it. Not that I was somehow different or weird or anything like that. I just thought that it was just everybody else and it was a them problem and not a me problem. So I grew up thinking of autism, not quite as a superpower, but as something that made me different in who I am. And I also just didn't see myself as lesser or I didn't really see myself as different. I just thought of myself as like, okay, I have this thing that makes my brain work differently and that this is how the lens in which I view the world. And I think you hit a point either in your teenage years or in your adulthood where you realize, especially with that kind of framework, that maybe you are in someone else, a family friend explains to me when I was a teenager of, of being perfect in an imperfect world. Like you are exactly who you're meant to be. You are doing the things you're supposed to do. And the rest of the world just isn't quite there yet, that they're not exactly ready for this. And they're not, they're still flawed or imperfect in some way that they don't quite understand. And I think that kind of colors in a lot of how I feel is that I don't think that I'm perfect. I don't think anyone is, but I do think that at times society could be far more disabling than autism could ever be. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was great how your parents presented it to you as um, having magical powers like Harry Potter and just being different. Um, what about you, Sridhar? How did you find out about your diagnosis? So mine was uh, when I was age 31, uh, that was in 2014. The re the, after about eight years of my career, I um, decided to see a psychologist wondering what, why am I losing my job uh, uh, every, uh, every year or two? Why am I getting in, in trouble when uh, people who are from less educated backgrounds than me uh, seem to be fine? Um, uh, we uh, the psychologist almost missed it. We were just talking about general strategies, and then near the end, I said, "Oh, by the way, my uh, uh, my I have a brother who's autistic, and he was diagnosed at age eleven uh, back in nineteen eighty nine, um, and I believe he's on the call now." Hi, Pragash. Um, uh, so, uh, and and even just approaching a psychologist i know a lot of people may not be comfortable doing i actually suffer from depression uh, for year, years prior to that so i was comfortable approaching them but uh, yeah it was uh, it was a long time in coming and even then i almost missed it mm -hmm. sounds like some of the struggles you had led you to seek some answers eventually yes but yeah. uh, for a while i just thought i was lazy and that people here in silicon valley mm -hmm. work harder than me mm. Um, so that kind of takes us into uh, career journeys. And um, Magnus, I thought maybe you'd share with us some of uh, your experiences with your career. Sure. Thank you. Uh, this probably won't be brief, but I promise I'll try to keep it entertaining. There was a long period of time uh, before my diagnosis where I think I could best be described as the stereotypical brilliant jerk. Um, that is to say, I scored really high on individual achievements, but team dynamics were so hard and so foreign to me and felt so hostile that I really preferred and defended my solitude. And I was probably a pretty miserable person to work with as a result. Mm. Uh, I always knew that I was different, but I didn't really have language to describe it. And I didn't really understand what made me different from the people around me. I was diagnosed very late in life. So uh, there were a number of diagnoses that were issued and then later withdrawn when I was young. None of them really made much sense. They didn't stick. And um, finding out that the answer is autism really was a surprise and a shock to me. I wasn't expecting that. So when I learned uh, that this is who I am, why I am the way I am. I went on a long and intense journey of self-discovery and, and social discovery. 
And I'll just offer some brief highlights, but there are really three key chapters that did a lot for me in my career. Um, number one, I worked as a bouncer in a rowdy nightclub in downtown Raleigh. I'm big, but I'm not the biggest guy. I'm strong, but I'm not the strongest guy. And I'm definitely more of a huggable teddy bear type, not really a fighter. So I had to learn a lot about influence in that job, earning and keeping the respect of the patrons and using words more than actions to keep peace was really critical. This job offered me a great opportunity to observe human behavior and understand how people acted on their desires and their true natures when inhibitions were dropped. So from a professional perspective, um, I learned a lot about earning influence to succeed in areas that I couldn't and shouldn't brute force my way through a solution. Number two, I went on the multi-year journey to get patched into a traditional motorcycle club. This was not Sons of Anarchy. I wasn't um, trafficking drugs and weapons, but otherwise a lot of the club structure was similar if you watch that show or any other kind of fictional portrayals of motorcycle clubs. We did sometimes end up in social situations with the outlaw clubs that were more like Sons of Anarchy. And in those environments, it can be really dangerous if you don't understand and respect the unwritten social rules. So where most people would see lawlessness and chaos, I learned to look for the hidden order and there's a lot of structure behind it. Motorcycle club culture does have a lot of order and structure. It has rules um, and learning, learning to look for those unwritten rules and discovering and respecting the nature and order of things is something that has actually served me well in my office job. So the third one, and I'll give you a little warning up front. It's going to sound titillating, but hear me out. Don't bother Googling for my work because I did this work pseudonymously. Um, so it wouldn't mess with my day job. I learned about photography and quite by accident found out that I was really good at nude portraiture. So word got out locally, lots of women and a few men would ask me to photograph them nude. So I spent a lot of time on my nights and weekends after you know my day job, taking portraits of, of naked people. Most of it was really tasteful. Some of it was intentionally socially provocative. Uh, but what I learned from this early on, um, I was working with usually total strangers. It very quickly became the kind of place where I'd have the most intimate conversations of my life. I'd, I'd have conversations with the subjects of my work that were so deep, it's almost as if we were old friends. And this cap kept happening over and over again. The people I talked to would appear one way when we first met, and then five to 10 minutes after they were disrobed, they would act a lot differently, a lot more sincerely, authentically. One thing I really learned about this is that everybody masks. In the autistic community, we talk about masking a lot, and it's something that we do just to survive uh, a neurotypically dominated culture. Um, but, and, and we talk about how harmful it can be. But it turns out, the neurotypicals are masking for their own society. I thought that was really ironic. There's probably a lot of room to speculate what society could look like if everybody counted to three and then just stopped masking at the same time. But that's not really what we're here to talk about today. Uh, I learned a lot from this experience how holistic folks, and that is to say, holistic folks are non-autistic. Um, I learned a lot about how holistic folks also mask. And a lot of their indirect language, their social opacity comes from a fear of vulnerability. I had to learn that in a professional environment, it's really important to create, create spaces for people that are psychologically safe for people to be vulnerable so that you can have those authentic conversations. So all of these lessons really directly contributed to be, being successful in transitioning from the brilliant jerk that every, Everybody wanted my talents as the brilliant jerk, but they just wanted to stuff me in a room. And as Judy Singer said, you know, send endless supply of pizza and Coca-Cola down a chute to keep me going. Um, I had to transition from that to being an effective leader. That is to say, like, I actually manage people and I manage people who manage people. And you can't do that if you're not good with people. 
So um, all those lessons, those like crazy far out life experiences really did make me more effective in working with uh, neurotypical folks and in leading them. So uh, once I figured it out, uh, how to incorporate all this stuff into my life, everything started moving really quickly. I'm far more successful, far better utilized as a leader than I ever was as an individual contributor. And I'd love to see, like, I know there's a lot of neurodivergent people in the audience today. I'd really love to see more openly neurodivergent leaders emerging and being successful. Thank you for sharing your insight. Um, through your experiences, I can tell the, the power of observation has really taught you many lessons through life. Quite a lot, so thank yeah. you for sharing all of those insights with us. Um, and I thought- ask, uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I finish what you're saying and then I have a very quick ad admin question. Uh, do you want to share that in the chat, Sridhar, if it's admin question or? Uh, maybe that would be more efficient. Okay. The time is very packed. Got it. Um, so Patrick, maybe I can turn to you. Um, can you tell us about your journey of self-discovery as a neurodiverse individual? Yeah. Um, so the first 25 years of my life sucked pretty bad. Um, uh, I mean, in addition to, so I have uh, Asperger's and certain kind of like inputs um, are, or I'm just much more sensitive to certain stimuli than um, most people. And that uh, ends up including emotional stimulus. So um, a lot of childhood experiences that may have been, you know, just kind of like normal for, um, you know, neurotypical people ended up uh, traumatizing me in all kinds of ways. And not having a frame of reference for any of this, basically my strategy was uh, repression. Uh, and so I was kind of caught in like this, um, a growing ceaseless cognitive dissonance born of the uh, disconnect between what I could do on paper and the results I was getting in life. Uh, and I repressed that as well, but um, it kind of kept mounting, 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 mounting. And I was just less and less and less functional, able to do, you know, anything except just like sit in front of a computer and, you know, basically not even be processing whatever I was looking at. Um, and so out of kind of desperation, I went to a neurologist, was diagnosed with ADHD and started taking Adderall, which very, very, very quickly and dramatically changed my life. Um, I was able to, for the first time, I was kind of like in control of my own mind. And uh, it, I was, went back to school, started studying computer science. I was understanding things very well and um, kind of like to my, I guess not exactly surprise, but, um, you know, just relief and enjoyment. I was functioning as a uh, savant, like my working memory just seemed to not have any limits. And I could, you know, just like pick up a new idea, ingest it, uh, you know, work with it uh, very, very quickly, uh, which is really nice. But so the Adderall actually increased uh, my sensitivity to stimuli even more, uh, including the emotional ones. So after I went through a bad breakup and some uh, people in my life died, I experienced like very, very intense PTSD and didn't have a frame of reference for that, didn't know what was going on and basically couldn't use my brain anymore for uh, uh, several years. And that was, uh, that was very challenging. And that's kind of during that time, actually, so before that time, I started listening to podcasts that were in-depth interviews with people that um, from like all walks of life, but the consistent pattern was just that they these were like the the world, the best in the world in a certain category. They were extremely successful people, and so uh, listening to thousands of hours of these things, I started to kind of like map to well, so two actually things. One thing I started to just recognize individual patterns. I started to just try the like habits and strategies they recommended or that, you know, they were employing in their own lives and, you know, some worked, some didn't, but the ones that did work worked pretty well. And then also just kind of like ingesting the, uh, the, the larger mindset of, uh, you know, the success in how to kind of like focus on your goals and your values, how to be oriented towards 
progress and growth. Um, in terms of like self discovery, learning things about myself, um, you know, just sitting back and reflecting on things doesn't usually produce results for me. I needed, I need something modeled. And so like listening to the interviews, listening to people's life stories, that gave me something to work with and say like, oh, that, that seems similar to you know, something I've experienced. Let me try doing what this person does and see what happens. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot about myself very, very quickly that way. Um, there's, I mean, I'll kind of address uh, in a later question if we get to that, the, how I actually got to my current job as a result of that process combined with a series of programs I went through. But some key things I learned about myself are that I'm like momentum is really important to me. Like if I have a big goal, but I'm not currently, you know, actively involved with anything related to that goal or anything else, then I can't really move in that direction. You know, even if I just try to start, it doesn't work. But if I have like a series of kind of like progressively larger and, you know, more demanding projects or classes or something, then building up to the larger goal um, is very, very feasible. And so a lot of what I've learned about the, how to kind of get to where I want to go, get to where I want to go from where I currently am is to structure the process. That's, a relatively new revelation for me, like only in the last couple of years. Uh, so I'm still kind of like fine tuning it, but that's um, been crucial for me. And I feel that's actually true for um, most neurodiverse people and most people in general. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the journey to self-discovery, we don't quite reach the end. It's a constant, it's a journey. It's a, a thing we're doing every day. And I'm glad that you're learning more and more about yourself and how to really utilize your strengths. Um, and I, let me look at the, the next questions that I have here. Um, I wanted to open it up to you, Wes, to talk about some of the challenges you face during employment and what your career journey has been like. Sure. Um, so I had a hard time getting a job pretty much all my life until um, I was in my 40s I mean, or, or late 30s. I did a, a lot of work in volunteer work. And um, so I had built up a pretty significant resume um, just doing that. But when I moved to New York City, um, I looked for a job for two years. I just got in my um, master's and I was kind of idealistic thinking that <laughs> I could come to New York and just get a job at some consulting firm somewhere. Um, but I couldn't seem to get my foot in the door and I did all the networking and everything like that that I was told to do. Um, and it just didn't seem to be happening. So the way that I finally was able to get my foot in the door is through a friend that like kind of gave me a chance at doing something at a, a firm. And once I was in, then I was able to kind of shine. Like then I was able to um, would take risks. So like outside of what I had initially, um, comfortable doing. So another part of the story is like, I got diagnosed with ADHD first and then autism. So, um, the ADHD, I think really helps me to be hyper-focused and, um, and to take those risks to be able to, um, try to do different things or suggest to the company different ways of doing things. And I think, you know, that's kind of been uh, a good, a good, um, a good way to, to just once you're in there. I mean, getting in there is a whole other story. And that's like, um, interviews have always been very difficult for me as they are for everyone. I think we've talked a lot about that. But I mean, I think that the main takeaway for everyone here is that, you know, once you realize that, you know, your neurodiversity adds value. Take those values and kind of make sure that they're um, you're you're using those strengths the most of their ability. Like the ADHD curiosity and the risk taking with the detail oriented of the autism works really well in my current job at E Trade. And because when I do things like regulatory change management, where you're um, you're taking a big 
3,000 page rule and remembering it all and then rolling across the organization. And that, and if you know all the different pieces, you remember some of the smaller things that, you know, if you're looking at a really synthesized deck, you wouldn't necessarily see. I think that's kind of, uh, um, I don't know that I answered the challenges as much as I could have. But it's, <laughs> it's <right. laughs> No, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it kind of opens it up to um, to Andrew with challenges that people are facing with employment. What accommodations do you think um, neurodiverse individuals can request from their employers? I find that limited disclosure is much more understandable, concrete, and not just for the employer, but for the employee. So simply saying autism means nothing to even to us, let alone an employer, but saying you're sensitive to fluorescent lights, you can say that lights bother your eyes, ask if you can wear a hat, tinted glasses, or even advocate for the removal of said lighting because there's not one person on the planet who likes it. Um, other simple things, just letting people know your communication preference. I find, especially in the world of, you know, Zoom and calendars, I have a lot more people missing schedules and things like that. So when, if I confirm appointment or a meeting, hey, do you mind sending me an email just to confirm that as well? That way, if I'm lost, I forgot to add it, I, I can search in my email. And even some other things like, if it is a Zoom, right? Ask if you can just do it without video, assuming most people don't mind. That can be a lot easier. So I can walk around, move around uh, while talking on the phone. Those are some really, really helpful tips. Um, small things that you can ask for that doesn't really reveal much, um, but can help you be more productive and comfortable um, in the workplace. Thank you for sharing those. Um, and I wanna go back to you, Selena. What has your career journey um, been like and what are accommodations you think people can ask for? Um, so to give a little bit of background, I'm originally from Florida, um, go Duval County. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Florida people. Exactly. <laughs> um, five years ago, I moved out to California to finish school and to get a career started in computer programming. Um, it was really, really hard. Um, I ended up going from a grocery store to a grave shift security officer. And then finally I, I ended up at EY. Um, and one of the big struggles, uh, as mentioned before, was socializing, being able to communicate, being able to be in an office with so many people all together and maintaining that what would be considered acceptable, you know, voice level, um, you know, um, excitement, <laughs> you know, and things like that. Um, and so there was, there was definitely a struggle there and um, which is why I love you, why they've been very accommodating um, from, you know, providing a space where you can split yourself off from everyone, you know, for a temporary amount of time, you know, providing a, a permanent desk space, whereas typically the firm is um, people move around. Nobody has uh, really has a permanent uh, space, but they provided that to us so that we could have that that sort of anchor, uh, if you will, um, and all sorts of um, you know other accommodations from scheduling to you know, as mentioned before, if you're in a call, being unwilling to you know, not, not really wanting to show your face or, or things like that. Um, very understanding, very accepting. Um, and that was something I didn't get doing security, doing, um, you know, working in a deli. <laughs> so um, uh, that's all I can really say towards that. But yeah, uh, those, are, those are just some of the big accommodations that I found, at least in my experience. So it sounds like some employers may be more open to um, making accommodations than others or just based on the, the job setting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I think more companies now are heading in that direction. It's, it's really, really people are starting to kind of, I don't want to say wake up to it. I don't really like that phrasing, but we're starting to understand more and to be able to apply that 
um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of takes me to this question um, in that, how do organizations scale up their neurodiversity at work initiative? And I know Andrew, you have some thoughts on this as well. I, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, so inclusive benefits and the reason for individuals who want to work beyond just a paycheck Every study ever, including one just by Bank of America recently, says the most important thing when somebody wants a job is the benefits, right? There's a reason every TV show jokes that I got a job, it has dental too, right? However, we've made so many other parts of you know, neurodiverse hiring inclusive, yet the benefits package is still not inclusive. And we run into a lot of issues with that because their ADA is not helpful, right? It's these anti-discrimination rules that are meant to help really end up hurting. There's also this perceived, some more a myth than a reality, lots of individuals feel they need benefits and they can't work. So none of these initiatives will be successful no matter, unless the individuals we wanna hire will accept the jobs. And there's some examples of this where jobs were offered, good paying jobs. And for you know, reasons that were not thought about, the individuals didn't take those jobs. So I think you know, offering in a good incentive package in a way that is good for everyone and disclosure isn't necessarily even needed as a value proposition is the next level and where we should go. And obviously I have a bias towards that. Mm -hmm. And Magnus, did you have thoughts to add oh, to how I organizations do. can uh, increase their neurodiversity initiative? I do. Thank you. So I, I think the existing, they're, they're mostly autism at work initiatives that we see now, uh, at least that's how they're being branded. And I think we're seeing good answers to the questions that are being asked. But if we saw more neurodivergent leadership in this space, I think would be, we would be asking better questions. So I don't think that this is the question we should be asking because I don't think neurodiversity at work is the, the end game. I think if we build on the leadership of uh, some of the great folks that we've heard throughout this summit, like Judy Singer, Dr. Nancy Doyle, Sienna Castellan, Marcel Champy, they were all saying things around how we've got to look more towards breaking down the systemic barriers and build radical inclusion and equity. This has to be more than just a thin cross section of the most stereotypical, stereotypical commercially desirable autistic people. And this has to be about more than technology jobs. Neurodiversity is about way more than just autism. So this is something that's really easy to forget when we predominantly talk about autism and neurodiversity circles. So I don't think we should be scaling them up so much as spinning them out, time box them. These things should only be brief experiments. Autism mm -hmm. work should not be a department. This shouldn't be something long running. This should be something we do as an experiment to figure out why and where and how we are systemically broken. Learn how to break those barriers and then break them. If we're doing this right, Autism at work is just a phase we go through for six to 12 months before we move on to other experiments and achieving a more universal workplace for other underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. And Haley, I saw that you were nodding along and really agreeing with Magnus. Um, what are the things you wanted to add to that? I think that Magnus honestly hit it better on the head than I could. I just, I, I want Magnus to be in charge of everything related to neurodiversity at work forever now. <laughs> and I hope that I get to work with you on this stuff because I'm like, I'm only standing yes. on the shoulders of giants. I mean, I'm also just seeing it from a policy perspective too, and how like the ADA comes into play and how we can also make sure that we are being equitable. And even, especially when you mentioned something about technology jobs, I've noticed that because I work in legal and there is nothing absolutely nothing when it comes to neurodiversity. There's nothing when it comes to disability, that mental health, especially, which is a form of neurodivergence is just seen as some form of liability and something that must just be treated and dealt with. And we have a very high rate of neurodivergence in the practice of law. And it's very interesting that we don't even recruit it. We see it as a negative. And if anything, we hold it against people, even in the licensing process. So I'm sitting here thinking, how can we just start over and get to that point where we are 
encouraging people to be open about neurodivergence and feel when we talk about this radical inclusion concept that seems to come up is I think even with existing leadership, is there such a culture of shame in this idea that anything that makes you different is a form of weakness? And especially this way with neurodivergence and invisible disability generally, that it's seen as a form of weakness because that's what we're conditioned. That's what we're told it is, even though obviously everyone here seems to know that neurodiversity comes with plenty of strengths and that neurodiversity is not a bad thing, that it could be both disability and difference. But I think we are so conditioned as a society to see it as bad thing, capital B, capital T. So we really don't quite get to that point where we're actually including people and people don't feel comfortable being vulnerable. And we do have neurodivergent leaders, I'm certain. And I think, how do we even get to the point that those existing leaders, as much as we want to keep cultivating new leadership in the younger generation and the generation ADA, like me, I'm in my mid to late twenties, that we grew up with these protections in school and in work and things like that, is how do we make it so that existing leaders also feel comfortable sharing that they may be neurodivergent and otherwise being able to use their position of power and their position of authority to not only continue to grow that conversation internally, but also externally in recruitment. So I think that there's so much focus with neurodiversity at work on recruitment that we tend to forget about our existing employees who may be neurodivergent and have never said anything. And we also especially forget about our leaders who may be neurodivergent and never said anything for fear out of repercussions or because they've been conditioned because of generational differences, because of society and their attitudes that it's a bad thing. So I think we need to reevaluate how we foster that culture of inclusion that all in our existing companies, rather than just reinventing the wheel or trying to just bring in new lifeblood and calling that neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I can add to that and piggyback a little bit. I mean, I completely agree with Haley and with Magnus. I mean, I think that um, if we're gonna be shifting the neurodiversity initiative to a strengths-based model and out of this deficit model and into this, um, the DNI area um, instead of where it is now under the disability area, I think then what we can start doing is um, for the future, we're building a, a scaffolding that's based on that, kind of like Nancy Doyle said in her speech, I thought that was really good. Um, so, I mean, I think that the next steps in, in as a neurodiverse employee in an organization now, I mean, I know that I've kind of reached out, I think awareness is step one. I mean, I'm like, so I've been reaching out all over the place to try to get different trade groups and stuff to understand what neurodiversity, neurodiversity even means because there's such a lack of awareness of it. And, you know, once we can get that, then I think we can start kind of, um, we're ripe for cultural change right now. So, I mean, I think it's a good time to do it. It's just a matter of kind of let's um, figure out how. I mean, like, I think that's what we've been getting best practices throughout this conference. Mm -hmm. And Selena, maybe you had some thoughts on that as well. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to respond. I think there were a lot of good points that were brought up here, particularly around the idea that in having these initiatives, we sort of forget about those that are already there. But I would also take a second to commend these initiatives because while yes, the reality of the situation is that um, people that are neurodiverse face a lot of judgment. We face a lot of stigma, which makes it hard when we are in the workplace. There's still that huge portion of people though that are outside of the workplace that really struggle to get in. And these initiatives not only provide them without opportunity, but they provide an opportunity all around for both for both the company and society-wise to, to re-examine how we do things and say, you know, if people are struggling this way, what if we were to take a different approach? Rather than doing an interview process, we switch to a super week. How does that help? And I think these companies that have done these initiatives are finding that doing things such as like a super week or an other um, different interview processes and things like that are not only pro being helpful for those that are neurodiverse, they're also being, um, they can also be applied all around. Um, and so I would just take a moment to commend these initiatives because I do think they're important and you're right. They shouldn't be necessarily permanent. There should be a method in which 
you know, we can integrate um, those that are neurodiverse into a company altogether instead of having it sort of sectioned off. But I think with the stigmas we face now, this is where our, our starting line is, if, if that makes sense. And so we, this is where we have to start and we really need to kind of go from there. But um, I just wanted to kind of chime in with that because I feel that it's important that we sort of commend that. I don't think it's something that needs to be um, held against a company or not that I'm saying anyone's doing that, but I, I just want to provide that um, perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I, you know, I, we have about 15 minutes left. And I really want to open it up to the questions that the audience has submitted. Um, I think we really hit on a really hot topic right now in terms of how do we support neurodiverse individuals at work. Um, so Dr. Lawrence Fung, will you help us with some of the audience questions? Yeah, I think uh, Haley probably should be the best person to talk about, to respond to a lot of the ADA related questions. And um, maybe I'll, I'll just bombard you with a few right okay. now. Yeah, so- um, so Talking one, about your protections under the law is always a good thing because I know everybody has these questions, so let's do it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the first question is, uh, this attendee was saying, I, I intend to start a nonprofit to support neurodiverse uh, individuals who would want to work in the uh, biodiversity conversation. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, legal aspects that I should be concerned about? What about uh, liabilities, insurance, et cetera? I can't really get into the weeds on insurance stuff. And I just wanna preface all of this conversation with I am not your attorney. I am licensed to practice in Florida. So this is just kind of very general overview type stuff. So basically, I'm not giving legal advice necessarily. I just want to kind of start that conversation off there. But I think obviously taking to heart what we've said, I think it's important to also listen to neurodivergent voices to make sure that your practices are inclusive. So I look at it from an employment perspective. So we're talking about employment today and most of your ADA concerns is generally when we're talking about employment fall under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that basically is non-discrimination from anywhere in the job description, recruitment, interviewing, hiring, advancement, firing, all that good stuff in businesses and organizations with 15 or more employees. So that may or may not apply to you, especially if you're starting a new nonprofit. And if you are a business with less than 15 employees, check your state civil rights laws and anti-discrimination statutes to see if it, you might be covered under something similar if you're worried about your liability, because some states, it could be as small as five employees or maybe one or two others, or it could also be that same 15. So generally I like to advise that the ADA is the floor. It is not the ceiling. It is, it is basically, or it's not the, it's a floor. It's a floor. It's not the ceiling. So we're told often like you must do these great things. The ADA is the gold standard. No, it's basically the bare minimum you should be doing. And even if you are not covered under it, I highly recommend you make sure that you're doing these reasonable accommodations that you have systems in place and take a universal design approach to designing a nonprofit, a inclusive work environment and all of that stuff. So that's kind of just the very general version of where I want to go with this conversation too. Mm -hmm. And another attendee is asking this, how, how does the ADA end up hurting rather than helping? The benefits trap is well known in the disability community. I think a lot of employers generally are afraid because they think of the ADA is this end all be all thing. They don't know what their their life, what their obligations are, what they're covered. And they also just think litigation gets very, very expensive. ADA claims take a long time. A lot of them, honestly, I at least from what I see, they it takes a while because sometimes they start with like the EEOC. They're not always successful. So there's a lot of fear of the unknown more than anything. And I think when it comes to the ADA and reasonable accommodation, employers have to understand that there's two reasons basically that you have to, you can deny someone a reasonable accommodation. And that is that isn't basically that it's unreasonable or it's an undue hardship. So like an undue hardship is that it is just not, that it could be a huge financial burden. So if you're like a small business and someone's asking for like, I don't know, let's call it a $10,000, who knows what widget thing that's going to make your executive functioning absolutely perfect. Let's just call it that because I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. If you're a small business, that might not be, that might be an undue burden, especially if your revenue is say only like, $25,000 as a company. I mean, I'm just being 
completely spitballing and hypothetical right now or asking someone to completely or like what is reasonable like if I asked an office to change all the fluorescent light bulbs because they gave me a headache that would probably not be reasonable so I think it's really just understanding and I think with title one and with also just the reasonable accommodations process and your obligations, I like to look at all of it as an ongoing conversation. So just even being able to explain like what you need to be better at your job or how a certain thing can help you. So I always try to tell folks who are scared to disclose or who don't like having those conversations to do it in a way that puts both the neurodivergent person and the employer in a position of power. And the best way to do that is that using this kind of phrase of like this phrasing. I This is a great script. I learned it from another law student, actually. And it's kind of this great, great phrase. And you just say, I work best when dot, dot, dot. And you fill in the blanks and you explain like why basically that accommodation or something or that something that speaks to that thing can help you. So what we learned is things like I do best when I have clear instructions. And then you can figure out a plan to get clear instructions. It makes your employer know that that would help you work, whether it's an executive functioning issue or a time management issue, whatever it might be, is that kind of opens that conversation or it also helps the employer feel that they have an active role instead of saying, I need you to write everything out for me forever, that it opens that conversation so both parties can get what they need. Um, here's a question for um, Magnus. Uh, I'm curious about how you handle the level of commonly overwhelming environmental stimuli in uh, such a setting as a nightclub. Yeah, so to, the nightclub was a long time ago. I was younger and more resilient. Uh, I'm, I'm getting close to 50 years old now, and uh, the, the way I've aged my sensory overwhelm has a much lower threshold than when I was young. So I could not do that today. When I was young and I did the, the, the nightclub work, um, a, a lot of it was managing my sensory experience as best as I could. The lights and the sound inside the club were hard, but outside the club by the front door, uh, it was a lot easier. So I would mostly hang out by the front door. I would uh, do circular routes through the club to like kind of quickly assess uh, what's, what's the mood like uh, are there any like visual warning indicators that uh, somebody's getting inebriated and hostile? Um, is everything okay? And then I go right back outside. The other thing, I don't recommend this. This was really unhealthy, but it helped me at the time. Uh, I would smoke cigars. And the cigars gave me uh, a stem on all my senses, really. Um, the, the taste, the texture, the smell, uh, being able to like play with the heat under my hand and that kind of thing. So all of those things helped me to attenuate the sensory overwhelm in a way that I could control the experience. Uh, I'd probably look for some other stem toy if I were doing that ag again today. And ultimately, uh, I only did that job for um, about a year and a half or so before it, it was just too much and I had to stop doing it, but I got what I needed from it. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, that's probably less helpful than what do I do during the day? During the day, I work from home. Th this isn't just a COVID thing. I made sure to find a manager that was um, accommodating and understanding. Um, we tried on a trial basis for me to work from home. I became much more productive. Indeed, all of the uh, big promotions I've gotten started when I started working from home. So now that I work from home, I control the lights, I control the sound. It's not the twilight zone or the outer limits or however that show started, but um, I, I can work on my feet. If I'm not comfortable with people seeing me stimming, um, I, can, I can just push a button and blank my camera. So all of that control over my environment has allowed me to do my life's best work. Mm -hmm. um we have about seven minutes left and we, we still have like 20 plus questions. So uh, if, if you can keep your answers to be like 30 seconds or so, that, that will be helpful. Um, so Patrick, uh, your experience on of the gap between on paper and in real life is familiar. Can you explain about the structuring the process? Is that a reproducible process for others or one of your own creation? Um, yeah, so uh, both to some extent. Um, it's 
and so, I mean, I recognize this in retrospect, um, having at the times like when I was able to get to larger goals and actually um, get the, the results I wanted in life and like getting from, you know, A, a to Z or just trying to like start on Z itself, like trying to get a job. Um, and it just, you know, even though I had the skills, just like going out there, you know, applying with resumes and stuff, I was making no progress on that. And issue was a motivational one for me. Um, and so I realized that the way that I get motivated to do kind of like more complex, challenging things that I don't necessarily have a frame of reference for, or where I'm, there's a, a strong potential for rejection and not really uh, a lot of, uh, you know, rewards or, or useful feedback coming in is to kind of like build up tasks uh, in terms of like the level of complexity and the, uh, the level of reward so that um, I'm slowly kind of building momentum towards whatever the goal is. It's also useful to set a goal kind of like much further than what your actual goal is. Uh, I mean, so like, for example, in getting my current job, uh, the goal I set for myself was to uh, become a, a billionaire, basically. And um, because of that mindset, I was always thinking about, you know, how, uh, like, you know, several steps ahead and like where I am in the progression of things. But I went through a se series of programs, each that was, had more expectations, more technical demands, and um more actually like support than the previous one. So I started out at the Department of Rehabilitation that gave me basically just a proficiency test, which I took, did well at, felt good about that. They then referred me to a program called Evo Libri, which was like a two day a week. One day was uh, taking some lightweight classes and the other day was working with a coach who was um, trying to understand my abilities, career goals, and, um, you know, suggesting kind of like strategies uh, or like helping me write resumes, letters of introduction, whatever um, needed being done. And, to, and that also introduced like workplace skills that were kind of low key and low key social skills, low key executive function stuff, uh, like fundamental, but um, not really, they didn't really take me all the way there. I was referred from Evo Libri by Jan Johnson Tyler actually to a program called Neurodiversity Pathways which was a simulated workplace environment. And it was six weeks of uh, kind of small projects, each more complex than the last, and building up uh, both a growth mindset and um, the seven habits of highly effective people. And so like the skills built there, uh, I mean, it built on the skills from Evo Libri, but it also modeled what it was actually like to be in a workplace environment, how I'd be communicating with coworkers and um, you know, uh, people at various levels of management, what the different challenges would be. And so kind of like getting a holistic first person experience of you know, operating in a way where you're accountable to many stakeholders and still you know, trying to get useful things done was really, 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 uh, I mean, like I was only able to do that because I'd had the context from the Evo Libby program. And then after coming out of neurodiversity pathways, I felt kind of like you know, on top of the world, I can do anything. Uh, and very, very fortunately was uh, invited to the Specialist Stern program at Salesforce as part of their Autism at Work initiative. And that was, that was um, like a more, even more intensive simulated workplace environment. And it's, uh, again, it was, very, it was a lot more focused on getting stuff done, on presentation skills, on technical projects that were initially with Legos, but moved on to software, which is what the actual job would have been. And so through each of those programs, I was kind of uh, getting more confidence, getting more of a sense of what was actually going to be going on in a work environment. And because I'd been in work environments previously and had either quit or been fired for reasons that I didn't fully understand, but these really developed the skills in me both for functioning in a career and kind of like self-regulation and which is kind of interesting that the skills for each of those things is very strong overlap. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, the point being that the process was each part, it's, it's a series of steps that is each, you know, higher, more demanding than the previous one, but becomes possible as a result of the previous one. And so- mm -hmm. Thank you. Kind of, yeah, yeah, so uh, the, we, we, we only have uh, like a minute left. So uh, I, uh, we have built in a 15 minute gap uh, so um, 
because I'm running the conference, I'm just going to uh, uh, extend that uh, this session by five minutes. But uh, I'd like to have some questions answered by some other uh, panelists. So if you can keep your response to just about a minute or so, that will let everyone to have a chance to, uh, to answer. So the next one is for Sridhar. So I am an autistic manager and I find it very difficult to have 11 employees report to me. The amount of interruptions and attention they, uh, they take uh, all day makes it very hard for me to stay organized and, fo and focus on other project work I'm given to do. What helps you stay organized and manage interruptions as an autistic leader? Also, do you have a resource recommendations for best practices for leading a team when you're uh, for uh, people that are autistic? So I believe that question came from Michael, Michelle Chung. I'd love to give a more detailed answer. Can I, Lawrence, put my email address in the attendees chat and uh, she can uh, follow up with me by email? Um, sh sure, uh, you, 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 can, you can also uh, just tell. Um, please, tell please note, yeah. yeah, please note my email address. First name dot last name at gmail.com, Sridhar.sarnaba at gmail.com. Please email me. I'd love to give you a proper answer to that, share with you some URLs, and then not take uh, up too much of this time so that we can move on to another question. So uh, Michelle and Brian and somebody else asked a question uh, that I think I can answer. So please email me. Uh, please move on, uh, Lawrence. I yeah, I'd like to add to that too. I, I lead a large global team right now, and I'm, I'm familiar with these frustrations. Uh, I, I think the first thing to note when you move into a leadership role from an individual contributor role, the nature of your work changes a lot. So when you talk about like working on projects and stuff like that, um, should you really be doing that work or should you be delegating it? And the nature of my work as a leader is more about spending blocks of time, 30 to 60 minute blocks of time with people, helping them to get their work done. So if, if you can focus more on managing your schedule and inviting people to block off time with you, I think that's going to be a lot more effective use of your time. Thank you. This question is for Andrew. Um, so Andrew, does anyone on, uh, 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 so in a fast paced environment, how do you multitask? You, I, I know that you have six monitors in front of you. <laughs> Uh, but how to, can you tell us a little bit more about how you multitask? Uh, most openings seem to require that uh, applicants excel in these areas. So, so yes, I have six 4K monitors on my wall and I probably multitask to the point of not being good. I'm told more than six is excessive, so I just got six bigger ones. Um, but what I would recommend and something that I find really helps the most is coming in at a different time when it's quiet so I come in earlier, I can get my schedule cleared for the day. So those things where I do need the attention, then I'm able to multitask through the rest of the day. Um, Monday mornings, for example, I leave completely open. I won't speak to people or clients to get myself set for the week. And I find that really keeps my head on straight as far as multitasking is concerned, because there's so many little things that come up through the day, especially with leading you know, a team and 50 million emails and pulled in all directions. So I really find that starting the week with as little on the list and starting the day with as little things that could be distracted as possible is helpful. Thank you, Andrew. So Wes, um, I'd like you to tackle this question. Uh, can you talk about, we, we talk about the, the scaling uh, of the neurodiversity at work uh, program, uh, but that's really about the, the larger companies. Uh, a couple of days ago, I, I talked about and, and tried to pose a, a position on the need to actually get the neurodiversity at work program in small businesses because they basically are representing 60% of the workforce in the country. So can, can you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking um, that small businesses can get involved um, sure. Um, I mean, I think that it's all about 
approaching the, um, well, I mean, it's the foot in the door thing first. So you have to kind of adjust your interviewing style. Um, if you recognize maybe that someone's, um, if you have like a gut feeling that people are um, not, uh, something's off, it probably is, but it may not be what you think. So ask questions if you're interviewing someone in a smaller company. And I mean, I think then also, you know, that once you get in, that like you start to get employees and you start to see, I think you want to try to keep the whole, um, like you want to get a, you want to keep it consistent across the board for all of your employees. So I would honestly say that it's the same as this at a larger company. I mean, you want to try to shift your paradigm to be where you're um, talking about um, strength space instead of this deficit model and like in making sure that you're able to keep the um, the people that are the people that are interviewing you that you're interviewing you keep an open mind because they may not disclose to you but when you're in you may notice that there's something that seems off or whatever and, and, it, and if you kind of work around it, like we've got some gamified interviewing and stuff like that right now, then that kind of might help open the door to at least starting to understand uh, and get people in. And once you have people in, then you have people that can help buy in and all of that. Thank you, Wes. And Selena, you got the, the last question. I think that this question is very important for a lot of people that are already uh, working in companies. Um, so, what questions should I be asking and what resources should I provide human resources if my autism diagnosis has arrived mid-employment in a position that I enjoy but have struggled with certain aspects of? Um, so I think that varies obviously from person to person. Um, I would say in my personal experience, first communicating with your manager, um, letting them know like, hey, this is my situation. I have an official diagnosis and just trying to better understand if you can catch those struggles. I know sometimes it's hard to kind of understand the help you may need, but being able to just communicate that like, hey, I like, for example, um, I have sleep issues. Uh, completely unrelated to me being autistic, but I have sleep issues. And so I have to be able to communicate that with my manager and say, you know, look, um, these are things I'm struggling with and I'm struggling being able to stay awake during these hours or during these meetings. And then from there with the assistance from my manager and also communicating with HR, we're able to kind of explore our options and see, okay, what what can we do to make this easier on you to be as flexible as we can be while also, you know, fulfilling, you know, any obligations, any expectations. Um, but it, it really, I think just kind of communicating with them, you know, if you're not comfortable uh, with sharing certain aspects, that's okay too. And it's, you really kind of have to, it, it really just kind of comes down to that communication and, and trying to provide as much understanding because they can't, an uh, HR person, um, your manager, they cannot help you if they don't know what the issue is. And I think that I, I personally would find that that's the most important aspect is just being able to communicate that. And, and also taking the time for yourself to better understand your situation and how you, what, what possible options could help you? Because then you can also come back to the table and, and say, you know, look, this is what I think would be most uh, helpful for me. And, and so that's what I would, um, that's what I would say. Thank you, Selena. And thank you all. Um, you, you are all really awesome leaders in, uh, at various uh, different levels for the neurodiversity um, community. And um, really, a lot of people are looking up to all of you. So uh, thank you for sharing your insights today. Uh, we have to um, close this session and take a five-minute break and then uh, have Marcel Champy to, um, to tell us about uh, her insights 
on uh, the tips for job seekers and employees uh, on the spectrum. So we'll take a five minute break. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Thank Fung. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back. Welcome to the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit. For those of you that just joined, uh, we welcome you. This is day five of the summit. Uh, this is also the last day. Uh, all the sessions are recorded and transcribed and they are available in the summit website. At least the, uh, the recordings are already up. Uh, for the audience, please submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The moderators will try to cover as many questions as possible. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Marcel Champy, also known as Samantha Kraft. She is a respected autistic author and community advocate and is best known for her writings found in the well-received blog and book Everyday Asperger's. A professional educator, she has been featured in various literature, including uh, peer-reviewed journals, Autism Parenting uh, Magazine, The Mighty, uh, Project SP, Art of Autism, and Different Brains. Marcel works as a senior recruiter and outreach specialist at Ultranauts, an engineering firm with a neurodiversity hiring initiative, and is a consultant for Optimize Spectrum Fusion, etc. A contributing author of Spectrum Women, Walking to the Beat of uh, Autism, Marcel speaks globally on the topic of neurodiversity. She also serves uh, as a founder of the uh, uh, firm Spectrum Suite and is the co-founder of um, Spectrum Lights Inclusion Summit. She is co-executive of NeuroGuides and a contributor to autism organizations internationally. Some of her works, especially the 10 traits have been translated into multiple languages and have been shared in counseling offices around the world. She resides in the Pacific Northwest with her sons and a life partner. Thank you so with this, much. Yeah, I'd like to um, invite uh, Marcel um, to start sharing her pearls on, uh, uh, for a lot of the job seekers and uh, employees on the spectrum. Fantastic, thank you so much, Dr. Fung. And of course, thank you for hosting this huge event. I, I can't imagine how hard it's been to be coming on every day. I'm exhausted just trying to follow most of the um, presentations. It's been a, a great opportunity to, to network and learn, learn new things, so thank you. So two skills that get me through this interesting life are admitting my fears and laughing at myself. So I will tell you now, my biggest fear is failing my neurodivergent family out there. So I'll try my very best. I have listed on LinkedIn several articles that I've written that will be part of this talk. I have over 2000 hours of study into this area. So I'm trying very hard to make this into this, this time limit of an hour of 60 minutes. You can find those articles by searching the hashtags neuromynority neurodiversity or spectrum suite and a suite is as in an office building like s-u-i-t-e neurominority neurodiversity or spectrum suite i'm also going to use those same hashtags when this session is over and i'm going to spend about a five minute break and then i'm going to jump on linkedin in case i don't have a chance to answer your questions so keep your questions handy and i'm going to spend some time there answering for you and my name to look under LinkedIn is Marcel Champy, and it'll be shown at the end under resources. Oh, it's right there on the slide as well. And we go to the next slide. And thank you for the moderators. I really appreciate it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, Ultranauts to get this started. And then the rest will be a lot of different information. So Ultranauts is a fully remote engineering firm with employees located around the USA and Canada. Everyone works from home, including the CEO and VPs. And 75% of our teams are on the autism spectrum and 45% are women or non-binary, yes. 
We hire outside of tech roles, including members in the recruitment team and a VP who's a neurodivergent as well. We utilize a universal design approach to inclusion. You've heard that mentioned a few times during the summit. And we focus on best practices for everyone. We've grown from 10 to over 90 employees in my six years at the company. I was their first recruiter and now I'm the recruitment manager. And currently we have a hiring free freeze um, for quality engineering positions. However, we are always taking inquiries and we take down your note and then we will get back to you when there's jobs available. We pride ourselves on a person-centered approach. We wanna to get to know you and we wanna take the time to answer questions. We were just featured in the New York Times, our company a couple days ago, so you might wanna check that out. And some of the skills you might be wondering we need for the quality engineer, what we're looking for in that role are the ability to move manual tests to programs that exercise the application or website, people with software developing coding program experience. And we offer accommodations to anyone, you do not have to disclose. So you can say, I'd like to uh, have a text for my interview. I prefer face to face over the internet or I'd like a phone call, that's up to you. And we have an extensive recruitment overview that outlines from start to finish what to expect and who you're going to meet with, with many of our roles. We're developing those for our higher level roles as well. And with that said, oh, let me talk a little bit about this picture. So I'm on the autism spectrum. I was diagnosed with Asperger's over eight years ago. My son, who is my middle son, was diagnosed as well at the UC Davis Mind Institute when he was five, and now he's 21. And this is a painting I did, and it reflects how I sometimes feel in this world. I have partial face blindness, a cognitive condition of face perception, and it's a name I cannot pronounce, but I could spell for you, <laughs> no matter how many times I practice, because I'm also dyslexic. And I'm sure some of you out there who are in the community are saying out, out loud, so thank you, you know the word. And we can go to the next slide. <laughs> this is me when I was younger, she's with me today. Uh, I still smile this way. And one of the many things I love about neurominorities, a new term I believe coined by Judy Singer that was used recently by Dr. Nancy Doyle, is our tendency to be genuine on our, in our expression. And my favorite thing to do when I was a little girl in Sacramento, California, now I'm in Olympia, Washington, was to climb trees, eat green apples, and play in the gutter. And we go to the next slide. So I have a super long bio, and I'm not gonna bore you with all that, but if you wanna go to my website, you can go to myspectrumsuite, S-U-I-T-E dot com, myspectrumsuite.com, and it, I call it my rabbit hole. I spent hundreds, if not thousands, thousands of hours there. I spent a full year making a page just on this topic of employment as it relates to autistics. And all the resources are free there, so I welcome you to go there and I encourage you to go there. In addition, there's links to many, many blogs of people all over the world. And if you click just on the word autism, it takes you to a bunch of neurodivergent people who are leaders and professionals and artists all over the world. So lots of information for you there. In addition, you can go to my retired blog, which is a thousand pages long. It's everydayaspergers.com. And the very first page will take you to other places like my LinkedIn profile. It's, it's kind of a hallway to other blogs and so forth. So you can um, learn more about me as well on my LinkedIn profile. I don't like to really list all my, my accomplishments out loud. I really don't even like to list them in writing. In fact, it, it was just this month I beefed up my LinkedIn profile to reflect what I've been doing. So go ahead and check it out for yourself. I'm fortunate to have directly conversed with over 10,000 individuals around the world, uh, mostly on the spectrum or similar profile and their supporters and their family members. Recently, I had a talk with Rami, a Star Wars loving licensed psychotherapist who's a doctoral student as well. I love him. And he told me recently that his research lens out as, that started out as the world of autism turned out to be what it is to be human. And I absolutely love that. My partner, who's also on the spectrum, you'll look in this picture here in the middle, that's David, my handsome, my handsome partner that I adore. He also has children on the autism spectrum. He centered there at a fundraiser at a not for profit we did in LA um, for his non for profit life guides for autistics. He coaches autistic adults. So we're very much an autistic family here. One of the quotes I wrote down that he said recently on the call was, 
We've been living in a deficit model of autism for decades. And this one ism, this autism, is as close to the human experience as you get. Individuals with extreme and profound empathy. And I know that there's a lot of researchers out there, but I tell you, there's a lot of research in this brain here. I've talked, like I said, to over 10,000 people directly with autism. And I can tell you a lot about how engaging, loving, personal, creative, I've never met such creative people in my life. And we'll go into more of those characteristics. I'm lucky to have insights every day from beautiful souls all over the world. And I'm also the author of Everyday Asperger's is listed here, which brought thousands of people around the world to their diagnosis of understanding that they were on the spectrum. Many females, but across the gender, gender spectrum now. I'm working on another book. <laughs> and I came up with the name yesterday. This is typical me, those that, you know, that know me. I got a email from Starbucks about a deliciously different drink. And I'm like, that's me. That's my group. That's my community. We're deliciously different. And so the book I'm reading, I'm working on is going to be called Deliciously Different, Not Your Average Cup of Human. And we can go on to the next slide. Love Steve. I used to always promote his book and forget mine. I still do that. I still do. He worked um, five years, 11 hours a day on the book Neurotribes. I highly recommend it as a, as a history, historical view of autism. He's a strong advocate for us. He lives in San Francisco and he reviewed my book. Um, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Today we'll be talking about job search tips, but let me be clear, most workplace hiring practices and what I'm giving you is a temporary life preserver. From here, excuse me, let me say that again. Most workplace hiring practices need a lot of improvement. So what I'm giving you today is a temporary life preserver. From here, we need to advocate for radical inclusion, as Haley Moss said, and change the workplace. I agree with Steve here that we need to look at the potential of autistic people and we need to move away from doing a lot of studies on us and treat us more as human beings and listen to our stories. I'd like us to remember that adults on the spectrum come from all different walks of life and vary in their support needs and their abilities to live independently. None of us are greater than or less than. We all function in our own unique way. We're not high functioning or low functioning, we're human beings. And we'd never say that to neurotypicals, so don't say it about us, please. Individuals on the spectrum have as many varied interests and vocations as any human being. They include experts in technology and literature, the author communicating through assistive technology to compose a book, and the advocate giving inspirational keynotes. We include people receiving government assistance and those who are philanthropists, which I had to put hyphens in to make sure I can pronounce it. We are a fundamental part of the fabric of society, businesses, faith houses, and, and workplaces everywhere, and families. We have the potential to excel in many different trades and vocations. Some are in the service and care industry. Others are doctors or lawyers, as we just saw. Many are teachers and counselors. I used to be an elementary teacher and a middle school teacher, and then I went back to school to become a counselor, but I didn't end up doing that. So I'm typical for, for that area. Um, millions are loving, wonderful parents. Most autistics, autistics I know are the most lovable people on earth. We need more leadership role models in the workplace and at these types of neurodiversity events. I'd like to see people that are professional autistics take the stage on their own, who have lived life experience and can talk about their successes and they can serve as role models for millions of neurodivergents and their supporters around the world. At the same time, I'd like to recognize that there are families really struggling out there looking for answers. My son, when he was um, small, when he was young, I actually had support specialists leave the house with their hands up in the air saying, I'm sorry, we can't help you. And those were the hardest, darkest days of my life. I used to just cry and curl up in the corner. So I understand. So I'm not forgetting about you out there. And these events need to have that type of representation as well and not forget those parents. In fact, I'd like to share something I was just um, given on Twitter. And it's from a mom out there. And she's concerned that these events 
promote, that promote inclusion often fail to include those with profound levels of impairment and whose conditions confers few benefits in the job market. So I think we, this is a good start and I commend this platform and this opportunity, but we have a long ways to go. The next slide. If I had to choose one word for an autistic individual, it would be resilient. Despite considerable challenges, many spectrum, spectrum individuals keep going, keep trying their best. <clears throat> and even at their lowest, some are still trying to help others like myself. One of the primary reasons I've spent countless hours advocating for universal inclusion in the workplace is because individuals reached out to me from all over the world, depressed, discouraged, forlorn, and suicidal. So I'm sure that some of these big business leaders get tired of seeing my articles like the dark side of autism in the workplace. <laughs> and it's nothing against them personally. I'm just trying my best to give a voice to these people who are discouraged and some of these programs despite the best intention, they're just not working and we need to go to the next level. It's essential we put in place workplace measures that immediately address the mental health coexisting conditions of autistic people. All autism or neurodiversity hiring initiatives, as long as we're still gonna have them for a little bit, they should consider the co-occurrence rate of mood conditions. And there should be something in place for that. We're not just hiring autistic people. We're hiring human beings who've been ostracized and bullied and have severe trauma when they go into a workplace. And I'm basing this on pure evidence of multiple conversations with people. At Alternauts, we provide free job coaching, unlimited, and we provide free um, medical counseling for our autistic people and for everybody. And you don't have to disclose to receive it because let's face it, we all need help right now. Those are the type of inclusive practices where when we start not looking at just one minority and start looking at everyone as human beings, we can put in place. We are working hard to break the paradigm of inferior and superior constructs where autistic people are either seen as less than or superheroes. There is no reason why autistics and those with similar profiles ought not be coaches, supervisors, and managers across multiple departments and why we shouldn't be there talking about these programs. It really hurts my feelings and I get triggered and cry so often when I go into these webinars and it's all Caucasian men talking about me and my people and it's not okay. They're not on the spectrum. Numbers, uh, next slide, please. Autistic people are known for their loyalty and dedication to their employer and, they drive, and their drive to give everything they have for the betterment of the company. In some cases, employers can take advantage of us, not compensating us or recognizing our efforts, like working double time. And we often like, lack confidence or esteem to know how to ask for what we need or to set firm boundaries. Um, on one of my links on LinkedIn, I have a, a whole thing on boundaries there that I encourage you to look at. And it's hard to set those boundaries, especially for me. And I can't speak for all autistic people. We're all unique and all different. But the majority of us, we experience a lot of anxiety and confusion and self-doubt when we're trying to advocate for ourselves. And sometimes it takes me years before I even know how to advocate for myself or even notice that I've been wronged in some way. It's not common for autistic people to blame themselves. And you might think, well, what does this have to do with job tips? This has everything to do with job tips because it's not gonna matter if I tell you a bunch about how to do a resume and how to get your foot through the door if when you get there, you're miserable. On the other end, some workers will need explicit instructions and clear expectations in order to know how to succeed and, and how to give their best. So universal design measures, again, where all employees are supported through processes and procedures that clearly state how we do things, all the unspoken rules, they not only help autist autistic people, they help a lot of the general population in the workplace where they don't know, really, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I doing enough? So these types of measures help every single individual. I've gathered a list of traits through the years right here. Um, feel free to take a screenshot of that. Of course, every autistic person is completely different, but these are just some of the things that I've noticed for a majority of the job candidates and people that I know around the world. Next slide. We hear the term out of the box thinking a lot, but have you ever really thought, what does that mean? 
Well, here's some words that highlight out of the box thinking, such as courageous and instinctually focused on, I have to move my finger so I can read it, on many possibilities. So another thing you might want to screenshot if you are autistic or an out of box thinker, maybe you have you're an ADHD -er or dyslexic, you are definitely an out-of-box thinker if you are. It includes, um, let me see what, oh, and I did an article at differentbrains.org called Bottom Up, Bottoms Up, and it's all about out-of-the-box thinking and thinking in a unique way if you want to check that out. We'll go to the next slide. So anxiety is a fear of the unknown, particularly worrying we will not have the tools to handle the future. It includes anticipating future danger. A degree of anxiety is to be expected with all of us. It's part of life. We can't predict the future. And it's the most common psychological condition because unless you're psychic, we don't know what's around the corner, especially with a wrecking ball of 2020. It's important to implement measures to reduce anxiety during the job search process, especially or in the workplace if you're already there especially for those who have generalized anxiety and PTSD like myself or similar conditions. Putting a name to an emotion is, is one tool that we can use, a way to identify and process those emotions. It might be helpful to practice statements like, I am sad because, I am disappointed because, I am scared because. Bringing that fear out of the closet, I've been doing that for years and I can't tell you how effective it is, not only in job search or the workplace, but in your intimate relationships and in your friendships. You know, I say to my coworker, are you mad at me? I'm afraid you're mad at me. Call it out, be transparent, get rid of that fear. Ask for some assistance, reach out and realize you are enough, worthy, lovable and deserving, no matter who you are and what your neurology is. If you're a supporter out there, I can applaud you for being here. A parent, I applaud you for being here. Thank you so much. Realize these things because you might be the caretaker or the coach and you need to realize that you're enough and worthy. And find at least one person in your life to remind you of those things, even if it's me. If you're having a down day, you can reach out to me. I'm here. I'll re unless you want something from me for free, like my intellectual property, then I'll send you to my website for my services. <laughs> uh, let's see where I was at. Um, try to step back and watch yourself. I have OCD, or you could say I'm an ocd -er, which causes repetitive thoughts in my head. And I can loop and loop and loop. And I know some of you out there, whether you're on the spectrum or not, understand what that's like. So one of the things I do is I try an altruistic approach. An example, may what's for the highest good of all be the outcome. And I try to let it go. Moving the energy from fear or anxiety through your productivity is a, like a movement or art, breathing, walking, creating, writing, any of those things are really helpful and they've helped me in the past. Let's move on to the next slide. Here is one of my paintings, speaking of creativity. So this is layers and layers and layers of paint and I often don't know what I'm painting. I use it as a type of spiritual practice as well as to release energy and emotions. So find a way that you can release some of this energy as you're either starting a new job, been at a job, or going through the job search process. And these are types of questions that you can ask yourself when you're first starting off on your journey. And you're starting to learn about the job search process itself, maybe making a resume or practicing for interviews, because interviews aren't going away anytime soon. At Alternauts, we revamp the whole interview process and we have lots of different accommodations and considerations. In fact, you can even come to the interview and tell us you're having anxiety and ask to come back at a different time. And it's not, we don't count you down in any way. In fact, I really like quirky people. We go to the next slide. So before starting a job seeking process, it's beneficial to do some initial self-reflection on what motivates you. So what is motivating you to get a job in the first place? And if you're a caretaker or a parent out there, what is motivating or how can you motivate your young adult or teenager or someone that needs more support needs to do some work? So asking some basic questions, you know, we might not even think of it. Why exactly are we looking for work? And it might change. It might change from month to month or hour to hour. We don't know. Let's go to the next slide. 
And I heard some of you asking in another um, session, where can you look for like vocational skills and or where you might have aptitudes. So there's lots of different things online. You can search for, take a screenshot of this if you wish um, and go and explore what interests you. Next slide. In addition, this is a real popular book. There's lots of books out there where you can explore vocations. You could look online. Um, when our public libraries are back open, check that out. College career centers, job coaches, asking people, hey, do you like being a recruiter? Hmm, what do you think of outreach? Do you enjoy it? Ask people you know. Ask people that are um, people that you look up to, that you think and consider that they've, they've done pretty well. They're, they seem to be managing okay in this world. Next slide. Unless you're experienced in finding gainful employment, it's not advisable to jump headfirst into applying for a job. And I always suggest some type of plan, even if that plan is a to-do list. And plans can look all different ways. And I like to say to base them on your learning style. Uh, so maybe you wanna make a plan out of poster board or notebook or a spreadsheet. I'm a spreadsheet queen. I used to really intimidate my CEO, Rajesh. <laughs> It was like opening my mind. He asked me for a plan for community management and I gave him like a three year extensive plan with 35 rows and they went all these different directions like my mind, like the mushrooms underground that spread out everywhere. So do what works best for you. And if you're working with someone, find out what works best for them. Maybe they wanna make a poem about a job search. Maybe they just wanna talk about it, take long walks and process it, but come, get some type of focus, some type of plan. So it's not all these unknowns like, well, when are you going to work on your resume? When are you going to look at what might interest you? Come up with a plan, design it. And for those of you that have uh, children or young adults with higher support needs, maybe they aren't going to go out into the work world and that's just a reality and you understand that. You, job can be very expansive and mean lots of things. So maybe their job is going to be something that they help doing around the house. And if they have physical limitations, Maybe their job would be texting uplifting messages or making, you know, making something creative that they can provide that motivation and love to the family. So we can use that out of box thinking and we can bring people in that might not have the traditional job, but we can still create some type of job and sense of worth for them. And we can call it a job even. The next slide. And make sure to slow down and set real manageable goals. I am the worst at that. I, I just always work overtime. I'm trying so hard not, not to. So implement self-care. Don't forget to implement self-care, whether you're an autistic person, neurodivergent person, or somebody who is um, helping, et cetera. Just implement that self-care self and celebrate those accomplishments. Um, celebrate with each other, but please don't make us into superheroes. And, and make it as if, despite our autism, look what they were able to do. Please don't do that. Remember to reach out for help. And this is an essential skill as a human being in relationships and in the workplace. So practice that skill. Learn phrases, write down phrases of how to help for help, ask for help. It's really essential that we implement self-care, especially during these times, more than any other time since I've been alive. So I will tell you, I have a confession to make. I actually have to text my partner, David, and ask him to come and make sure I'm taking a shower and brushing my hair. I kid you not, this is ongoing. And when I do brush my hair, he always says how pretty I look. And I think, oh, it's because I brushed my hair this week. So even me, I still need those reminders. I need still to reach out for help. So embrace yourself. Don't be ashamed. This is just part of your neurology. Those are your blocks. You deal with it. You find people that support you and love you anyways. And I don't mean deal with it, like deal with all your blocks, like they're not hard and difficult. But this one part, if you're having trouble taking a shower, text somebody, have them be your accountability person. Next slide. And this is my friend's picture. And don't wait for your pet <laughs> to tell you to take a break. If you have to set, I'm gonna try this new strategy, set an alarm on your phone and put it in another room or across the room. So you have to get up and get a drink of water so when you're looking at for work and you're researching jobs and networking, or if you're actually in the workplace, this, this applies to everybody and it applies to us caretakers as well. And let's see, uh, let's go on to slide the next slide. Thank you.
I love this little technique. It's not mine. It's floating all around the internet. I don't know who to credit it for. But ask yourself some accountability questions. And so, for example, what will I stop doing? I might say projecting into the future. Um, what will I start doing? Increasing my self-care. Do more upskilling and less time staying up so late so I, <laughs> I have a little more energy the next day. Okay, next slide. These are places you can seek out where you might feel accepted, valued, worthy, and safe. And these are just some ideas that I threw together and came up with, and you could even add to this list. But again, thinking outside that box, there's lots of places we can go to connect. And if connecting's hard, start with baby steps. Just find one person, one advocate, or one person you feel comfortable with. I used to do that a lot when I was little. I just tended to gravitate towards marginalized minority people. And I think I innately knew because I understood the struggle of what it's like to be alone and, and, and be different and be called out and not get a fair chance and equity and equality. And so find somebody that you feel that you connect with and that you trust or someone you think you're going to be able to trust. And if you're not sure, run it by someone else you know. What do you think of this person? That's not gossiping. gossiping. That's just taking care of yourself. And next one. And it's advisable to seek out a mentor outside the home, no matter what age you are. I use a job coach still. Sometimes I use mental health therapy because if we're really close to a family member, sometimes it's hard to accept their, their compliments or, oh, sure, well, mom loves me. Mom thinks I'm great. But it's nice to have someone that's not a family member to, to reinforce that, yeah, you're strong. Yeah, you're doing a great job. You're super resilient. And I like to call it, I'll be your bridge. And a bridge to self-reflection, a bridge to future success, a bridge to help with navigating what can be a confusing world. And it doesn't matter your age, um, especially when navigating the workplace, once you are in a job or if you're already in a job right now. And believe in that person. And both the mentee and the mentor can practice statements like, I have something on my mind. Is, that a, is this an okay to talk about it? Is this an okay time to talk about it? So for me, having some phrases ahead of time that I can use are helpful because it's one thing to learn. First, you have to learn to identify you need help, and then you have to get enough courage to ask for help, and then you have to figure out, well, how do I ask for it? So having those statements ahead of time, if you're a mentor or a parent or a friend, if you're my age, it doesn't matter. Having those statements ahead of time takes one less thing you have to worry about and think about in the next slide. And then, of course, there's employment specialists. Next. And we'll just go through these slides quickly. As soon as I pause, you can go to the next one. So there's one-stop career centers that are located throughout the USA, and membership is free. Um, America's Service Locator, you can check that out. Go to the next. And, of course, a lot of us have heard of the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, DVR. If you have a physical or mental disability, you can receive help. Uh, health services there. I have several friends that are in DVR. I talk to them all over the United States, some of the kindest people. So I really encourage you to reach out to them. One warning, if they don't know a lot about autism or autistics, send them to my site, send them to someone's site, because the last thing you want is someone to tell you how to not be yourself, how to mask. I heard from this really distraught young man, I've even written about it in one of my articles, that his coach, I think it was at a DVR, was telling him how to look him look in the eyes, how to sit a certain way, and he felt and she was criticizing him. Um, I had one call once where the lady was mimicking the stimming of the person she was working with, and and she said, "I just told him, would you want someone doing this to you?" And and I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" And she she was helping someone. So advocate for yourself. Just because they're a professional, I've learned this lots of times through doctors. <laughs> just because they're professional doesn't mean they're the best match for you. So look out for yourself. And if you're a parent or caretaker, look out for the person you're helping. Next slide. And also, these are all different types of resources. I'm not an expert on all these resources, but I put in as much here as I could to help you. So here's another place that you can check out, whatcanyoudocampaign.org. And these are pre-recorded, or these are recorded, so you can go back if you miss any of these slides. And again, I'll be meeting in LinkedIn after this if you have any questions. Next one. So areas to research. 
So we talked a little bit about job search plan, making sure you've got your anxiety under control, you have a support person, you're knowing how to ask for help. So these are all things we wanna do before we just jump into the job search because it helps you to be confident. It helps you not to get discouraged and stop. So the next is networking, which is a very scary term. In fact, I did a whole article on my third blog about why I don't like LinkedIn. And then I shared it on LinkedIn. So talk about quirky. So I understand. I do not like networking. I do not like tech very much. So it's really ironic that I'm an outreach specialist for a tech company, but I love meeting new people and I love hearing new ideas. So I try to get through that anticipatory anxiety and do my best despite, despite the difficulties and you can do it. And I encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn and follow my threads. I have a lot of people I've connected with. And if you join in the conversations with me, either on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, that'll pull you into the conversation. You can kind of be in the side of the room, you know, and just checking things out. And you don't even have to say anything, but it's a good way to learn how to network. And most employers now and recruitment teams are looking at LinkedIn profiles. And we're looking at what types of things you're posting. Um, we can't hire you based on that, but it definitely stays in our minds. Um, at Ultramats, we use very objective resumes that are scored by between one and five. And we're really trying to evaluate for skills and efficiencies and not anything to do with social skills, but actual skills that match the job description. But recruiters are also looking at what your profile is like out there. So I really encourage you to start networking and start learning that, that, um, that skill. It is, a, it is a skill nowadays. And, and that's another reason to put a mentor on your team and help you with those types of things, or maybe hire a job coach to help you with those things that might seem really basic, but you know what? I have another confession to make because I am so far from perfect. If you read my book, you know that. I have another confession to make, and that's I just beefed up my LinkedIn profile about three weeks ago, and I was really nervous, and I was ocd about it, and you know, kept rechanging it and looking at all these different other ones because I don't like to brag about myself, and I don't like to sell myself, but the reality is I have to in this world, if I'm going to be successful at this job that I'm in, you might choose to do a job where you don't need to network once you have your foot in the door, maybe more a service industry or trade school, and that's fantastic. But for those of us that do, it's really kind of a necessity, unfortunately. But you know what? I met all these great people on LinkedIn, and some of them are out there right now, and they're reading some of my stories and listening to my concerns about autism and in the workplace, which I like to call better autistics in the workplace. I mean, what is autism in the workplace? It's like floating around, there's autism. Okay, now I'm thinking of Ghostbusters. That's my ADHD years coming in. <laughs> so anyway, pull in a mentor, go on LinkedIn. You can go and look at mine and, and copy that or go and find other people that you admire or that you respect or that are in the same job field as you and copy their, copy, not, not what they've done for a living obviously or their degrees, but copy their format and how they're selling themselves. And next one. Oh, so I just, I left it on the areas to research too long. That's no big deal. That's the one we were on. I was just gonna talk about now. Oh, so again, oh, no, you go back, sorry. Thank you. I'm used to doing this because I've been remote working for six years and other people do my slides when I teach anxiety and stress uh, workshops. So back and forth slides, I'm used to that. So um, to piggyback off that, list ideas. Where else can you reach out? Just not LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, so on Twitter, you can look for actually autistic, and you can look for autistic elders, and you can find a lot of us there. A lot, a great way to network. Uh, search, search engines are a fantastic way. If you go into LinkedIn, you can search people that are in similar fields as you, and then look at people or look at topics. You can look at something like diversity and inclusion or autism, see who's posted about that recently. And then determine who you're gonna contact, how you're gonna contact them and what you're gonna say. I really like this lady who reached out to me recently and she said, she said something nice and then she said, are you open to being part of my network? Or are you open to expanding your network? And I thought that was really nice. It's like, oh, she's asking me if I would like to be in her network and with her and I really appreciated that. So practice those types of things and how are you going to say it and how are you going to reach out? The next slide. 
And you can use those hashtags that I just mentioned and spend some time thinking about what you're going to do. And these are things I just talked about. You can get free membership on LinkedIn, join in those conversations. Also look at autism support groups, if you're autistic, obviously, or if you're a parent of autistic, they have those as well. You can look at Wrong Planet, Reddit, look in different corners. And you know what? What's neat about it is kind of like jumping, a, a frog jumping from rock to rock to rock to rock is you meet one person and guess what? They have their own pond. And then you meet them and go to their pond and they have their own pond. So before you know it, you have more and more people. And if you're not comfortable doing that, this is just one approach. So take what you're comfortable with, leave the rest behind. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm just trying to give you as much as I can in this short amount of time we have together. Next slide. And there's tons of ways you can brand yourself. I started off by speaking at service clubs and by writing my blog. I didn't know I was branding myself at the time because I was processing my late age diagnosis and, and the trauma I went through with that. It's another story. But you can brand yourself in all different ways. You can make YouTubes. You become a subject matter expert like I have on universal inclusion in the workplace. And you know that a lot of us neurodivergents are really good at diving deep into a topic and becoming a subject matter expert. So try to switch that into something that you could turn into a career. And let me see if I forgot. Oh, this is a great tool. So my friend Debbie came out to see me from Seattle yesterday. She met me through the blog and we've known each other. We were arguing. She says five, I say six years, <laughs> but she is applying for jobs and she is on the spectrum. And so this is an exercise you can do at home where you choose five adjectives about you, but then you go beyond that. You make them real, real specific so you can see it and you can, you can visualize it in your head and you can see what the person's doing. So for example, Debbie said, well, I'm supportive. And I'm like trying to picture that on my head and I'm like, okay, I have no idea as a recruiter or as a leader in the company, I would not know when she said, well, I'm very supportive. I wouldn't know what that meant. It's so broad. So we talked about it and we talked about different places she's been scenario, uh, she's been supportive. And what we came down to was very specific. So instead of saying at the job, I'm supportive, she's going to say, when I work with children and we're working together, I observe what their needs are and where their struggles are. And I look for resources and bring it to the table so we can better equip the child. So you can see how much different that is in saying I'm supportive. The other one she did was um, attention to detail. And he's like, well, that's a nice, that's a nice adjective, but I can't picture it. I don't know what is she attention to detail. Is she a software tester? Is she a dog groomer? What is she doing? So she narrowed it down further to I'm a skilled observer. And, and then she elaborated on that and gave a specific experience. So I think you get the idea. I won't leave you there any longer, but making it so that we can picture what you're saying is so helpful. And that's really good when those questions come up, whether it's pre-screening or in the interview itself or onboarding. So tell me, why do you want to work here? Or can you tell me why you're fit for this role? Having those five adjectives and specific examples that you can give. So for example, if I asked you, why do you think that you would make a good software tester? And you say, oh, because I, I have attention to detail. And in the past, this is how I've, I've demonstrated that. And that's helpful. And by the way, I'm the worst at interviews. I'm, I'm you know, the plumber who's, whose pipes are always broken. I always blow it in interviews. So you don't have, you, you know, you just try your best in this world, right? Next slide. So again, with the LinkedIn, um, just realize it's not, it's not bragging. It, it's, it's playing the game essentially to get yourself out there, to get yourself hired and it's okay. And if you need someone to look over it and just reassure you, you know, you're doing the best you can, it's okay, but just try, just try it. And a second pair of eyes is really useful. Look at you, you switched the slide without me even asking. No, that was perfect. <laughs> we can work together. <laughs> so it's really hard to go above, it, it's really hard sometimes for us to sell ourselves again. And make sure I'm on the right slide here. So there's so much we could talk about with resumes. I mean, I could spend a whole hour on resumes alone. So I encourage you to look online at samples 
and other people who've posted their resumes on LinkedIn. That's a really good example. Watch videos, write, watch slide shares from LinkedIn about resume building. And I can tell you, I've read over a thousand resumes and they're all different. There isn't just like one standard that's out there. I will say that content is much more important than fluff. I don't want to see your picture. That's not important to me. I do want to see skills, precision, and words from the job description, exact words from the job description. Because if I'm not looking at, at your resume, then an applicant tracking system might be looking at your resume and they're purposely trained. The machine, the algorithm is trained to pick out words in your resume that match the words in the job description. So take some time. And if you're a real kinesthetic learner like myself, then cut out that, those words in the resume, in the job description itself and look at them and then and transfer them over. The next slide. Muhammad Ali said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. I love that. Service to others is the rent you pay here, you pay for your room here on earth. So to build a resume and cover letter and, and to have dialogue in the interview, where do you start? Gain experience, gain experience wherever you can. It doesn't have to be paid. Many of us are drawn to service work, you can volunteer to write at not-for-profits or clean up their website if you're into tech. You can consider internship in uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurship like a pet service, pet walking business. Start off by walking someone's dog. I mean, and that's not, not for young kids. I know successful adults that have pet sitting services. You can start by delivering food from the grocery store for an elderly and build your own business that way for an elderly person. And many applications that I review list a lot of community service and volunteer work, even people that, like me that have been out there in the working world for a long time. And it's becoming more fashionable and more in. And I had someone from a very high or very high end position link, list all her recent LinkedIn learning. So it's shifting. So consider those things. Consider being a leader in a support group. That can be an online group. That's a skill. That's something you can put on your, your uh, resume. List things like this event. You attended, if you attended some of these summits, list it. Uh, you can list, if you read some of my articles, you can list those things. So find inventive ways to list skills, take on new learnings, go to Khan Academy, go to um, SlideShare, just get more learning and get more experience and get that on there. And remember, you go to the next slide, you're, you're, first job, you can go to the next slide. Your first job is not the end all. It might be a job that you really don't like and you don't plan on being there long. But when you have a job, it teaches you real important skills like networking, how to associate with other uh, employees, how to build leadership skills. And you know what, at my age, I'm still learning those things. So this isn't about being autistic or being neurodivergent. This is just continual learning. So don't turn something down because it's not your perfect fit. If there's a Starbucks across the street, hey, and you don't have to take the bus or drive a car and you need to gain some work experience, then go check it out. And they have great benefits, I hear. Next slide. So these are some of the examples of the opportunities I did when I was um, first starting to do more advocacy work and talking. I contacted Hacky that did a wonderful, brilliant keynote yesterday. And that's Hacky the Hedgehog. <laughs> I have named my hedgehog after Hacky because I love his spirit. I love his energy. I love how he's equipping us with empowerment and awareness. So I reached out to him and said, I, I have some things to contribute. And so now I do spectrumly um, speaking sometimes with Haley Moss. I've even posted one myself and I write articles there. And I just sent in a recent one about uh, object permanence and um, having chronic pain conditions and being autistic. Also, the other one is art for autism. They pay their autistic people sometimes to write articles. So if you're an artist or you're a writer, check them out. Um, other ideas are, if you're an advocate, neuroplastic.org has lots of different autistic writers, the mighty. So look for those types of opportunities. I did thousands and thousands of hours of work for free to build up my profile and to build where I am today. And I already had a degree and I already had years of teaching experience. It doesn't stop. You have to keep going for what you want and do it. And if you're not the same type of brain as me and you're not as motivated and you don't want to do as much, 
then don't, but take parts of it that do fit with you and have people encourage you and help you through this. And the next slide. So think about the new skills, how you want to learn those new skills. So for me, when I'm watching the summit, I like to open my bills because opening bills because of my object permanence issues and challenges is hard for me. But if I'm listening to something and learning and doing at the same time, that's easier for me. So you can take that into the workplace and you can also take that into the job search. So maybe you need to be listening to a podcast or music or walking during this time. And, but try to get those skills and it can be interpersonal skills as well. I highly recommend the book, The Lost Art of Listening and it's brushing up your communication skills. And it's called the, Art, the Lost Art of Listening, How Learning to Listen Can Improve Relationships. You're never too late to learn these things. And that's not just for autistic people. I am a better communicator than a lot of people that are on the spectrum. So that's a misnomer. We can, it's a learning condition, it's a developmental condition. We can learn to be effective communicators. We can learn these things as we get older. And the more support and the more love and unconditional acceptance we have, the greater that capacity. Another book I recommend is Delivered from Distract Distraction, which is a well-known book on ADHD or ADD as they call it. Next slide. And use your attributes to your advantage. If you have a quirky sense of humor, quirky sense of humor, bring that to the table. If you're transparent, utilize that to your advantage. Being vulnerable is really in right now, but if you are gonna be vulnerable, make sure you have a support team if you feel insecure after you've been vulnerable. If you're steadfast and loyal, hone in on that. Next slide. It's also really good to know how you come across as a person. So ask somebody, am I kind of coming across as bossy? Am I coming across as too kind? Do I feel like, does it seem like people are gonna be able to walk over me? Get an idea. That doesn't mean that's who you are, but if you, you know, solicit different from different people, that can help you, it can help you improve. I continually do that. Sometimes when I write things on social media or at a, on a panel or at a webinar in the comment section, and I'm feeling like, was that professional enough? Was that okay? Did I cross a line? I'll copy and paste what I wrote into social media and I'll ask my friends, do you think I handled this okay? And I have smart, clear community who they're gonna be frank with me. So surround yourself with people who are gonna give you frank, clear feedback, you know, and, and, and help you with what you need. Also connect with your autism, learn about more about being autistic, being neurodivergent. There are key names if you're part of the autistic culture and if you choose not to disclose or you choose not to associate with being autism, with autism or autistic, that's fine too. My middle son just says, no, I'm, I'm just a human. I, I don't need to be part of the autistic culture. So that's good too. But if you are, and you are part of the autistic culture, then know names like Judy Singer and Steve Silverman and Haley Moss and Yen Perkis and so forth. And there's, there's literally thousands of people I'm living, leaving out that are strong advocates in our community and authors. And on my website, if you click on autism, it'll bring you to a lot of those people, but not everybody. Also know some disability terminology like uh, pro preoceptive and misophonia, I think I'm, I'm pronouncing those correctly. Go to the next slide. And remember that financial literacy, it's an important skill to know. And you know, are you being paid what you're worth? And what does a career path look like if you choose a certain career path? And where's the best place, place to put your money? And where are you going to put your money? Next slide. Some apps for job seekers never use them personally, but I put them there for people who might want to use them. You can also create automated searches on job boards, which will populate in your email. And I like to look on LinkedIn and do searches there for, uh, that's becoming more common. We do that for our jobs, posting them on LinkedIn sometimes. And then again, I, on myspectrumsuite.com, I spent a year compiling the page and it has some job boards specifically for neurodivergence as well. And the next slide. And this is reiterating what I said about, remember your first job doesn't have to be the end all. You can gain a lot of things from, from gaining work experience. And some of us people on the spectrum, if I may speak for some of us, we have really strong passions and really strong interests and that's the job we want and that's what we wanna do. That's okay, that can be a future goal and you can gain some work experience on your resume so you can get that job eventually. The next slide. 
So one of the qualities I look for in job candidate is someone who's done their homework. So look at the mission statement, look who's on the board, look at the competitors, look at the history, uh, look what people in the job on LinkedIn or in social media are posting, find out about it. You need to really stand out and go above and beyond nowadays, especially when you have a hundred people applying for the same job. Of course, that doesn't apply for other types of industries, but I mean, even it does, if you wanna be a waiter or if you wanna go in and you know be a bus boy or a bus girl or bus person, start off that way, just being able to know the menu or be able to say, hey, I really like this uh, restaurant. I've been coming here with my family for 10 years. If you can, tell somebody what you like about their organization. That really helps and it stands out. Next slide. And everyone counts, everyone. When it, if it's not time of the COVID, as soon as you get in your car, you don't know if that person driving in the street with you is gonna be the receptionist that you walk into when you first see that person. So from the very beginning, everyone counts. That first email, I mean, you should see some of the email addresses I get. You know, I don't, I don't judge and we don't close anybody out of recruitment because of it, but you know, hot mama or those types of emails, change it if it's gonna be your first reaching out to someone because not everyone is gonna be as knowledgeable about how different people present and as non-judgmental as I am. So clean it up, be professional, and it just, it just demonstrates that you also go above and beyond and that you're organized and that you care and that you took that extra time to go the distance. And interviewing itself, I could spend an hour on this. So again, on LinkedIn, I have put all, I put two or three different articles on job seeking skills on exactly how, to, how I would say to interview. Remember with a job description, it doesn't have to exactly match. If it says great team player and you're not a great team player or you don't know exactly what a great team player means, don't be discouraged from applying to that job. It's more so gonna be the skills. That's what people are going to be looking for the most when you go to an interview, hopefully, and not if you're a great team player. And great is so general, what does that even mean? So you could even ask them, I'm not sure what that means. Can you expand on that? Try to keep it positive. Avoid opinions and negative examples about past employment or comparisons. Like I, I didn't like my old job when, try not to be too honest, but be honest. So if they ask you, you're are you typically late? In, or, or if you're typically on time or late and you say, well, I'm typically on time, but there was that one time, you don't need to give everything. And by not giving out everything, you're respecting the time of the recruiter. So I could go more and more into the interview practices themselves. If you reach out to me directly, I can gear you towards those articles. It's all there, but practice if you can. Practice um, in a recorded device with someone else. Um, and also, if you choose to disclose, if you're comfortable disclosing, then that will help. Talk about the accommodations you need. But if you're not, you can partially disclose. So for example, I have dyslexia. I'm dyslexic. So I might only disclose that and say that I might need extra time because of that. And we could go into a whole discussion about the pros and cons of disclosing. Um, the next one is follow up. Send a thank you if you can. Even if you don't get the job, ask if there's other opportunities possibly. It makes a difference. You never know who they might talk to or you never know when you might run across them again or apply again. And the next slide is going into the accommodations that you could ask for. And I had a story about the airport there and how for me, I, for the first time I actually asked for help at the airport because I have difficulty looking at something like that top picture, not the bottom picture is much easier for me. And um, I wanted to go into disclosure more, but we've run out of time, so maybe next time. And the next slide, challenges. So this is my list of challenges. This is me, part of me, and it's okay. And I put this out there to show you, don't be discouraged, you, you are, if you are on the spectrum or you are neurodivergent, or even if you're not, just if you're another human being, just be you. And you, there's supports out there now to help you. And we can go to the last slide, um, second to last slide, 51. Those are my three sons and they all graduated college this year on the same day. And I'm very proud of them. And one of them is autistic and one of them is uh, ADHD -er, and I just can't wait to see what the future holds for them. And the very last slide is resources. 
And I practiced, I really did my best to try to save time for questions and answers. And I knew we probably wouldn't. So you can meet me in LinkedIn <laughs> and um, I'll answer a lot of questions there. And what I can do here too, is I can look in the chat and copy and paste some of these questions and put them in LinkedIn. That is wonderful. You answered my one question. I was going to say, how can people follow up with you? Because I know there's a lot of great questions in there and people would love to have them answered. And you've been giving information all along around how to copy, how to contact you. Um, so in LinkedIn, they just need to search. I see your name here. They just need to search for your name and that's how they can follow up. You say you're, you're having like a LinkedIn chat kind of follow up. Yeah, I have hashtags. So neurodiversity, neurominority, and spectrum suite, S-U-I-T-E. You can find me today and in the future with those hashtags. I try to use them every time. You can email me directly, take a screenshot there, and I can answer your question. Oh, please, if you wrote something to chat, go ahead and, and reach out to me on either one of those emails, and I'll be glad to point you to resources since I didn't have time to answer them today. Okay, I'm going to stop share. So if you're going to screenshot, do it now. <laughs> I made it on time. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. That was. Um, just a font of information. So, so <laughs> much information from all of your experience. And it was, um, there, there's just so much to learn from it. So thank you so much um, for, for bringing that here today. And I'm sure there's going to be uh, quite a bit of follow-up as, um, as you know, there were many questions and um, I think a lot of people who, who can see that you've, you've got a lot, uh, a lot of things that you can help, help and advise them on. So Thank you for being here today. And I'm just gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Fung, who's gonna let us know what's uh, coming up in the next, in the last afternoon of our uh, summit. Thank you again, Marcel, uh, for the brilliant presentation. Uh, There's so much uh, rich information. I'm sure a lot of the uh, audience have benefited a lot already. So uh, in the right now, basically there is networking session for those that have signed up for the networking session. And please uh, go to you, your uh, mailbox and check the email from your um, speaker that you're supposed to meet. So they would uh, arrange uh, the email um, link with you already. At one o'clock, we're going to resume the rest of the afternoon. This will be uh, our last afternoon together that we will have three hours of uh, presentation, all revolving entrepreneurship. And then at 4.30, between 4.30 to 6.30, we are going to have uh, our final concluding session, which will give you uh, a, a, the summaries of what's happened in, in this conference. If you have not really uh, gone to a lot of the sessions and want to get a summary of a lot of the sessions, this may be a session for you. Also for the speakers and moderators, uh, we are going to have group photo after uh, the basically at the end of the session. And uh, if we even have time and uh, bandwidth to do that, we may even be able to take a group picture with uh, the uh, attendees. We only have a hundred slots, so uh, it's not possible for everyone. We have uh, 3,000, over 3,000 people that have registered. So uh, you, you most probably will be able to come um, uh, to, to join us in some way. Thank you, Zachary. And uh, that's my son. Uh, who, who has fed me and really appreciate all of that. So see you at one o'clock. I'm going to just sign off now.
Welcome to the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit. For those of you that have joined us uh, just now, uh, welcome. Uh, we are going to show you uh, the, uh, you're going to be able to submit the uh, Q&A, the questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And the moderators will answer your questions uh, uh, accordingly. The first part of the uh, presentation this afternoon is going to be done by Kathy Farmer and um, Maureen Doon. And um, they will uh, talk about uh, entrepreneurship opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Fung. I'm Kathy Schwally Farmer. Please go ahead. Um, we're excited to talk about entrepreneur opportunities. Maureen and I are going back and forth. Is there a way for us both to be unmuted? Lawrence? Yeah, it might be easier if we can just manage the PowerPoint ourselves based no, on what we I think we're okay. Okay, next slide. Okay. okay. Um, so we had started the um, Autism Angel Group. We realized that there was a real huge opportunity to create new opportunity pathways to include neurodiverse job seekers. And so we founded the group um, at, in, in, because we, we had a mission. We both wanted to fund new inventions and innovations that make a positive social impact for the autism community and also to support neurodiverse founders and entrepreneurs. Next slide. So a little bit about myself, uh, Kathy, um, and you can see my email if you need to reach me. Um, I've been involved in autism since the early 60s when my first brother was diagnosed with autism. And then I had another brother of my four brothers uh, diagnosed in his 20s. And uh, my father was a huge uh, autism advocate. He actually started the Organization for Autism Research and he always wanted me to connect my tech background with my, uh, my autism advocacy as, a, as an older sister. And uh, it's been a great journey. And Maureen and I worked together last year, and it was a perfect time for us to partner. Yeah, and both Kevin and I are very passionate advocates for neurodiversity and have dedicated our lives to this important mission. Um, we both have very unique stories, personal stories, um, that we really don't have time to share here. But please feel free to reach out um, to us for more information about our backgrounds. There's also a lot of information on our Autism Angels Group website. And um, uh, a few years ago, I founded the Transition to Success Project. It's a program that provides customized support to teens with autism spectrum disorders as they transition to co the college or, or apprenticeship opportunity of their choice. Um, I've been very fortunate to receive a lot of support for this program, including the support of local rotary clubs, um, in terms of organizing fundraisers for the program. And Temple Grand also expressed her support and enthusiasm for this transition program, especially as we pair high school seniors with consistent uh, mentors and offer skill building workshops. Next slide. So this is the criteria that we use for our, aut our Autism Angels Investment Group. I'll let you read that, but let me add some other things to consider. So although this is a criteria to submit a startup for investment, we also have investment considerations. So it's more subjective. So the things that we consider to invest is the ability for the founders to deliver. What, what, split, what does the leadership team look like? Is there evidence of execution? What's the traction and the vision of the company? What's the product readiness? What is the unique intellectual property that's there? What is the traction of the sales funnel and their sol sol solidness of that sales funnel? Um, what are the deal terms? Uh, at that, what stage is the company? What is the potential and pre-money cap? And then what is the high social impact measures associated with the startup, which is something I'm gonna talk about more. So I'm using a lot of startup language and I might've gone real fast, but some of those decisions around making an investment are what a lot of startup uh, investors consider. Next slide. 
So let me talk about what I think is one of the most important things I want to share here is social impact investments and measures. In addition to regular uh, return on investment and cost savings, we want to see a positive social measurable impact for social uh, impact startups related to autism and founders who are on the spectrum. So uh, we look at things like improve, improved outcomes for time saved for people on the spectrum with their practitioners and educators, families, and the longevity of that impact. I'm gonna give you a very quick list of some of the examples of social impact measures that then you can translate into dollars. And we can help you do that as a startup. So behavior improvements, meltdown reduction, well-being and quality of life, independence, added skills, communication improvements, added jobs for ASD people, uh, increased housing opportunities, and quality of, em of employment. Next slide. So, um, if, so since we operate a little differently from a traditional venture capital model, uh, the social impact metrics, including the number of people we help employ in the spectrum is really very important to us. And so um, strategic partnerships are also really important where our goal really is to build a coalition um, of partners that will help us with our mission and um, work on, on, on this goal of, of the employment mission, employing more people with Spectrum. And so we work with um, quite a broad number of partners, includes investment funds, accelerators, incubators, nonprofits, universities, um, employers, as well as employment consultants and agencies. Next slide, please. These are just some examples of some current partnerships that we have. Um, obviously, we're partners with, with Dr. Fung's uh, project, the Organization for Autism Research, which is a fiscal sponsor for us in a 5013C, and then other foundations and other funds. And if you're interested, uh, we have that information where you can become a partner on our website. Next slide. And this is just a little bit of inf information. Anyone, in my opinion, and I've been working with startups since pretty much out of college, can be an entrepreneur. Some need more support, some people, some founders need more support than others, Others, but all founders need some level of support. We, are, we have a brand new newsletter that we're gonna show you a video about in a moment, um, and we are gonna uh, have a beginner's guide of being an entrepreneur, uh, and, and this is for neurotypicals and uh, neurodiverse. And here's a bunch of different startup accelerators that are very um, helpful in the neurodiverse community. And I, I'll let you, you put their websites on there and this is available for you to apply for whatever their criteria is. This is slightly different than ours and each one has a different flavor of the kinds of startups they're looking for. But they all give great support for founders and autism startups. Next slide. So prior to the Autism Angel Group, I'd been leading some pre-accelerator programs and bringing together teams, including coding boot camps and rapid prototyping programs. And our hope is that more people in the neurodiversity community will find each other um, and build a, a company that um, Autism Angel Group would then fund and support. Um, there's, so one example is an in inclusive coding academy. It's for anyone 16 and over. It's free as it's funded by grants and private donors. And uh, the coding boot camps uh, at, at now are virtual. However, um, uh, we still include employers who donate their time. If you go to the next slide, I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, well, they, actually, this is about the uh, the hackathon. So there's a there's an employer system Microsoft that that have um, participated in, and we'll talk a little bit about others. But um, uh, for the inclusive coding academy, we also offer a strength-based assessment process and innovative strength-based transcript, in addition to a certificate of completion to showcase skills mastered to employers. And here's an example, um, just was a really, uh, in terms of, of just rewarding experience for me and the other instructors at the boot camp was this was an intro to um, coding games workshop that was funded by the Discovery Partners Institute and private donors. and it was for everyone over 16, um, but there was a young man who had been unemployed and, since high school for a couple of years and had felt discouraged, had, had not attended college, really, really was interested in playing games. 
um, but attended this coding boot camp and realized that he, how talented he was with coding. And he ended up um, uh, receiving the grand prize um, at the hackathon for his independent game, which was just really quite amazing. Um, next size, please. And so here's just uh, an example of, in addition to skill building workshops, there's, uh, we've been fortunate that there's been a number of large employers that wanted to have wanted to participate in our coding boot camps and other workshops so that they can talk to students about different types of career opportunities. Next slide, please. This was just um, the same student I mentioned a minute earlier who won the grand prize um, at the hackathon. I, it was uh, just the, the, the faculty members. We just uh, felt, we just felt like um, we just loved what we do because we, there, the student came up to us afterward and said this was the first time that he was treated like a normal smart person. So I think it, it meant a lot um, for his career to see just how talented he was in, in, in coding and, and in terms of winning the grand prize. Next slide, please. Oh, let's start that video, please, Lawrence. But the sound isn't there. So we can just read what it's saying there. I don't know why the sound is not there. I could hum, but I won't. Essentially, this is describing our brand new autism innovation newsletter that we're really excited about. And that will be start being published in November. And we would like if those who are interested in learning about it when we have all these different aspects, um, you know, just just uh, fill out, uh, go to info at autismangelsgroup.com to be part of our newsletter. And we will send it to you. We will be having all the things that are listed in this video within our newsletter. Thank you, Lawrence. Yeah, and we're also going to be hosting a monthly um, coaching and networking session. So please get in touch with us at info at autismangelsgroup.com if you'd like to further connect with us. Thank you, Kathy and Maureen. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Andrew Eddy and Shailene Chang, who will be moderating the next three hours um, uh, for, for entrepreneurship uh, and neurodiversity session. Uh, this session will end around four o'clock Pacific time. And then at 4.30, 
we're going to have the final concluding session. Uh, please uh, come back after finishing this session at 4.30. I'll uh, see you in a little bit. Andrew, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Fung. Um, hello and welcome to this session on entrepreneurship and neurodiversity. My name is Andrew Eddy from Untapped. Our mission is to create a sustainable neurodiverse employment ecosystem. We work with organizations to implement neurodiverse employment programs and make them part of business as usual. In order to create a future pipeline of talent, we also drive the neurodiversity hub community of practice with universities and employers. This initiative is designed to facilitate neurodiverse students find pathways to university and college, succeed academically and develop life skills, become more work ready and increase their chances of securing a job and starting a career. It is also an opportunity for employers to partner with the hub and better understand and access this cohort's talent. As part of this community of practice, we are in dialogue with many organizations around the world. And one item that has continued to arise is the topic of entrepreneurship. We have been fortunate to have Charlene Chang join us for a summer internship and she selected to work on the topic of entrepreneurship and neurodiversity. So we're very thankful to, to Dr. Fung and the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit for the opportunity to present some of the outcomes of this work. This will be achieved through a series of rich conversations with various experts from around the world that Charlene will now guide us through. So over to you, Charlene. Thank you, Andrew. Hi everyone, I'm Charlene and I'm a rising junior at Harvard College from Melbourne, Australia. As Andrew mentioned, over the past few months, I've had the exciting opportunity to be working on the Neurodiversity Hub. Neurodiversity is something that's very close to my heart, so I'm very excited for this opportunity um, to put together and moderate this panel of four different panels of subject matter experts on neurodiversity and entrepreneurship. So thank you to everyone who helped make this possible. Um, the first panel we have today is an academic panel. The second panel that we have um, is for neurodiverse accelerators. And the last two panels we have um, are profiling two very successful neurodiverse entrepreneurs. So um, without further ado, let's get started um, with the academic panel. So we have very we have very special guests today, um, Dr. Michael Freeman, Dr. Johan Wickland, and Dr. Tamara Sten. So, Dr. Michael Freeman is a psychiatrist, fourth generation serial entrepreneur, executive coach, entrepreneurship rece researcher, and a behavioral health systems architect. Dr. Freeman is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine and a mentor in the Entrepreneurship Center at UCSF. He received his MD from UCSF School of Medicine after completing related advanced training programs at UC Berkeley and the Sorbonne. With support from the Kaufman Foundation, Dr. Freeman studies issues related to entrepreneur mental health in collaboration with colleagues from UC Berkeley, the Gallup Foundation and other universities. Today, we'll be drawing mainly from his work, the prevalence and co-occurrence of neurodiversity among entrepreneurs and their families, which was also authored by Paige Sordenmeyer, Mackenzie Zisser, Laura, and Laura, uh, Lisa, sorry, Anderson. Um, in their research, they used a self-report survey to examine the prevalence and co-occurrence of neurodiversity and mental health conditions among 242 entrepreneurs and 93 comparison participants. They found that mental health differences directly or indirectly affected 72% of the entrepreneurs in this sample, and that entrepreneurs reported experiencing more instances of neurodiversity and or mental health concerns than comparison participants. Our next special guest is Dr. Johan Wicklund, who is the AI Berg Chair and Professor of Entrepreneurship at the Whitman School of Management, Syracuse University, and Professor um, at Professor Tu at Nord University, Norway. His research interests include entrepreneurship and mental health, as well as the entry, performance, and exit of entrepreneurial firms. He is considered a leading authority in entrepreneurship research, which, with over 100 articles appearing in leading entrepreneurship and management journals, and over 
32,000 citations to his research. He's the editor-in-chief for Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice, a premier entrepreneurship journal. The main, his main work that we will be drawing upon today um, is called ADHD Symptoms, Entrepreneurial Orientation and Firm Performance, which was also co-authored by Wei Yu and Anna Perez Luno. Um, and in this piece, rather than investigating the relationship between ADHD symptoms and entrepreneurship, the study focuses on performance implications of ADHD symptoms on company success. They used two samples of entrepreneurs from the United States and Spain and found evidence that impulsive and hyperactive symptoms of ADHD are largely conducive to firm performance through entrepreneurial orientation, while inattention symptoms are not. This suggests that the performance advantages of entrepreneurs' ADHD symptoms can be derived from greater focus on innovation, proactiveness, and risk-taking. And lastly, but not least, we have Dr. Tamara Sten. She's an economist, social um, enterprise developer, author, researcher, professional studies faculty, and coordinator of the Landmark College Entrepreneurship Accelerator Program, a school that specializes in teaching students with learning differences. The main work we'll be drawing um, from of hers today is called Building Supportive, Inclusive Workplaces Where Neurodivergent Thinkers Thrive, Best Practices in Managing Diversity, Inclusion and Building Entrepreneurship in the Workplace. This piece was co-authored by Jan Coughlin, Lee Crocker and Jeanette Landon. So this paper introduces methods developed during 20 years of academic teaching and research at Landmark College, which supports the management and development of self-guided neurodiverse teams in the workplace. These best practices integrate thinking awareness, coaching and team building methods to open new ways of self-directed problem solving, communications and innovations, which benefits the entire organization. So that's it for the introductions and let's jump right ahead um, into the Q&A. So uh, firstly, I'd like to start with Michael. Uh, Michael, your work focuses on the relationship between neurodiversity, mental health and entrepreneurship. Could you please give us firstly a bit of an insight into what your research found in relation to these relationships and also how it ultimately calls for a reconceptualization of the diagnosis of neurodiversity and or mental health conditions from a disease model to a more diverse model? Um, I thought you were going to ask me a hard question. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me on the panel, uh, Shailene. I really appreciate being here and being part of this uh, tremendous conference. I've been very impressed all the way through. And before I answer your question, I just wanted to say one more thing about the introduction, which is that once upon a time, I was a rising junior at UC Santa Cruz. So I have a sense of what you're going through. You did a great job putting this together. So as the question suggests, um, the research that my colleagues and I have conducted um, has repeatedly demonstrated that entrepreneurs are a little bit different. And uh, the difference, I believe, and I think our data supports the belief, is that uh, this relates to a certain form of neurodiversity. In the last panel, I heard um, one of the speakers say that pretty much anybody can become an entrepreneur. I'm not convinced that that is the case. Um, My experience and our data basically suggests that most people can hold a job. Some people can lead a team or an organization or a club or a political party or um, an event, but actually very few people can start and grow a business. And when we talk about uh, entrepreneurship, what we mean is uh, self-employed, people who are self-employed with or without employees. Uh, Very briefly, to summarize the the, um, top level research findings, many researchers over the course of the last two decades have identified a very consistent pattern of personality traits among entrepreneurs. What you need to know about that is two things. 
One is that personality traits are about 50% genetically transmitted. What's a personality trait? One example would be extroversion. People who are genetically loaded for extroversion are gonna have an easier time being an entrepreneur than people who are introverts. So there's a pattern or a profile of personality traits. The second thing is that these personality traits are associated with mental health differences. Mental health differences are expressed in differences in information processing, social, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral um, uh, you know, differences that manifest themselves ultimately behaviorally. And um, we kind of did a deeper dive on that and found that actually in different studies, um, somewhere between at a minimum 38% and in some studies as high as 50% of entrepreneurs have a lifetime self-report uh, one or more lifetime mental health conditions. And that many of them have two and some of them have three. So mental health issues are really quite prevalent among entrepreneurs. And for those who don't, more than half of the asymptomatic entrepreneurs come from families in which there's quite a prevalent presence of mental health differences among the first degree family members. So one way or another, two thirds to three fourths of entrepreneurs are either directly or indirectly affected by these mental health challenges. So there you go, that's a kind of a top level answer to your question. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and now I would like to ask a question to Johan. Um, your research focuses on um, the company performance implications of ADHD symptoms. And I was hoping that you could detail for us um, a bit about the advantages and challenges um, of ADHD symptoms when it comes to company performance and how this ultimately leads to the need to emphasize the difference between inattention symptoms and hyperactivity and impulsive impulsivity yeah. symptoms in studies of ADHD and entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Shailene, and thanks for inviting me to this, uh, this panel and, and the whole conference. It's, it, it's great to be here. Uh, so yeah, uh, let me unpack this and let me speak a little bit broader to neurodiversity generally. I think it's very important, I think, to understand that in entrepreneurship, uh, you know, you can shape entrepreneurship to be whatever you want it to be. So, you know, it's not like a, there's one way of entrepreneurship that suits everybody. All different kinds of people pursue different kinds of entrepreneurship. So that's important to keep that in mind. So I like to think about neurodiversity and entrepreneurship from the perspective of uh, underdogs. So neurodiverse individuals can do well in entrepreneurship because they are, are used to being underdogs and um, that can be a, an advantage in entrepreneurship. So I will give you a few reasons why that can be an advantage. So uh, as neurodiverse, you're used to uh, working hard and disciplined for things that others may find easy, take for granted. And this builds tenacity and discipline and these are essential to succeed in entrepreneurship. Also, as neurodiverse, you have a few other attractive career options. And this makes you dedicated and focused on entrepreneurship. And you continue trying even if you're faced with ob obstacles. And don't give up in situations where others might throw in the towel because you simply don't have that luxury. And further, as as neurodiverse, you're used to failing in many aspects of life. And this makes you risk tolerant. And entrepreneurship always entails the risk of failure. Uh, but if you're neurodiverse, you can put that risk in, in perspective compared with other risks in life. And uh, this allows you to pursue businesses that others would be too afraid to even consider. And further, as neurodiverse, you're used to solicit help from others because there are things you can't do. And uh, this helps entrepreneurial networking, which of course is extremely important to succeed as an entrepreneur. And finally, um, 
the fact that you're differently wired, which is kind of the definition of neurodiversity, uh, it allows you to think outside the box and you can come up with business opportunities that others can't. But I think it's important to note that uh, this is not the only reason and potentially not even the most important reason as to why you can do well in entrepreneurship as a neurodiverse person. I think it's being an underdog is what's important. And it, that actually comes with many advantages. And I've tried to point to some of the most uh, important aspect of why it, it can be an advantage. Fantastic. And would you mind um, speaking to some of the challenges um, that you think uh, neurodiversity um, might have, the neurodiverse individuals might have when it comes to entrepreneurship as well? And also, speak thank you so to... much. Yeah. I'll be very happy to do that. I, I will give you the most, um, I give you the single most important advice I can give to any neurodiverse person. So, uh, it's important to understand that entrepreneurship is always collective action. No entrepreneurs succeed by themselves. Uh, we often like to portray entrepreneurs as rugged individuals, uh, but it's, it's incorrect. Uh, all entrepreneurs need other people to help them in order to succeed. And as you know, neurodiverse people are often extremely good at certain tasks, but extremely bad at other. So therefore, uh, as a neurodiverse entrepreneur, it's extra important that you seek the help of others. And that can be, you know, by having a formal business partner, that's quite common, but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, it can be a family member who's helping uh, informally, a spouse, that's very, very common. It could be a friend or, or, or a paid consultant or, or an employee. But uh, I think the important thing to remember is that you're aware of your own strengths and weaknesses as a neurodiverse individual and that you're humble about them and you seek the help from people who have strengths that complement your own. And I, like I said, I think this is the single most important advice I could give to any neurodiverse person who's considering entrepreneurship. So that's awesome. some of the challenges. Great response. Thank you so much. Um, and now I would like to ask um, Dr. Tamara Stern a question. Um, so Tamara, your work focuses on how organizations and individuals can actually optimize and harness um, diversity of thought. And there are two concepts um, that you bring up in relation to this, which is thinking awareness and appreciative intelligence. So thinking awareness is a combination of self-knowledge and emotional intelligence. So essentially knowing how to connect and empathize with others. And you mentioned that neurodivergent thinkers often have challenges with thinking awareness, um, even though it's very uh, vital for proper team management. And appreciative intelligence, on the other hand, is the ability to not just identify positive potential um, in your fellow team members, um, employees, or students, but also devise a cause of action to actually take advantage um, of their potential by addressing their unique social and physical needs. So my question to you is, could you please elaborate on how thinking awareness and appreciative intelligence can be instructive, used as instructive principles principles for leaders, teachers, and managers of diverse teams. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me here on this panel. Um, it's a great honor to be able to be amongst folks talking about entrepreneurism and neurodiversity, because it's an area where there still is so much to learn, right, and so much to understand. So I come from a non-neurodiverse background. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, um, fifth generation. And so it's been really interesting for me coming to Landmark College where all of our students are neurodiverse. We have over 300 students and heading up their entrepreneurship program and really getting to understand these students from where they are and having had the experience of working with, with non-neurodiverse entrepreneur students for many years before this. So I've been able to sort of do a comparative. But what I found actually was that so many of the tools that we bring to our neurodiverse students or neurotypical students also can completely benefit from this. 
And I also agree with um, Johan on the importance of teams, right? And with um, entrepreneurs, especially on neurodiverse entrepreneurs, being able to work with others, support others, and having that deep empathy. And I find that, that the neurodiversity, you know, the, the different challenges people have faced through their lives has really helped them to build empathy. And I find that's really the, really the glue that helps my students to build really effective teams and be really supportive of each other as they launch their enterprises. So in the school, some of the tools that we do to teach the students, we work in, in, the, in the realm of um, self-determination theory. Right, so, so teaching the, the students to be able to monitor and manage themselves and build a work environment that's gonna work best for them and knowing what it is, again, has to do with that self-awareness, building the self-awareness. One of the tools that we developed at our school that's been published and um, shared is the World of Learner Wheel. Okay, so um, two of our colleagues created that. And what's interesting with this is it's a circular model um, focused on four areas, motivation, social, emotional, academic skills, and self-regulation. And so the students rank themselves on this model based on, is this something you're still working on or is it something you've mastered? And there's a total of 16 different areas that they're comparing on this model. And what we find is when we give this to the students when they first get to school, they all rank themselves as fantastic. And by the time they finish their introductory class, they start ranking themselves much lower. And what's happened is it's not that they've learned less, it's that they've built more self-awareness. So when they think, yes, I'm paying attention and catching all my notes, they're not. And over the course of the semester, they start building more of that awareness. Wait a second, I need to really be using different tools to be able to better focus and keep track of my work. So that's one thing, and I continue to go back to that. It also build, builds on um, goal setting, identifying where are their barriers, how you're going to overcome it, have you overcome it, what's your reward system. So we're really kind of micro developing this way of continually thinking about your world and how you're interacting with it, especially as an entrepreneur where there isn't a straight road of success for your business, right? This, we don't know what the end result's gonna look like when we start a business. So with all these different unknowns, you know, having that constant self-awareness and checkpoints is super important on the individual level. And then on the team level, what we do is we use um, Tuckman's team development. So again, just really identifying the different stages of a team. What stage are you in? What do you need to do to bring your team to the next stage? And knowing who your team members are. So I use collaborative intelligence and thinking talent maps to really um, illustrate, because some of my students are on the spectrum, some of my students are ADHD, some are dyslexic, all of them are mostly comorbid. So they're a mixture and no one student is the same. So having that, that awareness of who their diff the strengths and weaknesses of their different teammates and seeing where strengths come in and celebrating and, and um, working on that is super important. Something else I really love is the work of Daniel Lerner, Richard Hunt and Ingrid Verdhall. I think I'm saying that right. They created a paper called Dueling Banjos, Harmony and Discord between ADHD and Entrepreneurship. And what they did was they went through the entrepreneurship cycle because coming up with an idea like what Johan said and then like executing it and sticking with it and growing it and having it become, and you know, like what Michael said, your livelihood, you need different skills as you're going through that. And certain people are more, are better at some skills than others, right? There's some real rote, you know, keeping track of your books. There's some real creative coming up with the next idea or innovation, right? And then there's the management. So there's, and sales. So there's lots of different types of skills that are needed. And I find, again, using that dueling banjos model, I have my students assess their skills when they build their team. We're very intentional at looking at who's bringing what skill. We're intentional at where are we on our goal setting and working together model. And we're intentional at looking at how we can support each other as we develop. And what I found was our students, once they, they start internalizing these steps, they're able to go into internships very well. And that's where we started working um, through our career connections with organizations such as JP Morgan, DXC Technology, Ernst & Young, Microsoft, SAP Software, bringing our students into their workplaces and finding that they work very well with the 
intrapreneurs, right? So that's the corporate thing. So a lot of corporations now are using intrapreneurs, like team-based project work. And that's where once the st students get these entrepreneurial mindsets developed, they're able to then move into these um, corporate environments more easily as well. Awesome, thank you for that very comprehensive response. Um, and now bringing it back to Michael and Johan, um, in both uh, of your, the implication parts of your research papers, you talk about how you think that educational institutions have an important role in providing entrepreneurship education for neurodiverse students and also self-awareness and vulnerability resistance resources. Could you please elaborate um, on the thoughts and recommendations that you have here? That's was a, it, was that, it? Okay. okay, Michael, you take that. I'll, I'll go okay, second. perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that's an important question. I was talking to an entrepreneur just last week who got expelled from middle school. Then he, they let him back into high school. Then he got expelled from high school. They finally got him back in again. Then he flunked out. And then he had some encounters with the criminal justice system. <clears throat> and now he is a, uh, a world-class entrepreneur with award-winning products. Um, uh, stores in many locations and a big team. So I asked this gentleman if he has a learning disability or if the school had a teaching disability. And that is basically the kind of a, a coy way of making a point that I try to make to educators whenever I have a chance, which is that people who find their way into, into entrepreneurship think differently, learn differently, behave differently, engage differently. If we're gonna take the concept of sort of raising the next generation of entrepreneurs as a social mandate, which I think is a good idea since entrepreneurs create anywhere from 60 to 100% of all net new jobs, then we have to have neurodiverse, appropriate educational programs. And what does that actually look like in reality? I think Johan can speak to that better than I can because he's building them. But um, with respect to uh, Dr. Sten's comment about the dueling banjos, that um, entrepreneurship is a very active process. And one very simple idea is that some people can learn from books and other people have are better at activity-based learning. And so if you can create a learning model that is based on action as opposed to memorization, for example, you're beginning to go in the direction of how entrepreneurs actually think. I have some more comments, okay. but let's listen to Johan's experience because as I said, he's actually doing it. Thanks, Michael. Yes, yeah, so I, I think it's important to realize that neurodiverse individuals are intuitively attracted to entrepreneurship. And it's largely because what Michael spoke about before. And it's also because, you know, you might feel that you don't fit in a regular job. But as an entrepreneur, you can shape this job to be whatever you want it to be. And that's really, really important. So I've been contacted by schools that, that teach neurodiverse individuals by neurodiverse parents and individuals saying, what kind of education is there for me or for my child? So what, what we're doing is we're developing specifically at Syracuse University where I work. We are a team of people with different backgrounds in psychology in education and myself, who's an entrepreneurship professor, uh, we are developing uh, educations uh, in entrepreneurship specifically for uh, neurodiverse individuals. But of course, one of the first things we, we realized is that uh, we were thinking, well, we're gonna start doing this at the university level. But of course, uh, there's a lot of neurodiverse individuals who never make it into college because education in at lower levels is so poorly adapted for uh, a neurodiverse person that you 
you essentially uh, you lose all interest in studying, even if you certainly have the, the brain powers to do well. But it's just so. I mean, the, our main focus is not about the actual content now and changing that. It's more about uh, how to deliver this content in a way that's appealing to neurodiverse individuals. And I, like like Tamra touched upon, if you do that. I think it's benefiting everybody. I mean, if you start realizing that today the world is becoming more and more diverse along any dimension, and if we are prepared to teach to a diverse classroom, whether people are diverse, neurodiverse, or diverse in cultural ways, that benefits everybody. So absolutely, um, I think that's where we're moving with entrepreneurship education. Fantastic responses. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Sten, you're in a very unique position because you're actually teaching um, at Landmark College, which is exclusively for students who learn differently. So would you mind sharing um, a bit more information about the college, what it has achieved and what you think other colleges can learn from it? Yeah, so Landmark College, it's a real unique school. You know, it was founded on the idea of We've, we were able to work with neurodiverse students, get them through high school. Okay, so there's a, neuro, there's a landmark high school in Massachusetts and the founder of that high school then went on 35 years ago to create Landmark College because he found once the students graduated that high school that they didn't really fit in with the higher ed except they were really smart and they needed to continue in their learning. So Landmark College was created as that step. And originally we were almost like a community college. We're a two year, you know, getting students ready to be able to transfer into a four year institution. And over the years we've grown, we've become credited. We now have our own four year programs. And in my department of communications, uh, we now have a Kamal degree, which is communications, entrepreneurism, leadership. So that was just accredited last year and we already have our first cohort of students going through this. And that was also what led to me being brought on campus, a more traditional entrepreneurship professor, you know, to come in and work in this, in this newer environment for me so that students could be a little more mainstream perhaps in their understanding and accessing of entrepreneurism because I'd been working with a lot of more traditional entrepreneurism supports and organizations. Um, one of the things that was so interesting for me, because I've been on campus for, four, for almost four years now, and one of the things that was so interesting for me is I, you know, put my little sign on the door, entrepreneurs, and kind of like what Yohim said, I expected a line of students, you know, and there was not that many students. And what happened, I found, was people were afraid of entrepreneurism because they thought it was too complicated. They thought it, was, it wasn't going to be something for them. It was too hard to do. And they felt very, you know, they, they didn't even feel discouraged. They just were uninterested. They didn't understand it. And they didn't think it was for them. So that was a big surprise. And what I did was I started to create more access, you know, and building more allies. And I created an idea lab, which was just open to anybody to come and do anything. And so as students started coming forward with their talents, I started to hire them, you know, as work study students, and we had people doing origami and Legos, and you know, it grew into a robotics lab. It's now a, um, a circuitry program that we have. We have 3D printers and laser cutters and you know, sewing machines, and you know, so we have a lot of real integrated stuff. And we also have a pitch competition, and that's really brought a lot of students forward. So in my three years at Landmark, I've, la I've helped our entrepreneurs to launch about 15 different companies. And a lot of them are still running. Some of them, the students pass on to it. They do as a class project, perhaps, and they pass it on to the next class. And the next class always says, no, we don't want it. We want to do our own. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. A lot of them are um, grant-based, okay, where we'll get a grant to, to complete something or create something. And that'll be kind of the driving force behind what the students interpret as being the solution to the grant challenge. And what I find also is my students never choose the direct path that I would expect, right? They always kind of come in from some back door, different perspective. And I find, you know, giving them the space to do that, but also the structure so that they are able to move forward is really where my role is as, as the professor. 
um, you know, giving them the tools so that they can be free, but they also can be focused and achieve results. So that's a little Fantastic. bit of like our background, you know, and the students receive supports, you know, we, we have um, counselors on campus, we have therapists on campus, we have, um, you know, um, centers to help students with the homework with the teachers. So we're incredibly integrated in how we work with our students. But I find my entrepreneurs tend to be students who have been on campus for about two years, you know, they're a little bit more um, um, higher functioning um, by the time they get to me. And it, it seems to work really well and students work really well in teams and they support each other. And yeah, they always surprise me. Awesome, thank you. I'm sure there's um, a lot that educators can take away from that response and your experiences. Um, now pivoting a little bit um, away from education and more um, into employment, Tamara, your work um, also talks about how companies with differently abled employees outperform their competitors, um, averaging 28% higher uh, revenue um, plus higher shareholder returns. However, um, individuals with intellectual and developmental differences have an 85% unemployment rate. Um, and the disconnect between um, talent and opportunity is, you believe, due to a misunderstanding of the thinking patterns and attributes of neurodiverse um, individuals. And at the end of your, your work, you profile a few organizations that have tried to rectify this misunderstanding and build this bridge. Could you just tell us a bit more about um, this? Thank you. Right. So this comes from our um, Center of Career Connections, of which Jan Copeland is the director of that. And she helped me to write this part of the paper. So I'm going to be interpreting her work <laughs> from the paper. And she's the one that's most in contact with the organizations and is most um, connected on a daily basis with what's happening, you know, with the building of intra entrepreneurs and neurodiverse teams in the workplace. So what I understand from this area is that um, once given the, the correct environment to work in, neurodiverse people can really excel. And something I had, for example, my introduction to business students, they work with our local um, career placement, uh, state career placement organization here in our town to do an assessment of their interpretation of a neurodiverse friendly workplace. And what they found was that you know, the, the literature was talking about, you know, not having distractions and having quiet cubicles and having, you know, a lot of um, supports that my students, once they were looking at it from the lens of their neurodiversity, didn't always fit everybody. And we found that, for example, ADHD employees, autistic employees, dyslexic employees need different things. Right? So while maybe the autistic employees need someplace quiet to, and, and um, a lot of repetition and a lot of structure and not a lot of distraction, the ADHD employees would go bonkers with something like that. They need a place to be outside, to walk around. They need someone to constantly reassure them that they're on the right direction with their project or a buddy to check in with them. They want interruptions. Um, you know, and, and our dyslexic people, we find, you know, the access of information in multimodal ways is important, right? Whether it's written or spoken. Um, so not just having a long meeting of speaking, that wouldn't really work. So what we found was people had real specific needs. And what we found was in these organizations that, that Jan Copeland on our Career Connections is working with is they've created departments on multiple levels. One of them is to be able to have neurodiverse people get through the interview process successfully. Even before that was how do you attract neurodivergent individuals to your organization? Just like I couldn't initially just hand up a sign and say, entrepreneurs come here, sign up, nobody came. Okay, so what I needed to do was reach out to them in their way, okay, on their level. And it's the same thing in the workplace. So I can't just say neurodivergent people apply here because people aren't looking for that, right? So I have to be able to appeal myself as a workplace. I have to find people where they are and then invite them where they are to what I'm doing and make what I'm doing feel like something that they're going to be welcome to. Because what, what we found was a lot of neurodivergent people have had rejection. Right? So they're a little bit suspicious. They're a little bit thinking this isn't for me, this isn't my kind of place. So there's resistance on that end also. 
So once we're kind of building the trust and the connections and the common language, um, getting the folks on board, what we found in the workplace is having teams and coaches. And the most important thing is teaching everybody else in the workplace how to have a neurodiverse workplace. Because what if some if the workplace isn't properly trained, you can have the neurotypical employees getting upset. Why does that person have the best office? Why does this person have a coach? Why does that person get to go outside and take a walk? Right? And, and you have an unsupportive environment. So it's really the teams that, that they use in the workplace are integrated. It's not only neurodiverse, that they're integrated teams and having um, that team building and communication across all levels of learning has been a best practice that we've seen. So could I add something to that? I think it's really important to understand that organizations are typically really bad at dealing with diversity and that's diversity along any dimension. And I think in the last few months that's become apparent here in the US mm -hmm. when it comes to racial diversity. But generally speaking, that is a problem for organizations and it's, that goes both in terms of hiring and then in offering career opportunities for those people you have hired. And it's because we have this natural tendency to uh, be biased in favor of people that are like ourselves. So like Tamara said, if, this, if we are going to have uh, organizations that act, actually embrace diversity and neurodiversity in particular, it's the organizations that need training. It's the organizations that need change and that is why these kind of summits are so important. And it's so important that we reached out to the neurotypical people, and in particular those working uh, in high positions in organizations. So they understand that it's they who need to change in order for this to work. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you so much. So that um, concludes the formal portion of the Q&A. But now um, we've received some great questions from the audience that um, we will spend the last uh, 12, 15 minutes addressing. So um, I'm just going to pick a few of them out. Um, the first one I see here um, from um, an anonymous an attendee um, says that as a woman of color, I think it's important to acknowledge that autistic white men are privileged um, in that their behaviors are tolerated and they will be given opportunities and funding that many autistic women who are non-technical will never get. What should we do and how do we navigate the system? What are the resources for us? Let me just say one little thing that fits directly into what I said. I mean, if you are non-typical along any dimension, I mean, the norm in work life is that you're a white man who's neurotypical. So if you're a woman of color who's non neurotypical, you are not the norm along any dimension. So um, I, I can fully understand where that question comes from. I have no idea what resources are out there. I'll leave that for somebody else. I can share a comment um, <clears throat> with the preface that I'm not really qualified to have an opinion about this because um, I, you know, I, I don't share the experience of being a person of color or actually of being in the autism spectrum. But the comment is that I make is that entrepreneurs share an underlying form of neurodiversity. And because of that, entrepreneurs often have more in common with each other than they do with people who may have the same gender or the same skin color or be of the same age or come from the same socioeconomic class. And uh, in our research, we, um, we found that entrepreneurs compared to managers are much more open-minded, much more tolerant, much less committed to any firm ideology or belief system, which you have to be if you're an entrepreneur, because if you're an entrepreneur, the good ideas can come from anywhere. And the more curiosity you have about different kinds of people, the more you can learn about your potential customers and what the potential needs of the marketplace are. So um, 
that doesn't change systemic racism in any way, but it's at least a way of talking to people that I have found kind of opens doors. And it's, to me, it's just been amazing when I'm talking with all kinds of different people with different ages, genders, um, uh, ethnic backgrounds, just to shape the concept that neuro, that the neuro, entrepreneur neurodiversity gives us more in common with each other than we have with people who may look like us. Um, it's, it's quite a realization and it helps people focus on their kind of shared underlying humanity. Yeah, and I'll add something too, as a female entrepreneur and entrepreneurship professor, you know, that's definitely a really excellent point that, that our person made because first of all, diagnosis of, of neurodiverse women is much lower than that of neurodiverse men. You know, even on our college campus, which has been established for many years, we still have two thirds more men than women on our campus. And it's not, I don't believe that it's because men are more neurodiverse. A lot of studies have been showing that it's because the women haven't been diagnosed or hasn't been felt as being important enough. Um, they can do another kind of job. So there hasn't been as much um, emphasis put on supporting neurodiverse women. At the same time in the field of entrepreneurism, it's also very dominated by men. And that's something that I've studied as an economist, you know, looking at well-being and opportunity and looking at, you know, the story that we hear so many times, you know, the women also have the job of raising the children, take care, taking care of the household, lower income. So all of those inhibit or create barriers for women to be able to be entrepreneurs because they have these other um, activities or these other requirements, right, that oftentimes they need to attend to first. So there's two things that are going on, right? So we have less women entrepreneurs in the field and we have less neurodiverse women as well. So I'm putting together a study now where I'm starting to look at that intersectionality. And it's something that I think in the future, I hope we'll have a lot more people starting to study because it's fascinating. And I find that women entrepreneurs, I believe there's a difference between women entrepreneurs and men entrepreneurs, especially in their risk, um, you know, and how they approach their, their businesses and their entrepreneurial story, but it's more anecdotal, right? That's something that needs more research. So thank you for bringing that up. Great responses, thank you. Um, another question and comment we have from Magnus is, I am an experienced autistic executive and I'm curious if VCs in this space ever try to partner um, experienced executives with founders. Is it always about the founders? This would seem like a good way for neurodivergent leaders to get some experience leading a startup without their first go at it being a founder slash CEO. So do you, any of you have any thoughts on this? I mean, as uh, I'm sure most people know, there are lots of mentoring programs for young entrepreneurs through incubators and, and co-working spaces and uh, just uh, other mechanisms. Uh, so uh, I think it's, I'm not aware of uh, these uh, kind of mentor programs where both the mentor and the mentee are neurodiverse. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I, I've been, I've been, I mean, I mean, I know there are uh, incubators that are focusing on um, neurodiverse uh, tenants, and I can imagine that they do that. But if they don't, it's certainly something I would encourage them to think about. And I think the next panel. We'll, we'll talk about those kinds of things. So I think it's something uh, you might want to propose to the people come, coming after us. It's definitely an excellent idea. Fantastic, thank you. Um, another question we have from Sarah Wardington um, is, all the specific, uh, and comment as well, is that all the specific resources mentioned have been very helpful, thank you. Um, are there any neurodiverse entrepreneurial groups on social media or elsewhere that the panelists are aware of? Or are there any names of organizations run by neurodiverse individuals? I'm looking for connections and inspiration as a neurodiverse entrepreneur myself. I mean, I, I just know that I've been interviewed uh, by entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm assuming this has to do with entrepreneurship, right? I'm just going to talk about that. I have been interviewed by uh, individuals who are 
have ADHD and are entrepreneurs and are starting different kinds of uh, organizations among, uh, among them. I think that the most well-known in the US is probably Peter Shankman and he's faster than normal. That is his, uh, the name of his business and it's also a podcast, but he's also uh, you know, working together with other people in that space. I do not know if there are specific uh, similar things for people with autism, but I do know that there are also these kinds of organizations in Germany. So uh, I think if, if, if you Google, you will be able to find them. I find for myself, like my fantastic network, how I, I met Johan, for example, is through the Academy of Management which is an academic organization. Oh. And we have a neurodiversity division, you know, within that organization, we also have an entrepreneurship division. So, and I've met other entrepreneurs. That's how I met um, Daniel Lerner and Richard, Richard Hunt and um, some other folks around the world. So that's one place for academics. The other thing I found from my students, just reaching out to organizations and saying, hey, I have some neurodiverse students here, we need some help. Um, a lot of organizations are really open to it. So like we work with Enactus, which used to be called SIFE, and it's a, a network of entrepreneurism for college students. And it works with like Unilever and Walmart and Sam's Club, and it creates all kinds of funding and opportunities. And they've been super accessible for us and kind of helping our students to be able to be included and involved in everything that they do because it fits the UN's development goals of education and equality. The other thing is HubSpot, HubSpot Marketing, which is in Boston and they have a HubSpot Academy and my students use that to learn social media and marketing. And they've been really, really helpful at working very personally with my students to redo a lot of their training materials and teaching materials so that they are neurodiverse accessible. So I've been finding that there's an interest, you know, in organizations to help support this and they're willing to learn and work with us to, to improve how they, can be more accessible and useful. So Charlene, maybe you should ask Andrew that Untapped might start a little subdivision uh, specifically for entrepreneurs uh, supporting each other. I think that's a great idea. Yes. Um, and we should, I think that's something we should take forward. Certainly. Um, thank you for those responses and that question as well. Um, we have a question here for uh, Dr. Tamara Sten um, from Annette, and she says, you talked about um, meeting the students where they are. Could you please provide an example of this? Um, sure. So it's just kind of being, you know, I'm um, from New York. I'm a fast processor, I'm an extrovert, and that can be absolutely terrifying for students. So what I do is I present myself more quietly. Um, I'm more, I wait. <laughs> I look for allies. So I work with, with projects within my classes and ask my students to bring their friends or to find friends or to create an event or to include myself in something that's already going on. So I kind of have allies on the campus that kind of bring me into students, you know, instead of me, you know, sitting out there and saying, everybody, all entrepreneurs come out here. Um, so that I find I'm always like looking, working with other professors, seeing what are you teaching? What are people doing? What kind of projects are active on campus? Like when a student grant funded and got a, um, a greenhouse on campus and I just saw it sitting there empty. I went to the professor, you know, what's the deal with this? And he said, I don't know, we made this club but no one's doing anything. So I had my students as a class project reach out to the club and create a marketing plan for how we can sell kale around campus and then create perennials and it was very profitable. And, you know, people got involved that way. So kind of like looking for where there's little things that are happening. Right. I had a student, you know, wanted to deliver food. So then we brought it to the classroom because I find sometimes people need a lot of support to get started and they're busy with everything else like school, but also as, you know, non-academic entrepreneurs, we're busy with life. Right. So creating an environment where others are working on this challenge together can help um, then build that momentum, build the team, build that awareness, get that mindset and language going. So that's kind of what I meant. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today for the academic panel. I know there are some questions that we didn't get to reach. So um, perhaps if um, the researchers are comfortable, they can share their emails um, in the chat and um, those individuals who didn't get their questions answered or those who have other questions um, could perhaps email them personally. And thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Tamara Stern, um, Dr. Michael Freeman and Dr. Dr. Johan Wickland um, for sharing your insights with us today. That was very, very insightful. Um, so now um, we will move on to our second panel, um, which is the Neurodiverse Accelerator Panel. Um, we have two very special guests with us today for this panel, um, Johnny Doan and Dr. Heidi Hamm. So some quick introductions. Johnny Doan is the co-founder and program manager of the Profound Incubator. The Profound Incubator is a tailored program for people who are neurodivergent to be immersed into the startup ecosystem and have the opportunity to build a digital startup. Johnny, Johnny is currently a Perth Global Shaper with the World Economic Forum and a fellow of Australian Progress through the 2020 National Fellowship. As a social entrepreneur, Johnny specializes in working with a range of stakeholders to design community-led initiatives. As someone who is neurodivergent and of Cantonese Vietnamese heritage, Johnny is very passionate as a passionate advocate for structural changes for diversity and inclusion across all sectors of industry. We also have Dr. Heidi Han joining us too. Um, she is a social entrepreneur, autism researcher, a professor at Rice University and founder of Spectrum Fusion, a 501c3 organization. She completed her undergraduate and graduate studies in human communication disorders and in 2010 graduated with her PhD in cognitive psychology from the University of Edinburgh with a specialization in autism. After listening to parents across continents share their concerns regarding the lack of opportunities and positive outcomes for their adult children on the spectrum, she became very motivated to help empower these adults reach their full potential. As a result, she founded Spectrum Fusion in 2014 and in 2017 launched the Reactor Room program, a shark tank for adults on the autism spectrum designed to create new and innovative in uh, opportunities for individuals. So thank you so much for joining um, us today. And my first question for the both of you is that the Profound Incubator and the Reactor Room operate quite differently, both in terms of the different stages involved in the process um, and also the support networks that are leveraged. So starting with the different different stages of the process. Um, Profound Incubator, you have the attraction stage, the networking stage, the client um, stage, and the commercialization stage. And with the reactor room, you have the discovery phase, the reactor room activation event, the activation teams, and ultimately the activation plan. So um, Johnny and Heidi, could you both please speak more to um, these different stages um, in both of your accelerator programs? Johnny, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, Johnny, sure. First? Yeah, um, I don't mind. Um, yeah, so Profound Incubator is really interesting because we probably um, are almost like pre-startup, you know, like pre um, startup phase just because we meet people at such an early stage and people who've never really considered what it would be like to be an entrepreneur um, but in saying that we've captured participants who are almost at every stage of their business um, and I guess back of the conversation from the last panel we definitely meet people where they are whether they've just um, you know where, whether they've just been introduced into the startup world and ecosystem um, whether they are looking to expand and scale. Um, and we just make sure we um, have them meet the appropriate kind of mentors and um, support networks to um, lead their projects into the next stage, whatever that may be. So um, we definitely tried to design an incubator program where we took the cohort through the same stages, but we actually found that that didn't really work. Um, and that we, and I think that's what we mean when we mean tailored is that we really had to work with each individual 
um, to kind of find out what their um, particular needs were, whether they had done, um, whether they considered themselves entrepreneurs in the first place um, and where their businesses were. And I guess um, how I would start is, you know, when you were saying there's a desperate need for meaningful opportunities. And when we think about the spectrum, we think about, you know, we're tech, but then we have all the creatives. And so mm -hmm. what the React Room is about is helping and empowering these individuals. So we have the discovery phase. Uh, and so do you want me to go into detail now or just to, I can go into yeah, detail Yeah, please. Give okay. us, um, yeah, like an overview okay. of these different stages, so, that would be um, great. So the reactor room, it's it's not only for inventions, because what if we have, you know, when people are looking for a job, they have A, B, C, D, and they need to find that. But we say, hey, what if somebody's amazing at Q or X? What can we do? And what about, you know, we have people who are videographers, graphic designers, um, business, do they want to launch a business or they have an invention? So the spinoff could be, that they could have a, um, an internship or build their portfolio because many of these individuals never had that opportunity or business launch or go ahead and with invention. So the very first step is where we do a discovery phase. And as Dr. Fung was talking about um, last night, it's not only about strengths because it is about interest. So we really look at their interest and then we, um, so at Rice and I started um, a research study so asking the question, are traditional assessments effective because we don't even know. And so we are looking at partnering with Hogan and partnering with Fast Forward Analytics. And I think Dr. Fung, I can talk to you um, and connect you with them, Greg Hambrick, because they're looking at interests and then looking at strengths. And then once we find that, then we say, okay, um, what do we need to do to overcome that barrier? And then we create, um, then we create the panel for that individual and that's an activation event. And that's where the panel members come together and bring opportunities and connections for them. But there's a lot of details of how much time to take, but then we meet with those panel members beforehand. And then we come together and we share all of this information to create an activation plan. And then we walk it through uh, every step of the way. And so every, every person coming through the reactor room is different. And we do have inventors, but we also have people who are creative or they're doing a business launch. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And even though both of you, um, the both of these programs name the different stages of the process slightly differently, they definitely align with the um, typical entrepreneurial life cycle overall. So I'd like to hear from both of you, um, which part of the entrepreneurial life cycle do you find that most people um, need the most assistance with? Johnny, maybe we'll start with you. Um, what was really interesting for us was that because we met a lot of people who just graduated um, or we met a lot of, when we put out the call out, we basically just met a lot of people who hadn't considered even being what an entrepreneur looks like. So um, we found, and, and that's kind of the whole reason why the program was created, right? So while there were, um, there, while there were some opportunities for people to um, gain employment, um, where there might be a graduate program for, for example, software testing, um, to Heidi's point, there wasn't actually, we found that there wasn't much out there that met the kind of creative talents or the interests of, um, of people who wanted to, um, you know, lead something different. Um, and so Profound Incubator was kind of created out of that initiative. And so the kinds of people that we met were pretty, I would say half of the, our participants were pretty new to the concept of entrepreneurship and had never been involved with the startup ecosystem before. Um, and the other half had done it before or had been surrounded by people um, who, you know, started their own startups, but never really had the opportunity or the support networks um, that we were able to provide. Um, and I think having them both then being in the same room and supporting each other to, you know, build those connections um, and build that community was quite um, important for them to consider what it means when you're leading a startup and the different parts of a startup or a business that you have to consider. Um, and, and just even the confidence building that it requires, which I think um, something that a lot of the participants took away and, and you know now they've got opportunities that they hadn't seen before they'd done our program. 
So is this the most important part or the most difficult part? Are you asking the question? Yeah, so feel uh, free to answer um, both those questions. My first okay. question um, is more around, yeah, which part you you've found that most people need assistance with, but also okay. um, in your opinion, what do you think is the most important stage? Okay, well, ideas, 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 right? There's a lot of ideas. And, and so sometimes um, trying to sort through those ideas and to really, because when we go into the reactor room, the activation event, we're going in there to have, we have an ask. We're, we're, we want to have an outcome. So, um, and at lessons learned, so we, we don't want to have several uh, different, you know, ideas. So it's one plan that we're going for. And sometimes that's very difficult because maybe, you know, one might be more viable or maybe we can find people that could to be on the panel that would be more um, well suited for a certain, you know, idea or invention. So they, we, we choose. And I think that's really hard because also uh, we want to look at the, the interests. And so just because somebody is, you know, they might have strengths in another area that that's not always the case. And so then what we also do, I mean, that's not the case of their interest. And then what we do is we work together, we have a spectrum fusion media. And so then I think this really helps too, because our media team is created as um, um, comprised of adults on the spectrum. And then they create intro videos about their pitch and what they want to do. So I think that part then helps them and they work together to kind of get everything ready for that event. But you know, I think some of the challenges too. So in the activation event, sometimes people will say, oh, I can do this. Or, you know, panel members might have ideas too that they can recommend, but to really be able to show like, what is an idea for a participant and what is an actual connection? Because sometimes everything is really exciting in the beginning, but then it's the follow through that is the harder part. Or that we have um, a participant, she launched a business for her jewelry line, Jewelry by Sable, and it was fantastic. And we uh, had this event at the House of Blues. And, but then, you know, it's to follow up on, okay, who's going to continue with updating the website? And what about, you know, the marketing? I mean, she needs a whole team just for herself, you know, so we're helping her do that. But, you know, because sometimes it is the energy getting excited about that. But, um, and one thing I forgot to mention that this is a social impact initiative. So we don't charge our participants to go through um, because we do believe that in the power and the energy of this community coming together with these connections. But yes, then to keep that momentum going, it's a little bit challenging. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, the next area that I wanted to address is the support networks that you embed within um, these accelerator programs. So the Profound Incubator um, has a network of sponsors, partners, educators, and mentors. Um, and the reactor room, on the other hand, has activators, energizers, connectors, catalysts and igniters. So I'd love to hear from both of you, perhaps starting with Johnny, a bit about um, the roles that de these different um, people play and what they've contributed to the process. And then the same question um, for Heidi. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we were lucky enough to um, access some government funding to launch our program, but that had to be matched. So corporate sponsorship was huge just because it allowed us to, one, match the funding and also effectively um, run just a full bodied kind of incubator program. Um, and that just subsidized the cost of, for example, um, office space and where we could run events, um, for example, for our demo nights to showcase some of the startups, um, you know, at the end and, and allow people to just pitch to an audience, for example. Um, so some of our corporate sponsors um, were really important in that they didn't just provide a kind of financial sponsorship, they actually provided, um, you know, because these were corporate sponsors who had been well connected with the startup ecosystem in WA in Perth. So we had sponsors who were, um, who provided um, educators and mentors as well. Um, educators were people that just facilitated workshops for our participants. Um, we had mentors that would work with participants over a six to 12 month period. Um, that was regular, you know, meetups and check-ins and our mentors, um, like our educators, for example, were founders of quite successful um, startups and, um, and it was 
really amazing just having them in the room and, and talking about their journey. Um, we had educators, sorry, we had mentors um, who were also founders or people who had work in either, you know, tech or in the education sector. Um, and we just kind of aligned people's interests and personalities together. Some of the mentors, in fact, were neurodivergent. And I think that really helped um, our participants feel a bit more comfortable talking about, you know, um, each week what they were going through and how they're finding the experience. Um, and so for me and Stuart, Stuart being um, the other founder of Profound, I think we knew that this was only achievable when we built a community effectively around the participants that we were working with. Um, and we weren't too strict about, you know, you had to meet your mentors at this particular time or, you know, you didn't have to come to every single workshop. We kind of, um, again, the concept of meeting each participant where they were is, is something that kind of came through our program. And so we just made sure that we kept in contact with the participants. The pandemic obviously affected us in ways that, you know, meant that we couldn't meet in person sometimes, um, but we still made sure that we kept that contact with the participants as well as the families, um, you know, because once you meet the families and get to know um, more about the personalities, that really helps kind of um, bolster the support that we were able to provide. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and Heidi, on to you. So we have the activators. And so these are panel members that have will be in the activation event. And so if we tailor it to the individual, so if somebody wants to have a job as a writer, we make sure that they have, we have an editor on their panel or somebody who, um, you know, authors and published authors. But then we have business people, entrepreneurs, and then from there, it, we, it, so it could be uh, like we've had somebody who, you know, for the jewelry launch, then it would be somebody in retail or somebody who's had that experience. So each panel member or each panel, the activators are tailored for that participant. And then we meet with the activators beforehand so that they really understand what it is that they're committing to, because, you know, we found as well, we, we want to know that this is a, a commitment. So it's not just showing up for the event. So to really go to their networks, to you know find out, uh, ask permission to bring those connections to the event. And then the, we also at the event, we have the energizers. But the reason that we have, somebody asked me, maybe it was you and Andrew, I don't know. So why do you have an audience? And I wanna make that clear. We don't have, it's not an audience, it's a community because you know this is why we are bringing the community together. So it's not an audience. So um, when we have the intro videos about the participants that are, are adults, that goes on social media, people get excited, they start following participant who's coming through so they can start thinking oh wait I have an idea too but even though, though they're not an activator on the panel they can still be part of it and so after there's part of the event where they can they can give their ideas and um, they can write them down or sometimes we actually ask them to speak at, at the event depends on on how many people are there and then we have the connectors because when we make the activation plan we then follow up on all the connections because some of the connections like I said it could have been heat in the moment or there's ideas flying around so we want to make sure that they're viable and then once we do that then we have um, the catalysts and then the catalysts they walk through all of the connections and the opportunities every step of the way. So we're not doing it for the participants, we're empowering them. And that's why, you know, so they they contact and, you know, so let's say we have a meeting, they, they set that up, but then, you know, we support them through that. And so, and the other thing that we do for the activators that I think is important, and even somebody was mentioned this for the intro videos, they were, or some videos they were thinking about making, we, we allow the participant to present themselves how they would like to present. So it's not that we are, we're not making them, you know, um, like a polished version or masking because really we want people to get to know them. Uh, so that is really would be kind of defeating the purpose if we had this masked, you know, video. And then that's not how the person presents or feels comfortable in everyday life. So we make sure that, the, um, so we flip that around. And so instead of telling our participants they have to act a certain way to present, we explain to the activators in the panel, 
you know, they may have expressive aprosodia, they may have, um, you know, differences in, in uh, conversational loudness or whatever, so that they understand because otherwise it's increasing the cognitive load if somebody has to think about that all on their, while they're presenting. So anyway, um, that's kind of everybody's step, all, I mean, all, everybody's roles. Great, thank you so much um, for those insightful responses. And my next question for the both of you is, in what ways do you think that accelerator programs for neurodiverse entrepreneurs need to be different and in what ways they are very similar or the same as typical accelerator programs? And there are four things um, I'm hoping you can address here. The first one um, is the mode and the frequency of communication. Um, the second one is how feedback is given and received. Um, the third thing is how you tailor your support to the individual. Um, and lastly, how do you create a culture of psychological safety? So maybe Johnny, uh, we'll pass it to you first. Sorry, I was just writing down uh, those four points. Um, so <laughs> no mode problem. Um, yeah, so I guess um, in terms of questions about how incubators um, are similar, you know, this, you know, what we ran was not too different from how other accelerators ran. I guess what was, I think the major difference that we had was that um, psychological safety was definitely big for us. Um, and also just making sure that, um, you know, for most accelerator programs, you complete a program, you kind of finish after 12 months and then you go into the world and, you know, good luck to you, you know, um, <laughs> you know, effectively that's what I, in my experience at least, um, we wanted to make sure that we kept ongoing connections with our participants after the 12 months. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't mean that we're providing them mentorship every week, but that just means that we're checking in on them and supporting them seek out further opportunities for, you know, where they can continue um, as entrepreneurs or continue learning um, or even, you know, um, support their employment opportunities. Um, in terms of the mode and frequency, um, when we delivered the program, we had it, um, we probably ran workshops over a three month period, um, almost weekly, um, plus maybe the Christmas break. Um, and then afterwards we continued on with mental workshops that happened, um, sorry, mental sessions that happen um, almost every second week for each participant. Um, I think where we would go with, you know, we definitely want to deliver this again next year. We'll probably make it a lot more of a succinct program um, over a two month period. So just shortening the time of the workshops. Um, with feedback, feedback was pretty open. So we were, um, you know, I feel like we were lucky enough that we had some really incredible participants that we worked with, so who were really open to feedback. Um, and that ties down to, I guess, the tailoring and psychological safety, right? So we um, had two psychologists um, from Curtin University here that worked with us um, who had done a lot of work and research um, in this space. Um, working with um, people who are neurodivergent, people living with autism or ADHD. And they really advised us, yeah, they really advised us and also provided time and energy into supporting the participants to just make sure um, that they felt welcome, that, you know, whatever events um, we were hosting, um, that the participants um, did feel a sense of safety. I think that was critical um, just because you know, we wanted to make sure that they felt comfortable um, in, you know, whether it was sharing your ideas or just sitting down and having a cup of coffee or, um, sorry, I've got a, <laughs> um, or just, you know, um, if you're meeting a big audience, you know, on a demo night, there's about a hundred people in the room. We wanted to make sure that, you know, with some people who might have levels of social anxiety, that they feel comfortable um, when they're pitching or presenting to that room. Um, and, and that piece about tailoring is that every step of the way we checked in, we made sure that the participants felt comfortable. We were always open for them to come in and chat to us if they wanted to. Um, and that's just an ongoing conversation that we made sure that we had with both the participants, whatever support networks that they personally had, including their family um, and our mentors and support networks as well. Thank you very much. Um, and Heidi will pass it on to you now. 
Well, you know, I think some of the differences, uh, you know, I think, well, first of all, many of these individuals, they've had their ideas stolen, for example, or people promised them that they would be, you know, they would help them. And, you know, so a lot of times we have to establish trust, you know, and I feel very honored when people do share because sometimes they'll say, you're the first person that I've ever shared an invention with, you know, because I know Spectrum Fusion won't take it, you know, and that is so important. Um, and then, you know, I think in terms of how we create the psychological safety, you know, it is, well, I'll, I can get to the, I guess, I guess I can get that to in the end, but, but, you know, everything that we do is based on a community because we're a community as well. So when you talk about mode, frequency, you know, it's a little bit easier for us because we communicate with each other all the time. So, and, you know, so it's about sense of belonging and in order to have sense of belonging, you know, people need to have positive, frequent social contact with each other. And this contact needs to be, they need to know that it's authentic and they have care and concern for the well being of one another. So once you have that real sense of belonging and authentic connection and you're vulnerable and they know that it's okay to make mistakes, that really sets the stage. And so we communicate in different ways, discord and, um, you know, we, we're on social media, some of us, and, you know, so it doesn't matter. We, we um, Zoom, of course. So that's okay. How we give feedback, it it's, uh, depends. So sometimes it's a third party giving feedback, like in the activation event. And now we're pitching our ideas to the Center for Device Innovation at Johnson & Johnson. And I can talk about that more later. That could be a third person. It sometimes it's in writing where afterwards they'll write it down. It could be from the team itself where we give each other feedback. Um, so there's a variety of ways that we do give the feedback and, and uh, you know, how we incorporate that into the process. Um, and then I think, you know, I can't really emphasize this enough is that really not trying to train or change the participant because, you know, I have one uh, young man and he wanted to be part of the program. And at first he was had such a severe disfluency and anxiety, he really couldn't speak. And if I would have, you know, said, well, you know, tell me a time that you would do this or he wouldn't have ever been in our program. And so once he knew that I wasn't expecting you know that and I was accepting him I was just asking him some yes no questions and then I looked you know he, he graduated from I mean I knew he was a you know bright young man and he was there he wants to be there so I just said okay come on and you know he has just like um transformed before our eyes and so um Next thing you know, you know, he's making connections with the individuals. But I think one of, um, oh, Chris in Australia, he calls Spectrum Fusion the, the eggshell free zone. And I think that's a great way because once you have that and everybody knows, you know, it's okay to fail because our culture here is often not about failing um, because, you know, we're, but we use it in another way and what, how can we learn and everything. Uh, I think that really makes a big deal, a big difference. And we're seeing, we are seeing lives transformed, which is what our banner says, changing lives. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and my, in the last five minutes, um, I have one more question um, for the both of you and we'll answer any questions from the audience as well. Um, but my question is, um, I'd love to hear about um, a participant or a team that has gone through um, your respective programs. Maybe Johnny will start with you, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. So we had um, a participant join us um, who's actually quite an incredible person. Um, she was living with ADHD. She had a small like graphic design business, but at the same time she had started um, an online kind of platform um, for actually graphic designers um, when they're briefing with clients. Um, when she came to us, she probably she you know it, it was really interesting because she came to us and was like are you sure you like I don't know I don't know if you need our help but she decided to come in anyway because she 
believe that there, she just kind of needed more of a community support and that didn't really exist for her because she already had, I think, 5,000 users when she was, you know, using this platform and she was at a stage where she was ready to commercialize, grow that user base. Um, and yeah, when she came and met with us, um, we had kind of understood her platform a bit more, understood her needs a bit more and what she was missing out on. Um, and what was amazing was, I think in the time that she was with us, um, and working with a mentor, she got another 2,000, 3,000 users, which was incredible. Um, after our workshop, like a, a lot after our program effectively, because she actually didn't attend many of the workshops because she had already had that knowledge. She was really looking for the one-on-one -on -one mentorship, the, the connections that would come through myself and Stuart um, and the connections that would come through our sponsors. Um, so by the end of our program, I think she had increased her um, user base by a couple of thousand. And then she was actually accepted into um, quite a good accelerator program, probably the best accelerator program that runs out of WA, um, which has about three stages. And um, unfortunately she didn't get, you know, any seed funding from the third stage, but she made it to the second stage. Um, and that was pretty, you know, as I think someone who she was, um, you know, she was, about 28 or maybe 30 and, and she was quite new to all of this and everything had happened very quickly um and it's incredible her startup's still going and she's still growing and and she's gotten more employment opportunities because of this um and, and we're getting continue work with her and, and that was a really i think for us that was just such a great outcome that i think that if we hadn't connected her to the right people or that she was kind of um just brought into that um, you know, ecosystem or community similar to the community that Heidi's talking about, I don't think she would have made the connections or had the confidence to apply for this more advanced accelerator program. Um, and we definitely, um, I feel like we definitely prepared her for that journey. That's great. Fantastic. Um, and Heidi? Well, and as I was mentioning, you know, some of our outcomes could be the creatives building their portfolios or it could be business launch, but I do want to talk about an invention. You know, I've actually have had people tell me, you know, just maybe don't focus on the inventions. They take up a lot of time and, you know, it, it might be too difficult, but, you know, I can't do it on my own, but if we connect people to the right, you know, the right sources with then, you know, I think it's a good chance. So I just want to tell about this one, this latest participant. So, you know, some of the um, participants that we have, they have ideas, but they're not always able to create the prototypes. But this particular man, he, he can, he can create a, a prototype. And so he has uh, an invention. So what we've been doing um, as part of our reactor room, because we're going virtual now, you know, during this whole COVID, but we're pitching our ideas to the Center for Device Innovation at Johnson & Johnson, like I mentioned. And so, you know, we have, biomedical engineers and, you know, scientists, and I mean, really people who have hundreds of patents. And the amazing thing is the way that they validate our participants and connect them continually, to, you know, to new other sources that can bring them forward. Um, it's just a wonderful experience. But so this man, he presented his idea to the to the CDI team and they said, okay, I think it can go to the head. And so he was the first one of our participants that were, you know, he could pitch to Billy Cohn, which is ahead of all CDI. So on the day where he pitched, um, his partner and his daughter were there and we didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, he explained, cause it's a, it's a different kind of mobility device, I'll just say. And he went through the whole spiel and then at the end, Billy just said, I love it. I love it. And, you know, so now we're, we're going through the provisional patent because that gives us a year. And then what are we going to do? How we can move that, you know, we're, we're looking into ways that we can partner because a lot of times you can partner with other companies to, to do, go to market. It's, it's difficult, you know, so we're learning all the different ways that we can do this. But that part was fantastic. And, you know, they're really seeing our lateral thinking and how we do things very differently. And so they even are pitching medical um, problems to us, medical challenges. And we are 
than presenting to them about medical challenges. And the, we pre presented last week and they said, this is amazing. He said that nobody in CDI would have come up with the solution. See, so I think this is a beginning of really understanding, you know, the power of lateral thinking and different thinking and, and how people can bring concepts together, you know, so whether, and I, I do say too, you know, must mention, so we don't take, Spectrum Fusion doesn't take any IP. So if somebody comes in and they have an invention, that's their IP. So I know, you know, other organizations might have a different way, but that's how we've been doing it here. So Thank you for both I'll sharing. I'll posted on that though, because that actually is moving quite quickly, so. Yes, please do. And thank you um, for sharing those inspirational stories. Hopefully that um, motivates um, anyone who's interested in joining these programs or similar programs to do so. Um, clearly it is very rewarding. Um, unfortunately, um, we don't um, have much time to answer the questions we received. Um, I will ask one quick one, um, but to everyone else who did post a question, um, I'm sure uh, Heidi and Johnny will be happy to share their emails um, in the chat box um, for you to direct um, your questions to them personally. But just quickly before we wrap up and head to break, um, and Teddy did ask, um, are all your programs for young people um, or is it um, open to anyone? Spectrum Fusion is 18 to 100 or more or older. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we're the same. We, it, our, our program is pretty open, 18 plus. And, and in fact, we had, um, yeah, we've had, you know, um, parents come through so far who, you know, we had one parent who was neurodivergent, had three neurodivergent kids and that was a that was a fun time um because we you know I think there were times I think she's yeah in her 40s and she was like oh I've got to do school drop off and one of them doesn't want to go to school can I bring them along I'm like yeah just bring them along that's fine you know so you know going back to just community and safety we just you know met people where they are you know come along it's more fun that way <laughs> just, so, yeah. it is Fantastic. Thank you both so much for your time today and for sharing these really great insights. Um, as mentioned, if you have any more questions, um, feel free to directly um, message Heidi and Johnny um, via their emails, which they will share shortly. Um, we will now be taking um, a 10 minute break um, and please join us back at around 2.55 um, p.m. Uh, we have two more special speakers um, to successful neurodiverse entrepreneurs, um, Vanessa Castaneda Gill um, and also James Murray Parks. So we look forward to seeing you soon um, and enjoy your short break.
Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, we now have a very special guest, uh, Vanessa Castaneda Gill, and it is her mission to unite her passions for art and stories in innovative ways that help people. Learning from her experiences growing up on the autism spectrum, she decided to found Social Cipher, a social emotional learning platform that connects neurodivergent youth and their advocates, such as counsellors, teachers and mental health professionals in an immersive virtual world. Their empowering game-based approach helps autistic youth fail safely for social emotional success beyond the screen. Vanessa and her team have earned recognition as Forbes 30 Under 30s, AT&T Aspire and Camelback Ventures Fellows, as well as Facebook Global Gaming Citizens. So thank you, Vanessa, for joining us today. My first question for you is, how did Social Cipher come to be? Um, how it started and how it reached where it has today? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for the intro, Shalene. Um, yeah, so in terms of how Social Cyber started, um, it really began, I like to say, when I was 14. So I was diagnosed with Asperger's, what it was then, uh, when I was 14 years old. Um, and when I was first diagnosed, uh, I was really kind of bogged down by a lot of the stereotypes of autism that existed at the time. And uh, the way my psychologist had told me it was, in a way that I believed that I had to be changed or be fixed or that I just could never connect with people. So because of those beliefs that I couldn't connect with people, I just sort of shut my emotions off. And I was like, well, I will just be successful without that. Um, that led to a lot of kind of negative consequences. So I ended up suffering for years from anxiety and depression and low self-esteem. Um, I hid my diagnosis for about six years because I was just ashamed of it. Um, and I think I started gaining confidence and realizing that it wasn't that the way I was learning or that the way I was was wrong. It was that I was different and that was totally fine. And so for me, where I was still able to connect and feel and learn, where I still hadn't shut it off, uh, was through music and movies and games. So learning through media um, and being able to understand uh, through that representation was super critical for me. Um, and so then when I was in college, I had gained a great group of friends and I felt finally kind of loved and accepted for who I was um, by someone outside of my family who was very supportive. Uh, and at that point, I had been a neuroscience researcher for a couple of years. I was about to publish and I was like, well, I could actually connect my own personal experience uh, along with this neuroscience experience to help other people that are probably feeling the same way. And that's how Social Cypher started. Um, we started doing pitch competitions, incubators, and it turned from a college passion project into what it is today. Uh, we're releasing our first game very soon, so yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and I'd love to hear more about the role in which your best friends who ultimately became your co-founders um, had to play um, and also any other mentors and programs that you were part of. Sure, yeah. So I ended up starting Social Cipher and honestly, the first few people that I re revealed my diagnosis to after hiding it to some of my best friends in college. Um, so my friend Amy um, and Anastasia, they were the first ones that came on. And we really had no idea how to build a video game. Uh, really just started with interviewing people. Um, as I always say, just listening to your users is the most important part of building a product, um, especially one that's going to serve them well. So that's kind of what we started doing. Uh, and then later on that year, Towards my senior year of college, we met uh, Charlie and Lucy, who were our lead developer and our lead artist. And that's actually when we started development, was right after I was graduating college. Um, so that's kind of how that started with my co-founders. And then um, we had a lot of support and help. So one of them was the Halcyon Incubator in Washington, DC, that's really based on social impact. Um, we've had amazing mentors like Tracy Newsom, who uh, is a product exec at uh, Guitar Hero and has gone through a lot of different sort of neuroscience-based or uh, just mental health sort of games. Um, and then we've had our most recent help from the AT&T Aspire Accelerator um, and the Headstream Accelerator, which have been really focused on education and youth mental health. Um, and also Camelback Ventures, which has been 
really understanding of helping out underrepresented and underestimated founders. Um, and that was especially one that hit home for me. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and now I'd love to hear a bit more about your personal idea generation uh, process. I was really intrigued by this when you shared it with me personally about how you force yourself um, to be introspective and uncomfortable um, to be able to come up with these important ideas. And also, as you briefly mentioned just then, um, interviewing and working with target users as well to make sure your ideas are validated. But could you please um, talk more about that with the audience? For sure. So I think that one strength that I've definitely found in my autism is being able to see all these little tiny details, uh, especially ones that a lot of people miss. Um, and also just, I think as a scientist with that background, uh, being able to be very data driven and willing to change uh, based on whether the data is coming out uh, in a different way than we expected, right? And so I think for idea generation, we do come up with, uh, for example, like Social Cypher started out as a VR game. And for us, we thought that, that was definitely the way we would go um, and realized just for neurodivergent youth and especially for getting to the most underserved of communities, which is one of our biggest uh, goals here, right? It just wasn't going to work. And so we kind of like evolved from there. The very beginning stages of Ava, which is our game, uh, were very rough because I didn't know how to develop games. So that was, you know, a lot of storyboarding. I did puppet shows in my laundry room um, over Skype. There were just a billion things that we did just to make sure fundamentally at our core that these young people were feeling represented. That was number one for me because when I was younger, that's what I needed. I needed someone to provide a positive representation and a complex representation of an autistic person um, that I could look up to and realize that I saw myself in them and that I could be supported and loved and connect with people in my own way through that. So um, yeah, that's kind of what we set out to do. And so many times we have been wrong. We've probably done 50, 75 different prototypes, all of varying mediums um, to get to where we are. Uh, but every character change, every storyline difference, every time we have scrapped completely all of the things that we have done for this game and then restarted uh, has been really worth it. Because when you get down to it and when you're playtesting with a young person that you once were um, and they say, oh my gosh, I can't believe like there's someone that I, like I feel just so connected to this person. Um, I can't believe I relate to this person and that they're like, this person is stimming or, oh my gosh, I do the same thing. I think when you see that, you're like, okay, all of those iterations and all of those wrong choices uh, and redoing them were totally worth it. Yeah. And you've already briefly touched on this, but I'd love to delve further into um, your strengths and how you utilize them. Um, I know you mentioned that, you know, being very authentic and vulnerable with um, your story was critical to coming up with um, social cipher, um, but also enabling you to connect um, with your target users. Um, but could you please um, delve further into um, how you were able to reach the stage that you could be um, authentic and vulnerable with your story and utilize that as a strength rather than um, something that you mentioned, which was um, really kind of a, a challenge for you at the beginning. Most definitely. So I think I'm still very much on that journey. Um, I really think that in the beginning, and it's, again, it goes along that line of authenticity. And I think it's important for people to know that in the beginning, I, in a way, was still trying to fix my former self, right? I think that the aim of the game at the beginning um, was more about, uh, you know, changing behaviors, making sure that, you know, a younger me wouldn't be so embarrassed when they did the wrong thing. Um, or, and, and I guess that's where I was. I was at this place where I wanted to fix myself. Um, and I still hadn't come to true acceptance yet. And it really wasn't until I got more in depth with interviewing other young people um, who I saw myself in, where I realized that that wasn't actually the, the solution here. That was never the solution, um, but it's an easy trap as an autistic person, um, in especially in such a socially oriented world like business uh, to think about and to believe. So 
for me, it was really about talking to those youth and continuously sharing my story. I think that was a hurdle that I really had to get over because I was nervous about how people would judge me or treat me. Um, and while I get little tidbits of in some more unwelcoming environments of it, I'm so, so glad that I was able to uh, tell my story and listen to the stories of others in order to change and realize that it's not about fixing my past self. It's about having compassion for my past self, uh, realizing that I was doing the best I could with what I had and that now I have the tools to help other young people uh, do the same thing with themselves, um, to really just feel pride in their own identities, uh, to advocate for themselves and to go off and live really thriving lives. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, and yeah, that's really such a, an important message and I guess really drives home um, the vision um, and the values behind Social Cypher. Um, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about how you mentioned one of your key strengths is that you're very detail oriented. Um, but part of being an entrepreneur is being able to um, not just focus on the details, but, you know, see that big picture vision and, you know, um, coordinate teams um, and, yeah, take a step back from really delving into um, the minutia. So could you talk a bit about how um, you were able to build and hone this skill um, of being detail oriented um, and change that or develop that into also enabling you to step back and um, view things from a larger perspective? Yeah, I mean, that's still definitely a thing I'm working on, right? But I think that I really improved by being able to communicate to my team just how I think and how it all works. And I think that's why it's so helpful to just have a diverse team of people with uh, varying neurodiversity, different skills um, and different backgrounds because we all sort of catch everything in this net of this startup uh, uh, whenever things fall through the cracks for either one of us. Um, for me, I was able to see a lot of things that uh, my co-founders couldn't foresee. Um, and for them, I was able to just catch a lot of things that they might miss too. Uh, I think it really took a lot of the time I realized that when I was anxious or when I was at a point where I didn't know uh, how to ask for help or how to take a next step, uh, my co-founders were really, really um, observant and knew that that was usually a point where I had sort of more of a tunnel vision uh, that they had to step in and kind of say, hey, um, looks like you're real into your detail, which we know you're good at, uh, but we might want to step back and look at the big picture. And I think that them kind of building those processes with me, uh, teaching me how to uh, recognize when I was starting to get too in the weeds about things um, was really helpful. And I think that they were showing me and helping me step by step realize that I could actually do this. Um, and I think for me, the method of working backwards, so just thinking of why I started this all and kind of walking back from that um, down to the tiniest minutia uh, really helped me figure out that big picture there. And I think also yeah. just standard sets of questions and processes was another thing that helped me a ton. Yeah, it sounds like, um, you know, you, a big part of why um, social sci-fi and you have been able to be so successful is because you have a very a strong team and I guess got quite lucky with that but I'd like to hear about um, if there have been um, any challenges with the teams or um, upon reflection um, what you have learned um, from your team members aside from what you've already mentioned. Yeah I mean most definitely I think one thing about being autistic, at least in my experience, is that I am extremely empathetic. Um, I have been sort of, I, I've sort of grown up in a way where I needed to make sure that everyone was okay. I just wanted to help all the time. Um, and I just wanted to make sure everyone was happy all the time, which just was not realistic in a startup. Um, I also just was really a person that would uh, try to avoid conflict because I didn't want to displease anyone. Um, and I always wanted to be viewed in a positive light. And I think that for me, uh, that was something that I definitely had to get over when it came to my co-founders. I had to be incredibly honest and authentic. I had to be the one really reporting a lot of the bad news and a lot of the times where, you know, we've had to completely scrap and then pivot. And, you know, I think, because of this people-pleasing attitude, uh, 
I thought that, you know, they would never speak to me again. I thought of the worst consequences and scenarios, but they were always, they've always just been incredibly supportive um, and helped where I've needed it. And I think that I've learned a couple of big things from that. One of them is that I can't be afraid to ask for help. And I think that's one of the biggest gifts they've given me um, is sort of helped me realize that. Uh, yeah. So I think that that was a huge thing with my co-founders. Um, I think there are just a lot of other challenges involved. I mean, for us, we've definitely had our co-founders leave and move on to different uh, areas of wherever their dreams have taken them. Right. Um, I think it's, especially in this past year, which isn't something I usually talk about, right? Um, but we've brought on some fantastic new people. Our co-founders are still on as advisors. And it's really just about moving on to that next big step um, and realizing that my anxieties are here, but I have ways to work through them now. Um, and I still have yeah. this experience with this community that I know very deeply and I'm constantly talking with. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, and another point um, that you mentioned to me was something that you had to learn to navigate um, was your discomfort with change, which is obviously something that um, is to be expected when it comes um, to entrepreneurship and working on a startup. So I'd love to hear about um, the processes um, or the things you have done to be able to um, navigate changes more successfully. Yeah, and I think that's always been, uh, yeah, quite challenging for me, even before my startup, right? I think I've liked, I've always liked consistency. I've liked routine, but not too much of it because I also have ADD. So it's always kind of that way. Um, and I think that's been super difficult just because of that comorbidity of ADD and also having autism. Um, I think it's also in a way, I've been able to start honing it because that ability to change and also to change quickly and also go really deep into things um, is something that I still can do. I can put together that hyper focus and that switching between different ideas and thoughts um, to my own advantage and use. It's just taken a lot of practice. I think that for me, my emotional processing is a little bit uh, slower. It's, it has a little bit of a delay. So when I realize that a change is coming, um, I really have to kind of put that in perspective and take as much time as I need to really plan next steps. And I think for me, it, it's a lot of individual thinking and processing, truly. Um, it's a lot of going back to the original questions of why I started, the original questions of what do my users need um, and starting from there. Uh, for me, it's really about listing out, all right, what do I know? What do I not know? Um, and how do I get to this first, second, and third step of learning what I don't know? And that's pretty much it. Great. And pivoting a bit now um, into diversity, equity, and inclusion more generally. Um, so you are Latina, a woman, <laughs> neurodiverse, and also a first-generation college student. So I would love to hear from you about how you think about your intersectionality as a leader um, and what do you think needs to be changed um, in the current institutions that we see in society, whether academic um, or um, corporations, um, to be able to address um, or help optimize for the unique strengths of um, people who are in the intersections um, of society? Mm. Oh, that's a fun question. <laughs> um, there are a lot of things <laughs> that short answer. Um, but I think that with my intersectionality, it's definitely been a journey of uh, figuring out how to show all of them. I, I think that uh, a lot of the time I can get stuck in presenting myself as just one um, and kind of put the others on the back burner where, you know, in a perfect world, I would love to be able to sort of present myself as all of it. Um, but it really is a lot of different conflicting thoughts and a lot of uh, figuring out a prioritization of, all right, which identity needs the most work or the most, most help right now? Um, how do I really focus on which identity is kind of leading me? Um, I think that all of the different elements that make me up as a person have 
all of these great advantages and benefits. Um, but at the same time, I, there are a lot of places in society where I feel for other people that share uh, my various identities, right? Um, so I think that when it comes to making things more accessible for um, Latinx and especially uh, female and neurodivergent entrepreneurs, especially, I think that one of the biggest things is just early support. Um, I know that especially in ed tech, a lot of the time there is funding that's given for super duper early stages or there's funding that's given once you are uh, very established mm -hmm. as a product, have your sales cycle, have all of this stuff going on. But there's nothing for that little in-between stage um, where you have this idea, you've, you've created a minimum viable product, but you just need to be able to test it to get it to market. Um, so I think having earlier stage funding um, opportunities, mentorship and advisor networks, I think are huge. We've been lucky to have so many incredible mentors and advisors um, and also having just a community of founders. I think that just this year, I started realizing that there were other neurodivergent founders and other Lenex founders out there um, that I could just communicate with in terms of just all the little tiny sort of struggles there might be. Um, just the day-to-day -day stuff even um, when it comes to fundraising or networking and interacting with others. Um, I think that community has been huge uh, for each part of my identity and I think there needs to be more of that. Also think that there uh, I guess is a last thing needs to be a lot more investment in the neurodivergent community and neurodivergent entrepreneurs. I think that we have especially with the right support um, and with the right conditions and understanding we're really well geared for entrepreneurship. Um, and we have this deep passion and focus and ability to see things other people don't. Um, I think with that support, we could go really, really far. Definitely, that's some really um, great advice and insights. Um, and hopefully, yeah, something that um, organizations, anyone who's listening here can definitely take away um, and look to implement. Um, my last couple questions of you before we take some questions uh, from the audience is what advice um, you have for uh, budding entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs um, and also something you would do differently or wish you had known um, earlier in the process? Yeah, that's a great question. I think number one is uh, ask for help and don't be afraid to do it. I think that it's a sign of strength rather than a sign of weakness. And especially if you're young, especially if you have a cause that you're really passionate about and you're in a community that you're, you're a part of the community that you're trying to serve with whatever this vision or venture is, people are very willing to help you. Um, and people will do it, you just have to ask. So I think that's one big thing. I think especially for neurodivergent entrepreneurs, um, I would say don't don't be afraid of being vulnerable um, and don't be afraid of advocating for yourself and asking for what you need to feel comfortable. Um, a lot of structures, unfortunately, and, and a lot of practices in the business world are so neurotypically oriented. And I think early, I guess, uh, rolling it into your other question, I think that so many times, especially during non-COVID times um, and in the first beginning stages of social cipher, I felt that I had to conform to all of that um, in order to seem quote unquote normal or in order to seem competent or capable enough. Um, and I would say that, no, you ask for your accommodations, you ask for what makes you feel comfortable and that further shows that there need to be the right supports for neurodivergent people to thrive. Um, I also think that, you know, if, if people don't understand those accommodations, if they don't uh, think you actually need them, or if they, um, you know, doubt you or, or, or make you feel belittled in any way because of your condition, um, that isn't a person that should be on your team. Um, and you don't have to go and chase that down. You will be fine and you will find people who will support you through and through. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, and while we wait for um, some questions um, in the Q&A from the audience, um, please feel free to share um, a bit more about what's next for Social Cypher, where you see Social Cypher heading um, in the future as well. 
Yeah, sure. So um, our first game, Ava, is actually coming out very soon. Um, we're on track to be finished by the end of November, and we're running our pilots of our game in January of this year, or of next year. Hello. Um, so we're running our pilots in January. Right now, we're looking for teachers, counselors, and mental health professionals um, to be participating in those pilots. Uh, you can find info about that on our social media or, or on our website. Um, we also have a wait list for our first episode of the game coming out, um, which is very exciting also on our site. Um, and we're also starting to write some social emotional learning curriculum um, that is coming from a place of empowerment um, of neurodivergent people actually writing that. So if you are a neurodivergent person who is experienced in social emotional learning um, or you're a mental health professional, I would love to talk to you. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing next. Uh, very exciting stuff. We're also raising a fundraising round um, to start out our companion app, um, which allows our counselors and mental health professionals to stream uh, Ava remotely with any of their clients or students, um, and also helps you track social emotional progress and gives you talking points um, to go along with the game. Awesome. And yeah, so as Vanessa said, um, if you have any expertise in these areas um, or would like um, to help her out, please feel free to reach out to her. Um, I think she will um, put her email um, in the chat box um, right after for you to contact her if you're interested. Um, so we have a question coming in um, from Tiffany and she's asking, what is the best way for neurodivergent people to network? Oh, <laughs> just the word. Um, yeah, that is a great question. And that is one that um, I had struggled with a lot in the beginning stages. Uh, I went into this fantastic incubator called Halcyon right after college. I had just started uh, you know, learning what business even was because I was from a research background. And um, they were constantly having networking events and I was terrified. Um, I think that a lot of normal networking advice is working the room, talking to as many people and getting as many business cards as you can. But for me, it was really about, uh, what, what really changed for me was that I talked to one of my advisors and she was like, you don't have to follow that advice. Um, honestly, with your gift and with, with what you're doing, um, you just want to go in with the goal of connecting deeply with one or two people. That's it. Um, because most of the time I think with networking, um, it's great to be able to work through and get everyone, but really realistically, uh, you're probably going to get a few really good authentic relationships that you're going to build through that. So why not just hone in and focus on that? I think that's helped me the most. I think that especially for me, I, I tend to get a lot of uh, sensory overload very easily, um, especially when you're in normal life. Um, so for me, I would ask, hey, can we go somewhere a little bit quieter and just like have a deeper conversation um, and just be very upfront about that. Um, that's also a good weeding out tool. Uh, if someone doesn't understand or accept that, um, you know, you explain further. And if it's not something they want to do, um, then you know, maybe they're not a great person to talk to. Um, but most of the time people totally comply and it is just way easier to connect with someone. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing is be yourself and be totally direct. I, I think there have been many times where people are afraid to ask for what they want. Um, and for me, I go into every networking event with three of my biggest needs and uh, priorities. And I just try to work those into the conversation to get the objective I need. Thank you so much. Um, well, that is all we have time for today. Um, thank you for sharing your really inspirational story and your advice. I hope it proves helpful to the audience and encourages um, any people who are on the fence um, about starting um, their own company or pursuing this um, as a career path, um, that it is really, really possible. Um, and thank you again. Um, and. Uh, Vanessa will put her email in the chat um, for anyone who did not um, have an opportunity to get their uh, questions answered. Thank you. Thanks, Charlene. Um, Thanks, Vanessa. No Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> All right. Bye. And now on to our last um, 
but not least, <laughs> uh, some very special guest, um, James Murray Parks. Um, Professor James Murray Parks is a renowned scientist and engineer who is widely regarded as a world leader in high load connection and innovation and design. His unique design capabilities have influenced over 800 projects in the construction, energy and defense sectors. For the past seven years or so, James has been the director of the Brookfield Scientific Solutions Group, which is part of Brookfield Asset Management. In addition to his work at Brookfield, James is a professor of practice in the Monash University Department of Civil Engineering. He was a founding member of the Modular Construction Codes Board, which developed and published the first edition of the Handbook for the Design of Modular Structures in 2017. Earlier this year, James began a new journey as the director and founder of Technosha Laboratories, which he co-owns with Aucklander, Paul Crystal, and some close friends, Robert Cornish and Rod Keller. This group devotes a large portion of its time searching the physical world for inspiration to help solve problems and more importantly, learn more about how to find them. So welcome, James, and thank you for joining us today. To start with, I was hoping you could tell us a bit more about Technosha and its mission. Yeah, um, hi, Charlene, how are you? And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good evening and uh, good morning over here. Um, yeah, Technosha Laboratories was actually started as a brainchild of uh, one of the directors um, uh, at Brookfield, actually, um, because, uh, you know, Brookfield senior management could see that um, my team and I had sort of um, were a bit different and um, and we needed a bit of freedom to do the things we, we needed to do. Um, it wasn't really a, a corporate model that really fitted us. Um, and they persisted with us for about eight years and tried us in different roles in different ways and, and realised the best way was to give us um, uh, autonomy, autonomy. And um, so we decided to start a group and we, we decided to call it Technosha Laboratories. Um, and we still... 100% work for Brookfield, but um, we do it um, our own way. Fantastic. And could you tell me a bit more about um, the mentors perhaps that you received in your own personal journey to being able to um, start Technosha um, and the team members that you have um, now as well as part of um, Technosha Laboratories? Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, a lot of the senior executives at Brookfield were very good mentors to me and still are. Um, we still report through to, um, to a couple of the guys there um, and girls there. Um, but I would say um, the biggest influence for us over the years was John Flecker from Brookfield. Um, he's the, the global CEO of Multiplex. Um, and he uh, he's still a... a, a a weekly in weekly communication with us and, and giving us guidance and so forth. Um, yeah, he's a he's an amazing guy, an engineer himself, um, but really uh, understood that we were more than just engineers. We were physicists um, that happened to have engineering degrees um, and encouraged us to encourage us just to be ourselves and to design and invent the things that we felt were were natural as opposed to doing what the rest of the the company wanted us to do. Um, and, and to have that, that person sort of, you know, see through a lot of the white noise um, um, and, and have confidence to give us the, the freedom to do things the way we want to do them and trust us um, was, yeah, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. It was a, it's, it's a, the best gift that I've ever been given in my life. So uh, he's probably one of the most special people I've ever met. Um, and then Technosha, um, you yeah, know, we have Paul Crystal here who's a... Um, uh, a wealthy philanthropist who, who got involved with us purely because he wants to. Um, he, he, he doesn't expect financial returns. All of those returns go to Brookfield. He just likes to be involved and likes to um, support us. And um, I worked out, you know, very early in the piece that the reason he loves being involved is he's not only successful, but he's, he's autistic himself. So, um, yeah. And then, and then I suppose uh, in, inside Technosha, um, with their hands on the tools every day, uh, Jackson Clark and Adam Stiles, um, in particular, uh, are two guys that, um, yeah, I've really clung to over the years. They've never worked anywhere else in their career. They've only ever worked here. Um, 
and we've done amazing things together. Uh, in the last nine years, we've we've done over 330 projects together um, that are live. So, wow. yeah, it's been a pretty pretty good run. And you have a very um, endearing term for um, your team of uh, scientists and researchers, which is little your little geniuses. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about how you um, choose um, the people that you um, ultimately ask to join Technosha and what do you look for? Yeah, they find us, um, Charlene. We, we don't go looking for them. We find, found uh, by going to look for them, it was sort of against everything that we were taught as scientists. Um, we thought, you know, if the, to use an old analogy, you don't push rope. Um, and when we were looking for people in the early days, we, we had a massive attrition rate uh, where we were trying to find the right person. But when we stopped and just focused on our work and let the work do the talking for us, and then people started to find us and the attrition rate went away um, and we, we found a lot of keepers uh, almost straight away. So usually the people that have worked out here are people who have found us. So this is the method we use now. Um, right now, for example, we would love to have a couple more people um, that we're not looking. Uh, we just, we, we wait until that person comes along and when they come along, we invite them in and um, they seem to fit pretty well. Great. And what are the indicators for you to know when um, you've the person that approaches you is a right fit for your team and the work that you do? Uh, you know, the way they describe what they see, um, you know, it, 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 we all um, in our team, we, we all see, um, we all see different things, different ways, but um, usually when a person describes um, how they're seeing something, uh, um, and you encourage them to be totally honest and transparent and they, they tell you, um, you know, they describe something to you that you've never seen before or, and then you can start to comprehend it from a new perspective. It's usually a very strong indication that um, there's something special coming, coming, coming our way. Fantastic. And I think um, this is a good pivot point to um, the next question I wanted to ask you, which was, which is about your very unique um, idea generation process um, in which you find inspiration um, from the natural world to inform your ideas and designs. Um, as an example, and you can definitely speak more to this and in better detail than I can, but you gained inspiration um, from um, a bicycle and a spider web um, to inform your designs about the roof of the Rod Laver Arena. So could you please talk a bit more about, um, yeah, your idea generation process and also talk a bit about, yeah, the designs that um, you and your team have come up with? Yeah, sure. Um, I, um, it goes a bit further than that, actually. So I, I, it may sound like I'm digressing, so forgive me, but... Um, the first no stadium, the first stadium ever designed was Perth Stadium, which is a, um, a 60,000 seat stadium in Western Australia. It's a, it's a very new one. Um, and it won, it won several awards, um, you know, most beautiful stadium in the world and all sorts of things. It's a very nice stadium. Um, the geometry that we used in there came from um, a motorcycle swing arm that I um, inverted the geometry and then applied it to the roof of the stadium and it worked perfectly. But where I got it, to apply to the motorcycle was from a spider web. Um, I was struggling to get um, the correct geometry um, on, a, on, a, um, on a world championship a motorcycle. And um, I basically was just, you know, at my wits end and I was walking through the bush and I just saw this massive spider web and I just measured it very quickly, pulled out my comps pad, started drawing it up, took the geometry back, applied it to the motorcycle um, and with some very minor tuning it worked and solved my problem very quickly um, the reason it worked was because the shapes in the spider web looked very similar to the problem that I was trying to solve and as soon as I saw that shape I realized that I'd come up with a solution um, and I, I just steal things from nature um, a lot of people say I'm a brilliant mathematician and all that sort of stuff and that's nonsense um, I just steal things from nature because I can see the solution in the shapes in nature and then I measure that um, and then I copy it down and then I take it back and I apply it to the physical structure that I'm designing. And it, it always works. I don't know why it always works, but it always works. Incredible. And aside from, you know, your, your clear talent um, in design, um, I'd like to talk 
a bit about um, entrepreneurship and obviously um, you know, running Technosha requires a slightly different um, set of skills as well. And I'd like to hear about um, what your strengths are um, and how you've been able to utilize them to successfully um, run and manage Technosha laboratories. Well, I don't know about my strengths, but I can give you a very long list of my weaknesses. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> sure, we can I, delve I, I think, into that too. I think, I think by being, you know, forced um, out of the um, the corporate world to, to do my own thing was the best thing that ever happened to me. And um, Brookfield, I can't thank them enough. And their loyalty to me has been amazing. So I don't really feel like I'm an entrepreneur, to be honest with you, um, because I've literally got Brookfield's um, hand to hold. And um, when I don't understand something, I've always got someone back at Brookfield to, to help me sort it out. Um, however, um, I, I, think, I think the... The thing that I have learned is that um, don't be scared of anything um, because the the mild superpowers that we have in our team, each one of us individuals have is so diverse. There's always somebody in our team who will have an answer um, that will get us somewhere close to solving the problem that we come, come up against. And once you put your trust in everyone else around you um, and realize that, you know, the weight isn't all on your shoulders, it's, it's, it's spread evenly amongst the team. It's, there's very there's very little um, um, there's very few times I should say where where we've come unstuck. Um, there's always a solution, and and it's just about building that confidence up. Taking the initial step um, to do it is the hard thing. Um, once you get in, immersed in it, it's just like learning to swim. Really, um, you know, yeah, you can't touch the bottom at first, but you know what? There's lots of different ways you can make your body float, and um, and, and all of a sudden you can swim and you can propel through the water and next thing you know, you're doing laps and, um, and you're climbing out and everything's fine. Um, so I think that's how I would sort of um, describe, describe it. I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great answer. And we've definitely, um, throughout all the panels today um, and the experts that we've had speak have emphasised the importance um, of teamwork when it comes to um, entrepreneurial endeavours. So definitely that just reiterates that point further. And, you know, you just define yourself more as um, an entrepreneur rather than an entrepreneur, if you will. So I'd love to hear in your own words, um, like how you would differentiate the two things? Um, well, just from what I've learned, um, you know, my, my job is very much to support um, the company that's funding me. Um, and, you know, I, I've got this overwhelming sort of sense that I have to give them a return on their investment with me. And um, as any scientist with, with any, any moral fibre would. Um, and so I, I just try and bust my ass to get the monkey off my back um, and give them a return as soon as I can so I can then get on with some of the stuff that I really want to look at. Um, and, you know, when I was a little kid, my dad used to make me eat my veggies first um, to make sure I ate my vegetables before I ate meat. And, um, um, and, I, and I look at it like that, you know, I always just say, well, you can call it entrepreneur if you want, but um, I'm proactive because I'm trying to get the monkey off my back and give them a return so I don't fail my investor. So... And if that comes out as a byproduct that it looks like I'm an entrepreneur, then then that's a byproduct. Um, it's certainly not what I set out to do. I just I just want to sure. give my funder a return. Yeah, mm, definitely. And what do you think for those people who are interested in entrepreneurship um, or entrepreneurship? What do you think um, are perhaps the pros and cons um, of each of them? Well, I think they're all different. Um, it's it's especially when you're talking to autistic people. I have savant syndrome, mm. so apparently my psychiatrist diagnosed me as a mathematical savant. I don't still I just still don't know what that means. Um, I, it hasn't changed my life really, apart from the fact that I've come out of the closet and I'm open about it and I don't hide it and pretend to be something I'm not. Um, and I think that same apply that same notion applies to 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 your question. Um, don't try and be an entrepreneur or don't try and be an entrepreneur. Just be yourself. Right? and let other people mm. define who you are because it doesn't matter um, just be yourself and, and 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 be a good person you know and and, and if people are going to back you and finance your research then give them a return and communicate with them and, and let them know how you're going and when you mess it all up which we do 
um, call them and tell them you've messed it up and that you'll try and fix it. You know, and um, I, I, I honestly don't think that I'm an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. I, I just think I'm a scientist, you know, with, with, with autism. Um, and um, I pride myself on, on, on my moral fiber. I want to, I want to make sure I give them a return. I'm not saying I'm perfect, um, but I don't, I don't really, um, and I don't mean to make a mockery of your question, so please forgive me, but I, I just don't no, no, think in fine. terms like entrepreneur and entrepreneur, I, I don't relate to them at all. I just, I just be sure. me. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's a great um, take on it. Um, and you've talked a lot about um, how Brookfield has played an integral role um, in your success by giving you an opportunity to have ownership um, over your work, your ideas, to be flexible uh, and like have freedom and also trust from this organization as well um, to Definitely. yeah uh, yeah try out your ideas. Um, so I'm curious, like what sort of support systems do you think more generally are really successful um, or we yeah, have successful for neurodiverse um, employees um, interested. I know you don't like these terms, but in like entrepreneurship or the opportunity to just be more innovative in the work that they do. Yeah, I don't dislike the terms. Forgive me if you misinterpret. <laughs> I don't dislike the terms. That I just they're just not terms I use. Okay. That's all. Um, so sure. I, I didn't mean to be rude. Um, the the um, I think I think the best thing for me um, is is it took a long time for us to trust each other. Um, I, I, I never trusted my employer. I didn't trust anybody because I, I had, had been bullied through my youth and so forth for being different, always picked on, um, and I just didn't trust anybody. And to finally meet, you know, John Flecker um, and, and develop a rapport with him and then develop this trust where he trusted me um, and, and I, I started to trust him. And it, it took me a long time to trust him. I think he trusted me many years before I trusted him. Um, yeah, he's a CEO of a giant company um, dealing with just me, this autistic guy in a laboratory. Um, so I think number one was trust. Um, I, I trust Brookfield 100%. The people I deal with have never let me down. They've never lied to me. Um, and they trust me. And I think having that trust within each other um, and developing that transparency where you can um, at openly show whatever it is you're working on to someone who doesn't even understand the math you're doing um, and then use use analogies to make them to help them understand has 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 been the single biggest key for for our success um, I think the answer to that question is just mutual trust and respect um, and mm -hmm. I, I think I think this is a big problem you know um, um, a lot of autistic kids that I've met um, it, it's it's in their upbringing they, they haven't been exposed to mentors with autism um, they haven't been given that special environment to to thrive in they've always had their guard up um, so it takes a long time and, and often opportunities are missed because the the kids got their guard up and they're blocking um, and you know I've done a lot of blocking at Brookfield and um, and I just don't anymore uh, there's no need to you know and and um, hope that answers your question no it definitely does um, and leads nicely to my uh, last question, which is about whether or not you have any advice for people who want to pursue a path similar to you, um, where they can um, be more independent in the work that they do, um, and reflecting on your own experiences to inform that advice, like something that you might um, do differently, um, if anything, and what you would have liked to know early in the process of where you are today of reaching where you are today sure so my team uh, are independent from our corporate sponsor um, but we're not independent um, we're, we're part of a group and we're a composition mm -hmm. um, just like an orchestra um, so I don't believe in in 100% independence I think independence is is loneliness and and and, and is pretend, potentially problematic for scientists and autistic people like us I think we genuinely need each other um, I've got a guy working for me at the moment who, who wants his independence and wants to be alone, alone all the time. But every time we, we give him that independence and leave him alone, he develops psychosis and, and depression. So um, I, I really think that, um, yeah, we need to get involved with, with, with identifying autistic kids much, much earlier. Um, and instead of spending them, sending them off to special schools, um, we need to give them special understanding. Um, 
and the syllabus um, that, 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 that an autistic kid um, is taught isn't always um, applicable to the way the kid's thinking. Um, for example, I remember when I was being taught um, generic math um, as a young boy, uh, before my dad took me out of school and homeschooled me, um, I was throwing tantrums and getting low marks and all that sort of stuff because I already knew how to do it. I refused to do it. I thought it was dumb. Um, and when I went home and was homeschooled by my dad, I was doing, you know, um, Turing equations when I was seven and eight. Um, and so I think we need to identify um, the kid that instead of calling them autistic or neurodiverse, um, a high performer um, and give them a high performance mm. environment. Um, yeah, we get bored. Um, we, we, we get totally bored in normal schools and uh, even selective schools. Uh, I, tried, I, I got sent to one, um, a selective school once and uh, it was just, I was, they were just so far behind. It was crazy. It was really frustrating. Um, and I think particularly people like me and a lot of the Aspies who are in my group um, feel the same way that um, we, we get sort of um, impatient because we already know the answer and yet we have to go on through, through do all this stuff and it's stopping us from progressing at our pace. And um, I think identifying the, the, the pace the child wants to learn at mm. is the key. And that's the one thing we don't look at. Yeah, that's some uh, great insights and advice um, for um, any organisations out there that are listening today. Um, and before we uh, head on to answer some questions from the audience, um, you are working on a new initiative, the Centre for Autistic Excellence. Um, would you mind sharing a bit more information about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so we relocated um, back to Australia from um, trying to be based in New York and Toronto uh, last year and um, look, got into Melbourne and, and just thought this isn't right. I don't feel good in a big city. So I, I relocated up to Newcastle and hooked up with um, Alex Zielinski, who's the Vice Chancellor of the University of Newcastle. And we got on really well and um, he introduced me to some of his staff and we started building a laboratory called the Owl Wing Laboratory. Um, and the Owl Wing Laboratory has been adopted from, from um, the the theory that you know our wings deflect um, turbulence um, so they're stealth so they can catch their prey and so we wanted to build a, a laboratory that deflected the white noise that usually affects the um, the thinking process of an autistic person so we designed it in the shape of an owl wing um, branching out from the main building at the advanced technology center in Newcastle uh, it's being built right now um, and we decided to call it the um, center for autistic excellence because we think um, that in universities, there's not only autistic people in abundance, but there's some really excellent ones. We're not just looking for autistic people. We don't want to define that. Um, that's someone else's role. My job's to find high performing people. And it just so happens that every single high performer that I've employed over the years that can keep up with me um, happens to be autistic. Um, so we thought, well, let's start um, the Center for Autistic Excellence and, and, and show people that autism is not a dirty word. Um, you know, I want to liberate and, and, and I want my students to feel liberated and be proud to be autistic. We don't have to hide behind other words that sound more scientific. Um, autism's fine and we're happy with being autistic. Yeah, that's a really um, powerful mission and um, value system that I think um, you are using to spearhead the Centre for Autistic Excellence. Um, and certainly, um, as the other panelists has done, I'm sure you'll be um, happy to speak with anyone that is interested um, in that program as well. Um, and we have a question from the audience, which is about how was high school for you? Um, were you accepted um, by your friends at the time? And how did you ultimately um, find what you're passionate about? Uh, no, high school wasn't good for me. Um, I, I was a young boy, um, that was doing um, very high high level math by myself because and I used to hide it from the rest of the class. So I didn't, so and I used to pretend to be dumb. Um, so I used to try and fit in. Um, and then secretly in the library, I used to do um, sixth form uh, and, and first year uni math, mathematics. And, um, and I entered into a competition and I won this Australian competition over here called It's Mathematics. And, um, and then the principal of the school told everybody in the assembly the next day after I'd won it. Um, so I was like 13 and a half and I was going up against 18 year olds and um, I gave them a pasting and, um, and anyway, he told the whole school. And then that afternoon I was um, bashed and put in hospital for six weeks. So um, 
no, it wasn't, it wasn't good for me. Um, and it certainly defined my career path and how I ended up where I am. Um, cause I was then pulled out of school. Um, and then I went off to do a trade and learned how to become a tradesperson and a fitter machinist before going to, before going to university later on. So, um, no, it wasn't good for me. I was living a double life. And, definitely. and at what point, um, did you realize, um, what you were passionate about was it throughout these um high school years or later on later on um I was still trying to work out what was wrong with me and um and sort of hiding the uh hiding the feelings and the visions I was getting um I thought I was mm. schizophrenic and my doctors thought I was schizophrenic and so they had me on drugs and and I wasn't schizophrenic at all um I was seeing these these shapes when I would look at a structure or look at mathematics I would see shapes and colors and they thought it was voices talking to me and all this sort of stuff. And it wasn't, it was just what I could see that they couldn't see. And when I drew it out mm -hmm. um, to a psychiatrist later on in life, when I was doing a master's, um, she said to me, um, what drugs are you on? And I showed her and she threw them in the bin. She was an American lady called Laura, um, who's, uh, who specializes in savants. And, um, and she said, you're gifted, There's nothing wrong with you. Um, go and do whatever you want to feel, you feel like doing and, and, and draw it the way you draw it and carpet the way you carpet. And, and see where it takes you. And then from there, it all started to come good. Incredible. And we have a few questions from the audience about um, how they can find more information on the Center for Autistic Excellence. Um, would you be happy to um, provide any links or information um, in the chat after um, we finish this session? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it'll be when we do launch it, which will be sort of mid next year, uh, mid 2021, um, it, it'll be, it'll be, um, it'll be, it'll feature on our website, which is our Technosha Labs website. So, um, yeah, and I'm sure Newcastle University will promote it too. Awesome. Um, and we have a question from Megan about how you assess high-performing autistics um, as a good fit to work with you, considering issues maintaining jobs in neurotypical spheres how do you look at potential um like i said before somebody approaches us um believing that they can do what we do and believing that they can see things similar to how we see things um, and we try them out and often is the case that they can't keep up just because someone's autistic it doesn't mean they can do things at our level um, without blowing my own trumpet um, our group is um, extremely gifted um, so uh, the people in my team are all you know, Sir Robert Menzies medal winners and vice chancellor medal winners and all that sort of stuff. We don't, we don't come second. We like to, we like to understand things thoroughly. Um, I don't like to take people who get 92 because it tells me that 80% 80 of what they studied, they don't understand. So 8% they don't, they got wrong. So I like to take people who got, who got hundred percent or 99%. Um, so um, how, how, how we take people on is we, we they contact us. Um, they say we, they can do what we do. We try them out. And if they can, we keep them. And if they can't keep up, well, we, we try and help them find a placement um, within Brookfield or one of Brookfield's firms. Um, and so this has been a really successful process because um, just because the person can't keep up with our, at our standard doesn't mean that they're, they should be thrown on the scrap heap. So we then try and introduce them to other, other avenues that we identify that might be, might be suitable for them within the, the larger group of companies. Awesome. Um, and our last question for you is, what is next for you um, and what is next for Technosha? Uh, well, um, yeah, so we're, we're mainly, we don't, we're not civil engineers. Um, so we're, we're physicists. Um, we're affiliated with engineers because we do math for them. Um, but um, so we're sort of moving more away from structures to, um, to, to, to obviously um, research into uh, more health issues and um, trying to predict um, uh, things before they become problems. So we're trying to prevent as opposed to cure. Um, and we're doing that through through our big computers that we design and build here. Um, so we're primarily, and has been, have been for a very long time, we're primarily a CM and I group, which stands for Computational Machinery and Intelligence Group. So we build machines that think for themselves. Um, and um, yeah, I, I would, that, that's, that's sort of where we're, probably going to spend the rest of our lives, I'd say. 
Fantastic. Well, that is all we have time today. Um, thank you so much for joining us, sharing um, your incredible story um, to reach where you are today. Um, and hopefully um, it proves to be motivational for anyone who is interested in pursuing um, a similar path. Um, so thank you again. Um, and that includes um, concludes all of the panels that we had planned to today for the topic of neurodiversity and entrepreneurship. Um, and just to sum everything up, um, neuro in entrepreneurship and innovation um, provides a unique opportunity for neurodiverse individuals to take ownership over their thinking talents, interests, and financial situation, um, especially in a world where many companies do not provide um, neurodiverse people with the sort of work environment that allows them to thrive. So ultimately, um, this panel, these panels that we have put together is a call to action um, for local governments, educational institutions and corporations to collaborate with us um, to create an ecosystem um, for neurodiverse entrepreneurs to gain access to venture capital, um, gain access to collaboration spaces, pitch competitions, a network of like-minded entrepreneurs and mentors, and also workshops um, on personal development um, and skills relating to entrepreneurship. So if you are interested um, in contributing and collaborating with us, please feel free um, to reach out to Andrew, Eddie, or myself. Um, all of the panelists we have had join us today have also kindly shared um, their emails for you to direct any questions you may have. Um, and yeah, that concludes um, this session. Thank you again to all the panelists for um, sharing um, their insights and their stories. Um, and thank you to Stanford for the um, opportunity for us to um, share our work with you today. Thank you for the brilliant session. It was really nicely put together with so many different perspectives. Um, this is quite the treat. And um, the last session is going to be the final concluding session, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, in that session, we're going to summarize a lot of the sessions as well as uh, discussing some actionable proposals. And at the end of the uh, session, around 5.30 um, or so, uh, actually between 4.30 and 5.30, we'll summarize the sessions. And then from 5.30 to 6, we'll have Q&A um, with the audience. And then uh, after that, we're going to, uh, to take group pictures. Um, if you are going to be sticking around, uh, we may be able to get you to take pictures, especially for moderators, uh, the organizing committee members, as well as the speakers. And um, depending on our bandwidth, uh, we may be able to even take some audience to in the, in the picture. Uh, so we are going to be back at 4.30. See you soon.
Thank you for joining us in this concluding session of the Stanford Neurodiversity Summit. In the next hour and a half or so, uh, we're going to do three things. First thing is we are going to summarize all the sessions and uh, there are um, uh, moderators that have submitted their slides. So uh, for moderators, when you see your slides, please just jump on it and uh, speak. Uh, we have, the moderators have not seen the order of the slides. So uh, this is a little bit challenging for all of us, but we'll see how it goes. The second part, which will uh, start probably around 5.30 or so, will be the uh, the questions. Uh, maybe there, there, there may be some um, responses, uh, but mostly we really want to hear your comments uh, about the conference. And then after all of that, uh, we're going to uh, adjourn the meeting and uh, for the moderators, we'll take pictures first. Uh, so stay as a panelist, if, if at all possible, uh, I'll give you some instructions uh, how to get in. If you are an attendee at this time, we will uh, use the function of raise hand so we can try to find you a little bit easier so that we can promote you back to the panelists. So we have uh, moderators first, and then after that, we'll have speakers. And then after that, uh, we may be able to take pictures with the attendees as well. The, the way it works is that uh, we can make 100 panelists at, mac at maximum. So uh, we may not be able to take everyone, uh, but it's going to be close. Uh, we have 119 participants right now. So uh, it may be possible. So with this, I'm going to start Let's see, right here. This is our collage for our speakers and moderators. In this, um, conference, we have five days of materials. We have over 90 moderators plus speakers. Um, we have somewhere around 50 hours of material. So we're going to compress this into one hour and uh, I have organized them into uh, several sections. The first, uh, we have neurodiversity success stories. The first uh, speaker was uh, Liliana Mayo. Dr. Mayo had uh, been uh, having a very distinguished career in helping um, autistic individuals to find work and they even support their families. Uh, I am not going to read all of this summary slides uh, for the sake of time, but basically uh, what she has shown us is a very compelling story that people on the spectrum with, even with intellectual disabilities. In Peru, she has been successful in getting them jobs and getting businesses to believe that uh, they are actually good workers because um, here is one of her, her quote, they don't gossip, they ask for more work and they are loyal to the business where they work. So because of that, uh, some of these workers, they actually support their families in a very significant way. So I wonder if uh, in our country, we are going to be able to do that. We're definitely behind Peru on, on this particular aspect. Uh, I'm going to move on to, um, to Sienna Castell, who is the keynote speaker for this morning. She is just a very amazing young lady uh, who is so passionate about neurodiversity and, and she's so effective in bringing people together, neurodiverse 
as well as neurotypical to, to, together. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, she, she has built this neurodiversity celebration week in such a fashion that uh, it's becoming a, a really large uh, phenomenon. Um, this year, uh, she has attracted about half a million students, uh, K through 12 students all around the world to celebrate neurodiversity uh, celebration week with her. And um, I have, I, I have already mentioned many times that um, Sienna had also uh, been acknowledged like numerous times. Um, and uh, the, in the next couple of years, she is going to have a very important role because she was selected as one of the 17 young leaders uh, by the United Nations. And she basically has the task of really advocating for neurodiversity. So good for us because of her efficacy. Other inspirations. We have uh, Valerie Paradis, who, uh, is playing a multiple, uh, who is playing multiple roles. She is uh, a, an autistic advocate herself. She is a mom of an autistic son as well as the vice president of Autism Speaks. This is her son. Uh, she called him Mr. Inve Inevitable. And um, she has really tried so hard over the years with a lot of obstacles to, uh, to, to get uh, Mr. Inevitable to be able to be very successful. And now, um, uh, Dr. Paradis' son, uh, Mr. Inevitable, actually works as a, a radio host, a radio show host. And um, a lot of what he's doing is just plain remarkable. On the other side of the things uh, for her is to actually do uh, program development for the autistic community or the autism community. So one of the major things is about workplace inclusion. And she has spent a lot of time talking about how to actually create more opportunities, very much in alignment with uh, our conferences uh, theme. And then there are some new perspectives in the field of neurodiversity. Judy Singer, who coined the term neurodiversity, uh, to ask the question, how far can uh, we have come and how far can we go? And uh, she reminded us about uh, the new social movement based on neurological di diversity and also the concept of uh, commodification, both on the, in a positive sense and on a negative sense. So this, there's a lot for us to think about. Uh, we are all thinking about how we are going to do good with neurodiversity. And we just also want to not be blindsided that um, there may be, uh, because human nature can be in the way, there could be some things that we have to be aware of. And then um, Dr. Nancy Doyle from uh, Genius Within, she is the CEO. She uh, gave a keynote presentation on Sunday uh, titled Beyond Tokenism and Towards a Neurodiverse Norm. She basically brought the term neuro-minorities in. So in addition to neurodiversity, we have this new term is not so new for her because she has been using this for at least a couple of years. But uh, for most people, this, uh, this is a new term to think about um, another way of describing a whole population with various different uh, differences in brain function and behavior. And she started talking about the intersection between neurodiversity, gender diversity, as well as racial diversity that's going to be amplified by other sessions. 
So she concluded by saying inclusion is a moral, social, and economic imperative. We all lose when human potential is squandered. And then we have the nuts and bolts of starting neurodiversity at work programs. Dr. Hala Anabi uh, gave a brilliant presentation on uh, how to enable scaling of autism at work initiatives. And uh, in her uh, book, Autism at Work Playbook, she very logically uh, guide businesses on asking the right questions, such as, why are we doing this? And there are some sub questions, as you can see, that uh, you need to answer. Who can help? How do we make the business case? And where do we start? What does success look like? So all of these questions are very important questions that uh, businesses really have to answer before they can uh, wisely start a program. And she's uh, also posed to us that uh, the success uh, of these programs are really mission driven. And mainly uh, it's because the organization is committed to inclusion and access. And uh, um, the mission is aligned uh, with the uh, autism at work uh, strategic goals and also the employee uh, centric culture is what the uh, what they need um, what the companies would need in order to make the uh, company able to sustain the um, neurodiversity at work program so I'm going to skip this slide and then we have um, a few different sessions this session is uh, with the employers. Um, here's uh, the represent, re representatives of this uh, particular panel, Bill Morris, Rebecca Beam, Kathleen uh, Foley-Hughes, Nish Parikh, Harish Bigmal, and Anne, um, sorry, I remember Anne, that I, I'm blanking on her last name. So uh, they, they did the first session on employers' perspective on um, neurodiversity at work initiatives and have answered a lot of questions uh, from the audience. And then we have the five, um, probably uh, the, arguably they are some of the most experienced executives that have led the autism at work or neurodiversity at work like initiatives. Uh, so we have Anthony Posilio from JP Morgan Chase, Jose Velasco uh, probably um, have started a lot of the initiative first um, in SAP together with his colleagues. Uh, Hiran Schuckler uh, from Ernst & Young, Neil Barnett from Microsoft and Michael Fieldhouse from DXC Technology. They have really uh, answered so many really tough questions that I think uh, we have a lot of food for thought and uh, we are going to be able to think about how to scale programs. If anything, we need to scale programs in uh, large companies and start making uh, the small companies able to, uh, to start their own programs. And then we have the perspectives from employees uh, that are on the autism spectrum, Bill Lyman, Ron Sanderson, Marcel Champy, Tom uh, Maloney, um, Maloney, and uh, David Paul. And then we have uh, Wes Strickland, Patrick Filon, uh, Haley Moss, Selena Sparks, Andrew uh, Kumaro, uh, Magnus Higemak, and Srida Sanobat. Uh, they talked this morning and uh, really collectively they have really set a, a, a really uh, high bar for us and uh, really get us to help the neurodiverse community to really be able to, uh, to help in the leadership positions and uh, drive the neurodiversity at work initiative. 
And then uh, Marcel Champy, uh, Marcel, since you're on the call, if you want to give like a minute uh, summary, uh, please, please do. Or uh, someone has to unmute, I think. Hi, that's a funny picture, a freeze frame, freeze frame picture. Um, yeah, I spoke today on job tips for job seekers and employees on the spectrum and neurodivergence in general, pretty much for anyone really. And we talked about some, or I talked about some issues that normally don't come up with job tips such as making sure that you have your anxiety in check and, and you have support, a support team, a mentor. Um, talked about ways to network as a neurodivergent individual and how that's harder for us. And a lot of different things I threw in there related to my extensive research in the topic. Thank you, Marcel. And then uh, Mark, this, the next couple of slides are yours. Thank you. Um, so our, our objective um, to, for this session was to empower small business owners and managers on initiating neurodiversity at work initiative in their companies. Uh, we also have the speaker representing their organization that help individuals to find meaningful employment and among other programs. Some of the, the speakers were uh, Dr. Lawrence Funk. He talked about neurodiversity at work initiatives. We had uh, Stephanie Dignam. She talked about creating low risk partnership to increase inclusion. Uh, we had Brandon Anderson talk about supporting for small businesses, neurodiverse individuals and the public workforce system. Uh, we also had Jerry Dottillo uh, talking about employment services and job coaching uh, within his organization. And we also had uh, Dr. Fung talk about strength-based model of neurodiversity to support small businesses. Uh, some of the things that I wanted to point out, uh, for if you are an employer, uh, there are many reasons why small businesses should hire neurodiverse job seekers. Uh, we have organizations all over the uh, Bay Area, all over the United States that uh, help uh, place uh, uh, individuals who are neurodiverse. There are job developers and uh, or employment consultant, whatever they're called, they help you uh, to match a, a perfect candidate for the positions that you're hiring for. Once you get someone hired, you will have a job coach that will help to make sure that uh, the process is positive and uh, the person is learning their job skills and your coworkers are happy and everything is going smoothly. Um, and, program, and there are many programs that support that. Um, and at the end, you'll have a reliable, hardworking employee. Um, so if you are a, a employer and you are interested to hire neurodiverse job candidates, uh, I, I, um, I invite you to go into our website, Neurodiversity at Work Program, and email us and we'll start the process and we'll um, we'll go through the process. Um, so I hope uh, if you have missed those, uh, if you missed that session, uh, please go ahead and uh, go out to YouTube and uh, listen to that uh, session again and uh, take notes and hopefully we can see you soon. Thank you. Uh, the next session is, uh, is called Putting PIP to Work. Uh, the objective for this session was to understand the background of paid internship program, uh, also known as the PIP, in terms of its role in past, current, and future economy. Uh, also, our objective was uh, for the regional center clients and their families to learn about how to utilize the PIP opportunities to reach long-term objectives. Our third objective was service, uh, it's, it was for the service providers and regional center employers uh, will integrate PIP in their client long-term employment plans. Uh, some of the speakers were uh, Stephanie Dignam. She talked about fitting PIP into your employment plan. Uh, we had Sean Galvin and Kristen uh, Bates. 
uh, and they were from the regional center and they were talking about competitive integrated employment and paid internship program. Uh, and we had Chris uh, Linham, uh, who was a parent and she talked about her own experience with her son, how PIP was a successful program. And then uh, our final speaker was Michael Burnick, uh, and he discussed about how to develop a PIP. So again, if you are um, a service provider uh, or a job seeker, I encourage you to uh, listen to this uh, session again and learn about PIP and learn about uh, the, the uh, the integrated employment, uh, sorry, competitive integrated employment. Um, it's, it's very useful uh, and it's, uh, it helps job seekers to learn about a job if they don't feel comfortable working. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the things I, I wanna point out is uh, regional center, talk to your providers. Uh, talk to the families, talk to the job seekers, talk more about the PIP. Providers, talk to the families and the job seekers about PIP. And of course, job seekers and families, talk to your uh, regional center uh, service coordinator or the service providers that you're working with uh, and ask them about the PIP as well. Not everybody knows about this, uh, but now you do and, and advocate for yourself and and get the job that you want to get. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. One of the major themes in this conference is to start really exercising uh, everything we can uh, to, um, to practice strength-based model and uh, especially strength-based model of neurodiversity. Dr. Michael uh, Wiemeyer uh, arguably is the, the father of um, self-determination. Uh, he has done uh, work to really articulate exactly what self-determination is and have uh, uh, produced assessments and treatments that are uh, strength-based and uh, also what uh, Dr. Wiemeyer was talking about in uh, a great length is how this strategy can really help us to get us uh, to, to help neurodiverse individuals to get dignity out of the work. So what uh, he was uh, giving an example of is that uh, there there are uh, various different uh, projects that uh, he has been involved in, and uh, the the commonality is that he he's using the string based approach to support all people to live, learn, work, and play in the communities. And, uh, and also uh, this way, uh, you, you are basically exploring how issues of self-determination are central to achieving the objectives. And then uh, Dr. Hecky Ryman was the uh, speaker uh, yesterday, uh, our keynote speaker yesterday. He, he was also talking about basically a string-based model. So uh, the title of the talk is Maximizing Neurodiverse Potential. He gave an introduction into neurodiversity efficacy and he uh, told us what the tools are available for recognizing strengths and maximizing the potential of neurodiverse individuals. And some of the things that he has built, like uh, the company that he owns, uh, Different Brains, mentor young adults and help them along their paths towards finding a career and training them to become the next generation of neurodiversity self-advocates. He also gave a lot of good tips for parents and employers to better support anyone with a different brain. And then we have the mental health in the workplace uh, section. 
the first section, uh, we, ha we had um, uh, Michael Fieldhaus, um, Quid Nguyen, Carolyn Grants, and uh, Janet Miller, and uh, Christy Mada to uh, present, and uh, Janie Hong and I uh, moderated. So basically, uh, they reviewed, mainly Michael Fieldhouse reviewed the gravity of the mental health challenges for neurodiverse individuals in the workplace. Uh, he, he's talking about DXC technology mainly, and uh, he's got a lot of data on uh, mental health in the workplace. Um, we also have uh, Carolyn Grants that talk about peers for careers, and uh, Christy Mada and Janet Miller talking about the NEST uh, program, which are normal uh, mental health interventions in the workplace. Um, they talk about uh, how to differentiate between deficit-based assessments versus string-based assessments, and also uh, distinguish uh, between deficit-based treatments and string-based treatments. Uh, Dr. Quinn, uh, Quinn Nguyen also talked about wellness and self-care in remote work in light of pandemic. And then last night, um, we have another mental health session. Uh, Janie Hong, Greg Yates, and I um, presented. Uh, Quinn and Janet moderated. And Greg uh, talked about meditative practice in autism. And I talk about string-based assessments and neurodiversity. And Janie uh, to talk about finding strength, skills, and resilience, what clients learn in um, CBT. So basically, um, what we believe is that we can disseminate, sorry, uh, we can disseminate the string-based model of neurodiversity uh, widely. And we believe that we can train providers in strength-based assessments and positive psychology. And, uh, and uh, for great, uh, he believed that uh, ex he can expand the practice of meditation and mindfulness within the broader autism community. So now we are in the entrepreneurship um, section and uh, this is the V two minute video from, uh, sorry, from um, Kathy Farmer and Maureen Dunn. Uh, they, they are representing Autism Angels Group. Hi, I'm Kathy Schwally Farmer from the Autism Angels Group and we're here to talk a little bit about our brand new upcoming newsletter. Hi, I'm Maureen Dunn of Autism Angels Group. We have two big goals. One, to connect productive capital with social impact startups targeting the autism market. And two, to demonstrate that neurodiverse innovators and job seekers represent a powerful resource for the world. For each issue, we will have a startup to highlight. Today, let us share with you our newest portfolio founder, Andrew Hill. He is the co-founder and CEO of Lifted, an educational platform for IEP and more. With the support of the Autism Angels Group, we're moving full steam ahead. Scaling lifted to help the one in five students who learn differently achieve success in the classroom and in life. As we started to ramp up our angel growth, we realized there was a bigger opportunity here than simply pairing founders with capital, which is why we're launching our digital autism innovation resource, a newsletter, a searchable QA database, think Quora for autism and innovation, and a podcast series to showcase related inventions and in entrepreneurs in this space. Our newsletter has an autistic founder worker corner as well, where we ask people on the spectrum to share experiences, the good, bad, and the ugly. We also have a recommended book summary section where we summarize various ASD literary pieces, and we may be interviewing the author. The world is changing fast. As such, we will highlight innovative, inclusive models for building 21st century skills and ideas including scholarships and grant opportunities, along with top training resources, as well as the autistic voices of those who have benefited from them. We also will be spotlighting employers and nonprofits that of the very good proactive work they're doing in the community as a whole. 
We we'll also explore synergies between university research and groundbreaking innovations that can truly make a significant impact in promoting your university, along with tips for those exploring entrepreneurship. This will kick off with our upcoming episode titled The Beginner's Guide to Entrepreneurship and Neurodiversity. And if you and, and or your company would like to contribute or be highlighted, please go and get in touch with us at info at autismangelsgroup.com. Thank you. Okay, now uh, is um, the turn for Andrew Eddy and Shailene Cheng. Hi everyone. So I am Charlene, um, a rising junior at Harvard College from Melbourne, Australia. And over the past few months, I've had the exciting opportunity to be working closely with um, Andrew Eddy on the Neurodiversity Hub. The Neurodiversity Hub is an initiative through a community of practice to create a co-curricular program to assist neurodivergent thinkers in becoming more work ready and increasing their chances of obtaining a job. Over the past few months, I've been working on curating resources for neurodiverse people interested in entrepreneurship around topics such as developing an entrepreneurial mindset, building support networks and understanding the entrepreneurial life cycle. Neurodiversity is something very close to my heart, so I'm very excited to be have to have been given the opportunity to put together and moderate a panel of four panels of subject matter experts on neurodiversity and entrepreneurship. So thank you to everyone who helped make this possible. So the three different, uh, the four different panels we had were the, an academic panel, a neurodiverse accelerator panel, and two successful entrepreneur panels. Starting with the academic panel, we had Dr. Johan Wickland, Dr. Tamara Sten, and Dr. Michael Freeman. They were kind enough to share with us their insights on the relationship between neurodiversity, mental health, and entrepreneurship, specifically detailing the advantages and challenges neurodiverse people and their companies may face. They also talk about the implications of their research for academic institutions and companies, specifically how educational institutions have an important role in providing entrepreneurship education for neurodiverse students, as well as self-awareness and vulnerability resistance resources. Lastly, they talk about how companies have a responsibility to rectify their misunderstanding of and accommodate for the thinking patterns and attributes of neurodiverse individuals. In the second panel we hosted, the Accelerator panel, uh, we had Johnny Doan from Profound Incubator and Dr. Heidi Ham um, from Spectrum Fusion join us. They shared with us the importance of having support systems for neurodiverse entrepreneurs like the accelerators and incubators they have developed. They both emphasize that in order for such programs to be as helpful as possible um, for the neurodiverse entrepreneurs they work with, they must be able to tailor and address the specific needs of the individuals they work with rather than having a blanket approach. And in, in addition, they have to foster a culture of psychological safety because it is absolutely imperative for ensuring that the thinking talents and ideas of the entrepreneurs they work with and able to thrive and shine through. And lastly, we had two very special guests, Vanessa, Vanessa Gill and James Murray Parks, two very successful neurodiverse entrepreneurs. They both shared with us their unique journeys to running organizations of their own and the ups and downs they faced along the way. Both entrepreneurs said they have, having a supportive and understanding team was crucial to their success. And the biggest advice they have for budding entrepreneurs is to be unapologetic about who they are and what makes them unique. They say that in doing so, it will ensure that the support system that they attract is truly aligned with their interests. So that is all the panels that we ran today. Thank you again um, to all the panelists who joined us and thank you to Stanford and Andrew for this opportunity. Thank you, Shani. It was really nicely done. 
Uh, next will be intersectionality and, and neurodiversity. Uh, Christy and Isabel, please uh, take over at this point. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, so the learning objectives for this session were to understand the term intersectionality as more than the sum of constituent identities and to identify why the intersection of race, gender, and neurodiversity needs to be considered in clinical work, as well as to understand how intersectionality impacts personal and professional experiences, as well as access to support. We had an amazing lineup of speakers. Renee Brooks, Maria Davis-Pierre, Temple Lovelace, Dr. Temple Lovelace, Jamel Mitchell from Ernst & Young, Marenike Giwa Onaiwu um, and Inger Shea. Um, their thought provoking presentations would be impossible to sum up in just five minutes. Um, in talking to our speakers and panelists during the planning, it was clear that while this conversation is incredibly important, it's the beginning of what needs to be a much larger effort. And I was so pleased to see that intersectionality, race and gender came up throughout the summit. This session highlighted that there is much work still to do. Um, I will summarize the calls to action, but can no way really capture the rich information and discussion from our speakers. Um, and I would certainly recommend that people view the session on the YouTube recording. Um, so in summary, um, the reflecting um, first and acting were key, um, key calls to action. Identity exploration starts internally, and it's important when we um, begin to um, explore our own identities, um, we then begin to acknowledge people and differences um, and recognizing that our identities are collected to connected to larger systems of oppression. And a few things some of our panelists and speakers said um, were to um, put yourself out there, let others learn from you. And that's from Inger Shea Colsey. Um, we can soar and fly high if we work as a team. That's Marenike Giwa Onaiwu. Um, and what happens when great minds don't think alike? Innovation. And that's from Jamel Mitchell from Ernst & Young. You can go to the next slide. Oh, um, and there was another slide that had, um, that had, and I will just read it for you. I, I have it here. Um, there was another slide that had our calls to action. So I will just review those. Um, so the calls to action from this group were to um, recognize that black people navigate society in a different manner from white people. And certainly black neurodiverse um, people navigate society in a different way than um, black or than white neurodiverse people. And that it's important to move from inequality to justice, to dismantle the systems that keep people from getting the information and support that they need. And I'd just like to note here that um, in the diagnostic disparities um, discussion that happened later in the week, there was great discussion and examples of how mental health systems um, are structured in ways that can lead to a lack of diagnosis and access to support um, to many um, people who are um, black or from other different um, backgrounds and cultures. Um, and then the third call to action was about cultural responsiveness and, to, and that it's important that we all become culturally responsive from recognizing diver diversity through self-assessment and finally to adaptation. Thank you. So I'm Callie Turk and I'm gonna talk about the diagnostic disparities panel we had um, that focused more on the K-12 students and identifying um, needs and strengths at a younger age and, and how that differs uh, for um, those who are people who are of color. So we had three excellent panelists. Stephanie Parks uh, is an anthropology, anthropology PhD candidate at UCLA and the mother of an autistic son. Um, Dr. Rita Obeid teaches at Case Western Reserve and she researches stigma and bias. And Dr. Sarah Vinson has a clinical practice and also uh, works at the Morehouse School of Medicine. 
they were really inspiring. Um, some of the key things they, they shared were that racism is happening and it happens with the best of intentions. A lot of times it is not intentional at all, but it is just baked into the system and that race and disability are often confused with one another. Um, so the big examples they gave were around cultural language and norms and how those can be misunderstood. And that oftentimes black language is seen as deviant when it is actually not deviant, um, it is actually culturally appropriate and contextual. And so they really were encouraging us, especially Stephanie, um, to be very hyper vigilant about the white clinical gaze that we use when we are looking at, at children. Um, Dr. Obide talked about how the bias that we have, this implicit, this unconscious bias that we have so often can lead to both missed, delayed, and confusion in diagnosis. And that a lot of times we are seeing that um, children of color are actually being diagnosed for their behavior, for behavior rather than their autism diagnosis. There, there's a delay in the diagnosis that they get. And a lot of times the first diagnosis they get is around behavior when really they should be getting the autism diagnosis. And it's just a, a problem in that people who are in clinical settings awfully often have are trying to be culturally competent, but we're not being culturally humble in terms of understanding that we can never really understand every aspect of a culture. So we always um, need to walk in with cultural humility. And um, similar to what the prior panel said is that that is really necessary to do critical self-reflection. Um, like what are my cultural identities? How do they shape my worldview and really understand that? And um, she provided an excellent checklist of questions to ask for really that deep self-reflection that's required. So I highly encourage you to go back and look at that part of her presentation and take some time to go through that reflection. Dr. Vinson um, really pointed out at a more macro level that a lot of times what we call bias is really structural racism and that's not as easy to fix. So she was encouraging us to think beyond bias into the racism that exists structurally and, and fix those problems. And she really pointed out the fact that the expertise isn't always with the expert, with the clinician, but in the family and the community. So the clinician really getting to know the family and the community and context that they're in. And they really emphasize that we need to really do something about racial inequities. We need to not just talk about them, we need to get out and start being active and encouraged us locally to look at our own settings. And if we can count and see that there is a disparity, then we need to adjust and then count again and keep iterating until we are getting it closer to where it needs to be. Um, we also spent some time talking about how do you develop treatments um, with, a, with cultural humility and they really emphasize that really looking at the best treatment is the one those, those people will actually, that someone will actually do. So um, those were all very interesting elements of their presentation. And they had so many great quotes. I, I won't go through them all, but you can, you can read some of these here. You know, I think just really this sense of action and purpose in helping clinicians understand uh, the cultures of the clients that they see and really shifting from culturally competent to cultural humility, moving from just mastery of this as a concept to actual accountability. So now uh, the next section is focused on K through 12 students and college students. I think we might be, there we go, sit. there we go, thank you. That's the right slide. Marcy, are you gonna be able to do this slide? Oh, this one is me, Kelly. This is you, okay, sorry. No problem, so our panel was a neurodivergent reflections panel, uh, what works and wish list for the K through 12 student experience. Uh, we were privileged to host this amazing panel of courageous students who often overcame difficult hardships to become leaders in their communities um, to support others. So what worked for them? When the students discussed their favorite teacher or described what got them through a tough situation, it was always finding a teacher who was patient, kind, supportive, flexible, made them feel safe and allowed them to show their strengths. Schools and teachers need to understand that accommodations aren't an unfair advantage. They are what allow different minds to show you what's truly inside, not hindered by physical limitations. All of the students discussed how important it is to find your people. Some created their own organizations to do this. Some found them in online interest groups. 
or through their passions, and they emphasize that quality is more, more important than quantity. Learning to self-advocate is the top recommendations the students had for navigating school. Learning what works for you and what doesn't and being able to share this with your teachers is a powerful tool. The students often felt they were pressured and conjoled while they were facing real barriers to completing a task. So they suggest supporting the student through understanding and removing barriers. Listen to your neurodiverse student and believe them. Understand they experience the world in a different way. Their wish list for the K through 12 experience. The students wish that the understanding of neurodiversity would expand among teachers and parents so that there can be more inclusivity and neurodiverse kids can be accepted and not pathologized. Some students even started their own organizations toward these goals. They hope we can eliminate the stigma and hush hush culture around neurodiversity as we're trying to do with mental health. They would like to see neurodiverse voices make decisions on neurodiversity issues. And they pointed out that neurodiverse students often have deep passions and strength areas that school doesn't give them space to explore. They hope schools can help students lead with strengths and that parents give them support to explore their passions for as many hours as they would like. <laughs> many of the students were not diagnosed until high school or college and wish they had known earlier. It felt like a relief to have an explanation for their struggles and not to feel broken. In particular, they hope that we can get a better understanding of neurodiversity in girls and get them diagnosed at an earlier age. They also discuss 2E or twice exceptional students who appear outwardly achieving, but struggle to hold it together and still need to be evaluated. Several students face teasing or bullying, even from adults. Despite schools supposedly having zero tolerance policies, they would like the schools to actually enforce these policies. And it was hard to pick from all the amazing things that the students said, um, but I really love some of these. Don't assume because I'm alone, I'm lonely, telling us parents not to pressure them so much to socialize. Um, and that if you've met one neurodivergent person, you've met one neurodivergent person, uh, different strategies help different people and um, allow for differences and embrace that humanity is different. And one of the best quotes I thought of the night was a kind heart is more important than a high IQ. Hi, I'm Marcy Schwartz, and I'm going to be talking about the leveraging strengths and opening doors in K-12, to how working together makes a difference. And our speakers were Jay Dunlop, who's a um, head of school. Um, so we had the teacher perspective, and then we had Dr. Louise Kindle, who's a psychologist. And so we had um, the clinician perspective, and she does a lot of um, assessments. And so we really talked about how... Um, important it is around practical strategies to um, maximize the opportunities for neurodiverse students to follow their strengths and get into a flow of their learning within their strengths. And what a huge difference that that can make for the students and, their and, and how they respond to being a student in school. And some of these things, it was interesting to run, to be part of these three panels because there was overlap, even though in so many ways they're so different, um, but spending as much time listening as talking was an important point made. And it does reflect um, what some of the students were saying. So here we have the teacher and the, or a teacher and a psychologist really encouraging us that, and we're hearing the same message from the students. So. I think it's also important for us to um, figure out ways that we can take this message beyond what um, the clinician or the teacher and really making it more of a community focus. Um, and part of that is creating opportunities to design um, assi assignments that even those who are not neurodiverse, they will enjoy and it'll be learning opportunities for all. And that community focus of changing our way of teaching and viewing things that encompasses all is such an important message, I think, of this whole conference, but it, it came out a lot in this, in this piece as well. 
Um, scaffolding up and slowly removing to build um, stress tolerance is such an important part of working with students who learn a little differently to make sure that they can build that confidence. Confidence is a big um, a piece of, of something we all need to be mindful of when we're working with our students and um, crafting a personal learning plan um, and really keeping in mind the social emotional goals and kind of like what Yael was just saying about you know, the kind heart versus the IQ and really looking at the whole person. Um, partnerships is so important. Again, it goes with the theme of community and creating a safe space for children to communicate, um, which was a very similar theme that came up with the student panel. The words are different that the students are gonna say versus um, this panel, but, but the message I think is there and it's consistent. Um, supporting the entire family, I think, is a part, even if we're talking about the psychologist and the, and the teacher, really the, the family is critical in all of this and the community as well. Student advocacy, again, a similar theme. Um, helping students create language for self-advocacy, that has to happen at school, but mm -hmm. also in other settings in order for the student to feel really confident in moving out of the home and into the college or work or whatever their next steps are going to be really liked the idea of telling the story of who they are for students and um, to find what they're good at and hold on to that. And um, when students are able to find out who they are and be able to tell their own story, it's, it, it makes it easier for them to create a path towards their future. And part of all of this is building self-awareness and coping skills to allow them the tools for for this process. So it was a really informative um, session and um, really excited to be a part of it. You can look at the quotes next. Yeah, so there was a lot that came out of it. Um, teenagers want to feel loved and cared about and accepted. Um, and so really opening up a dialogue of, of being heard, I think again, is that common theme. And, um, and really encouraging students, you know, finding something every day where a student can shine, I think is so critical, as I mentioned earlier, building self-confidence of students. So there was a lot that went on and um, if you're interested, you can go back and listen to it on YouTube. Thank you. Okay, so the college spectrum. The learning objectives um, for the college spectrum were to understand the university perspective, the systems and how do we and how they see students coming in and what happens, to understand the impact of remote learning on learning academics and connection, relationships and community building, and to understand how neurodiverse um, uh, adolescents successfully transfer to college and what supports they benefit from, uh, as well as to understand the perspective of neurodiverse college students and what supports they felt they benefited from. We had an amazing lineup of speakers and presentations um, that was followed by a panel discussion. Our speakers were Scott Fitzwater from Mansfield Hall, uh, Dr. Lisa Medoff from Stanford, Hari Srinivasan, um, a UC Berkeley student, and Isabel Morris uh, from our uh, Stanford Neurodiversity Project. And on the panel, they were joined by Cole Hazergian, um, who's a graduate of um, Berkeley, and Sarah C Shisla, who is a graduate of Stanford University. Um, if we can go to the slides. Um, did did you mention Hari? I I think we. Missed I said, them. yeah, Hari. No, I, yeah. I, I don't you. think I skipped him, Hari. Har, but if yeah. I did, then I let me say his name again, Hari <laughs> Srinivasan, and he can go twice because he was both a speaker and on the panel. Thank you. Um, so the takeaways from Scott and Lisa generally break down into um, two categories um, that were. Uh, there, there, it was so rich in information, but um, the two general categories for takeaways were about preparing for college and then perspectives from a pre professor in order to be successful at college. And so in terms of preparing for college, the takeaways were to uh, really understand your learning profile, um, to orient yourself to your differences and um, the differences of different learning, um, and to begin to practice um, 
self-advocacy, uh, to increase mastery of organizational skills, um, and to increase self-reliance and self-care. The, um, and this is uh, just such a, a high level overview. We had so many wonderful details, um, but in terms of um, from a uh, professor perspective, what can set you up for, for success, um, could connect with the Office of Accessible Education or your Disability Resource Center. Connect with professors before classes start. So don't wait until the classes start. Talk to your professors early. Um, go to professors as soon as possible um, during the, the quarter and once classes do start. Um, and find a partner, find other students or other people in class or a mentor, or it can be a wide variety of people, but find a partner um, and ask for help. Um, ask for accommodations, ask for alternatives. Um, and generally, uh, professors will be open to many things um, if you can just ask, um, ask them for help and alternatives. If we go to the next slide. So it's much harder to categorize the takeaways um, from the students. They had um, just so many thoughts um, and areas for um, sort of further ac action or takeaways. Um, they had um, thoughts and takeaways about belonging, accommodations, self-acceptance, embrace embracing strengths, self-advocacy, um, and needs for improving the transition from college to employment. So a few things that they said um, were to, um, Look at neurodiverse accommodation through the lens of equity and access. That was from Hari. Um, this is also from Hari. Accommodations for neurodiversity is the conversation of our um, generation. Um, each, each person is unique in their needs. And he, um, he also brought up the point that, um, that we will, going forward, need to look at understanding um, conflicting accommodations, if, if two people have conflicting accommodations and um, looking at how we manage that. Hari and uh, actually many of the other um, panelists as well, but Hari in particular brought up, brought up the um, importance of belonging um, and, how in, and just how key that is to the college experience. Um, we heard about giving up the concept of low functioning and high functioning, that those aren't really useful ways of um, thinking of functioning and of the, the individual's experience and that low functioning and high functioning can exist within the same person. Um, learn to work with the brain you have and with your brain. Uh, talk to people and find supportive people, professors, friends, and family. Um, everyone has different strengths and cha challenges. If you can be a, um, be a part of the conversation, your professors can learn from you. Um, you're entitled to accommodation, so recognizing, and this was going from also college and the transition into work, recognizing what you're entitled to, um, knowing yourself and knowing what works for you, practicing self-advocacy in college, um, you'll need it in the workforce. Uh, career networking is, uh, can be nerve wracking and painful, but it is important um, as are internships, particularly in moving forward. And I think Cole really made a lot of points about um, comfort and understanding environments and having some exposure to environments and how that made a big difference in transitions for him. So um, having visited a school for a long time made a big difference in being comfortable going there. Having internships at a company made a big difference in making the transition to work. Um, mentorship is needed in the neurodiverse community, um, particularly to bridge the gap from college to work. That was another um, point that Cole made that there, that's really lacking in the neurodiverse community and failure is part of the process. And that Thank is, uh, yes. Thank you, Christy. So the last uh, presentation that uh, we're trying to cover, we're doing quite well. We, we were going to do one hour. Indeed, we, we can finish in one hour. So um, Dr. Sarah Rankin from Imperial College uh, talked about neurodiversity in uh, science, technology, engineering, um, and medicine, education, and careers. Uh, she, she is a um, professor in regenerative uh, psychology, but uh, she has uh, been very active in neurodiversity work in Imperial College. And uh, to sum up, uh, she, 
some of the uh, lived experiences of neurodiverse scientists and medical students has inspired Dr. Rankin to lead the project, um, making STEM education at Imperial more accessible for students with uh, specific learning uh, differences. And she also talked about uh, developing STEM outreach workshops for uh, young neurodiverse people and setting up a staff uh, student neurodiversity, uh, neurodiversity network across a number of different institutions. So with this, uh, we have ended uh, our uh, session here uh, for the summary of our five-day conference. Uh, what we are going to be doing now is um, to do some uh, Q&A. Um, so perhaps, uh, Christy, would you like to um, start? Sure. Um... So we have uh, primarily feedback, but we do have a couple, it looks like so far one question, we'll see if we get more. Um, one, and this question is actually about the Q&A. There is such good information contained in the Q&A section of this summit. I'm wondering if the Q&As will be available to access when the summit has ended. No. That's a good question. It's, um... It's rather difficult to do that. Uh, I think for some sessions, we are able to capture uh, the questions and depending on the, uh, the speakers, uh, some speakers have offered to uh, answer the questions offline uh, because we actually have uh, surpassed 3,100 um, registrants. Uh, there are just too many questions so I don't think it's possible to answer every single one of them. Um, but uh, if the speakers are able to, um, please follow up with the speakers. Okay. Um, and then just in terms of feedback, I'll just uh, read through some of what um, we're hearing. Um, that uh, we're having suggestions that we have uh, autistic and neurodivergent adults who are part of the planning and vetting for the conference. Um, and that we have um, more autistic presenters and that, uh, that they would love to see more non-speaking autistic people's talks. And I will just say, because I um, I agree the non-speaking autistic person's talk was by far my favorite. Um, and we've also got a suggestion for adding captions throughout the entire conference. So I don't know, I'll, I'll pause Lawrence if you wanna sort of uh, address any of that or else I can just yeah, continue so on. Yeah, so definitely uh, I, I'm, I'm completely appalled by Hari's um, comments, so thoughtful and so inspiring. And I think there is more that we need to do. Uh, the the uh, challenge is uh, to find uh, people like Hari uh, that, uh, that are able to articulate uh, his thoughts in such an effective way. So uh, definitely let us know if uh, you know of anybody uh, that's um, in that position. Uh, we'll, we'll be happy to figure out how to include uh, more non-speaking or minimally speaking individuals on the spectrum. Uh, the other thing is uh, including uh, people on the spectrum to be um, in the organizing committee, and we have already, and uh, that definitely it is our goal to incorporate more and more voices from the uh, neurodiverse community. Okay, and then we had um, some positive feedback. This person appreciated Dr. Fung and other moderators asking questions to the speakers panelists exactly how they were phrased. Um, and this person definitely felt that autistic voices were heard at the summit, um, even if they didn't always agree with the panelist. I will just continue on. <laughs> um, uh, we've got feedback that the summit was very informative and educating and inspirational. 
um, felt that there was a wonderful array of um, experienced speakers, many of them neurodiverse and self themselves with helped um, this person as a parent to dream big for their child. Um, and then thank you, Dr. Fung, for organizing this remarkable summit and many thanks to the wonderful speakers and all those individuals who have worked behind the scenes to make this possible. Um, appreciate having the sessions available on YouTube. Will they be uh, accessible indefinitely? We have put it on the uh, website. Uh, there's no plan to take it out. So uh, if anything, it, it will only be moved around. So um, it should be accessible. Uh, it may not be at the same location um, for practical reasons. But let us know if you have trouble finding it. Okay, and this is, uh, I believe from Michelle Champy. Um, I put my answers in my LinkedIn profile. Um, Marcel, is this from you? I, I'm sorry that I, I've gotten disconnected no, it, from the that, name. I, I think that says Jan or someone else's name. Jan. Mine are tagged, my, for my um, session, mine are tagged on LinkedIn under the hashtag neuroMinority and neurodiversity. Okay. But I didn't put that in there. I think it was Jan. Was that Jan? Okay. Um, the way I'm looking at the questions, it's not connected to a name. So, okay. So I think then that. Is yeah, it Jan. says Jan Johnson T Tyler. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so Jan's um, are on her LinkedIn profile. Um, so you can, if you're looking for answers from that session, and I uh, had the pleasure of uh, Jan's session, I, it was incredibly informative. So, and there were lots of uh, great questions. So that would be, um, if you want more information, I, I think that would be a great place to go. Um, so another uh, person comments that it seemed to me the virtual concert, conference concept allowed the summit to reach a very broad group. Um, yes, upwards of 3,100 people. Might we consider this format going forward? It's very likely because um, we got really, really good speakers from, uh, from England, from Australia, uh, it's going to be almost impossible for us to afford it if we are going to do it live and to find a place to uh, to to be able to hold 3,000 people. Uh, that's going to be really expensive. And uh, in this conference, we basically absorb the cost and no organization has sponsored our group and Stanford University is not also sponsoring our group. So uh, we're basically just doing it on our own. Um, so if we are going to need to continue with this um, uh, conference in this format uh, with a lot of very good speakers, I think the only way um, is to continue with the online format. And the in-person format, if anything, it will be very small because it, um, um, that like with, with the, with with, with so many people, I think it's, it's a better thing to uh, be accessible for more people than uh, benefiting only a few people. Okay. Um, we have a comment that I'd like more info on the autistic experience in older age groups. Any thoughts on that, Lawrence, or shall I continue? Well, the, um, that's a uh, very much not studied. Uh, there are very few people on the surface of the earth that focus on ad adults that are elderly. Uh, there is some work that is actually starting in that area. So um, I think uh, we'll put it down and try to really find the right people. There, and there are some. Um, so maybe next year we should be considering this. Thank you for the suggestion. And I don't know if this is related to older adults, but I see that um, Marcel Champi has just mentioned that she's got um, hundreds of free resources related to autism and the workplace at my spectrum suite. That's S U I T E dot com. Um, so I'm not sure, Marcel, if you have any um, related to 
older adults, but that is a place to go for um, additional resources. Definitely have resources for um, those that identify as female or non-binary. I have a lot of the resources there for those that are older. And I have a network of older adults. Most of the people that I network with are between 45 and 60, 65 on my Facebook page, um, Samantha Craft. And there's about 3,000 of us there. Wow. OK. That's great. So there are some, some resources right there. Um, Okay, and then again, it, it's uh, autistic adults can find other autistic adults. Um, we have a community. Um, let's see. Can I, can oh, I sorry, speak? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so about elders, as I'm approaching my 70th year, I'm obviously very interested in the issue of elders and questions of elders and poverty, elders and um, not late diagnosis. And I'm planning to write on my blog about this issue shortly. Thank you, Julie. That will stay tuned. We'll keep an eye on Julie's blog. Yes. Thank you. Uh, there's a question about where should people email additional suggestions for next year? So just send email to Stanford Neurodiversity Project at stanford.edu and uh, we'll get them. Could future events feature neurodiverse individuals who are currently having trouble finding work? That's a good question. I think um, what we have been thinking about along the way is we want to provide answers for people and a lot of people that are uh, on the spectrum that were chosen to talk, they did not have a very uh, linear path. A lot of them have a tortuous, atypical path. So they don't really uh, have no, it's not like they don't have any obstacles. So basically they share how they overcome their, their obstacles and that's more productive than uh, reporting failures only because uh, without solutions it's not helping anybody so that's our position okay um this is the first time i've been amongst a group of people where i felt like i relate to just about everything that's been shared everything resonated with me my hope is to get a specific diagnosis for myself, find a local community to join and to help my personal networks understand neurodiversity. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you. Um, could you have a similar event for teenagers um, on the spectrum? Your summit event is fabulous. So we actually have uh, something that is for K through 12 uh, 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 age. So Marcy, Yael and um, and Cali have three sessions that are really focused on K through 12 students. Um, definitely, that's not the majority of it. it. The total is about maybe 10% of the material. So um, we do have a new network near that uh, is going to start. And uh, the first meeting is going to be, the first monthly meeting is going to be on uh, November 19th. So, um, so that's going to be probably the beginning of this avenue. We had the, basically the NIA is going to be similar to the special interest group that we had, uh, that we started three years ago. So the special interest group that we built three years ago now is, has really, um, blossom to include so many different programs. So I can only be hopeful that uh, once we start uh, the, the near network, we are going to be more able to uh, have more ideas and more bandwidth and um, more contributors that can make it happen. But we don't have immediate plans to have a conference for the, um, the high schoolers right now.
Okay. Uh, can you share how you did the live cap ca live captioning? I'd like to introduce that feature to Zooms I'm a part of. So the live uh, captioning is actually part of PowerPoint. When you're looking at the, uh, the Zoom uh, ca closed caption, that uh, function actually is a manual function. So someone actually needs to uh, do the closed captioning or they have to, pr uh, to, to get a third party to get that closed captioning working. So basically all you need to do is to get the, uh, the PowerPoint at the right uh, probably uh, the most recent version, and then you're going to get that when you're uh, showing your slides on Zoom. Dr. Mayo was amazing, so inspir inspirational. Great start to a great webinar. Thank you all for the hard work putting it together. Okay, let's see. Uh, trying to get more small businesses that hire neurodiverse people. Can Stanford help to get a webinar on the nuts and bolts and advantages of starting a small business that hires neurodiverse employees? I think we already did one in this conference. <laughs> so uh, probably the, this uh, attendee will be uh, benefiting from, or, or this person will be able to, to, to find that uh, particular section, uh, th that particular session from our, I think, um, Monday, uh, Monday meeting. So, um, so just find the right uh, session on, on the Monday uh, YouTube. And then uh, if, if, if that's not adequate, uh, send an email to us. Okay. Thank you. It is an eye-opening conference and you actually had a for formed a community here. Will you keep this being an ongoing dialogue or any future uh, cooperation within this community? I am a mother of a 17 year old boy with autism spectrum and very glad to see that there are actually so many people who do care about neurodivergence. So what, what I would recommend uh, people that are interested in continuing uh, with the conversation to join the special interest group for neurodiversity. So if you go to our website now, um, basically you all you need to do is to Google Stanford Neurodiversity Project, and then uh, you can go to the uh, page, uh, actually the menu, who we are, and then there's an item called special interest group for neurodiversity. Once you're there, you can sign up to be um, part of the special interest group. And then uh, in future monthly meetings, we're going to invite you. Okay, thank you so much for a wonderful summit. Are any doctors on the spectrum? It would be great to have more role models across, across various fields. Yes, agree. Um, and then I think this comment is back to our uh, discussion of older adults um, who are on the spectrum or neurodiverse. And this is, there are lots of us who are adults or even retirement age like me in the Mensa Asperger special interest group. So that sounds like another, um, yeah. another place yeah. to look. If, if there are resources like that, uh, we are happy to uh, put all those resources together and um, maybe at the location on our website so um, people can benefit. So uh, please do send us an email if you do have these resources. All right, um, I would like a session on how to heal the existential wounds many of us have suffered from years of bullying. It is a really important um, area that I think it, it is definitely under addressed and under study, but we really acknowledge that that's uh, an important area. So I think next year, in addition to uh, what we have been trying to, um, to focus on the strength-based model, uh, we, we would have something that is related to PTSD. 
All right, yeah. All right. Um, and where can one express interest in being a presenter or panelist next time? So it's going to be probably a year from now. And uh, although we are saying that it's a year from now, we probably will start um, thinking about the, the format, uh, the, the next few days, the orga organizing committee, as well as some others will um, have, a, we'll have a meeting with us and we'll reflect on our um, conference and we want to know what's working, what's not working, what seems to be good to uh, go forward next year. Um, so probably in a few months time, we're going to be starting to, uh, to decide on speakers and whether or not we are going to be uh, like requesting maybe uh, people to apply for uh, the opportunity uh, to become speakers, that kind of thing. So in, the, in this, this year, basically the speakers have been chosen um, primarily, they are handpicked uh, because th those are the speakers that we know uh, or uh, those are the speakers that we are, that are in our network. Um, so as we are growing our network, I, I, I think we are going to be able to have more speakers um, that are kind of outside our immediate network. And I'm also seeing a comment from uh, Marcel Champi again, and that it looks like she has knows a doctor on the spectrum um, who's on their recruitment team. So maybe I know that was an interest expressed in one of the comments earlier. So maybe that's something um, that will, it looks like there are people out there um, as we look to expand kind of who uh, and, the, and the representatives of people in different fields. Mm -hmm. Um, and it looks to me like this is the last uh, one. And I apologize if I, apologize if I missed any. I think I've caught them all. But um, this one says, I would like to attend Stanford, but we need to work on the pipeline because there are no fee waivers targeted at neuro minorities, at least at the business college. Can we work on expanding that? With a 15% employment rate, we can't afford to pay for application fees. Well, the, that's something that I really don't know what to say um, because that's completely out of my understanding exactly how um, how uh, application fees can be waived. Um, so I I think uh, what I would suggest is that you uh, you can write a letter to the admissions office and and ask. If this is if it is possible to waive um, the application fee or have a reduced application fee, and um, and provide your justification, but um, I can't really say much more than that. Okay, and so we are like yeah. we are all set. Uh, we right are all now. set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much. The next thing that we are going to do uh, is to try to gather, we still have like 123 people. So potentially we may be able to do uh, like a few pictures. So the first picture is going to be uh, the moderators. Um, so whoever that are, that have served the role of moderator will go first. Uh, so show your screen. Uh, activate your video first. And then after that, uh, we'll include speakers and moderators. And then uh, at that step, we will actually need some work because some people are going to be needed to be promoted from attendee to panelists. So work with us because uh, this, this is manual. And, and Dr. Fung, I, I, we have to include LaDawn, our back end. She's been here the entire conference and been doing tech and I am attributing yes. much of how smoothly this went. So I don't know which group you want her in, but uh, well, I feel like- Obviously in the first group. Um, so if anything, I, the, the, the three people that I really need to uh, thank profusely 
are Christy Mada, Ladan Mohammed, and Mark Gavitin. We are uh, having this conference these five days uh, because they, they are working. If they, if they are not, there's no conference. <laughs> so th thank you, uh, Christy, Mark, and Ladan. Um, so let's see, we will uh, do a gallery view. And uh, Judy, you'll, you'll be the next one uh, because you're not moderator. Um, let's see. Okay. We have a little bit of a lag here, so let me um, Are you going to count us down so we know when when okay. we should be Patrick, making our best? Patrick, you're not a uh, moderator, so uh, you will be next. So can you uh, act inactivate? So any anyone else, uh, our moderators here? I'm looking through the attendees, making sure we're not missing anyone. Uh, how about Shaolin? Sha Sha yeah, she's here. Uh, she she had another appointment, so she uh, wasn't able to stay on. Okay. So uh, let's see, Kelly, Yael, Masi, you are here. We are here. Um, so that, that that's. Let's make sure that we can raise hand. Well, I, I just activated raise hand. So if you are an attendee that um, that you are actually a moderator, please raise your hand. So we can promote you. Okay, so I got, oh, well, Wes, you're, you're not a moderator, but I'll promote you uh, anyways, because you will be on the next picture. Okay, any anybody else uh, who are moderators? Okay, so Okay, bear with me, okay? Okay, I, I, I'm gonna count to three. Uh, look at the camera, smile. Okay. So I'm going to um, let you, let me see if I can show you. So I think we're going to take one more. Okay, look at the look at the camera. Smile. Okay.
a few seconds. Uh, Wes, uh, you are please uh, inactivate your your camera for now. Okay, let's let's do it once more because it, Wes was not. It's not supposed to be on the moderator picture. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Just a few more seconds. Okay, so is this acceptable for moderators? Right. All right, we're happy. Okay, now speakers, please um, activate your video, start video. Lawrence, is this speakers and moderators or just speakers? Oh, speakers and moderators. So we're going to grow the, the list. And uh, after that, we'll uh, invite all the attendees. We'll just promote all people to panelists. I'm still, um, I can't okay. start my video. Okay, we will help you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Hi. Okay. So activate video, everyone. Rebecca, Larry. Okay. Uh, attendees, any attendees that are supposed to be speakers that need to be promoted. Uh, raise your hand. Use the raise hand function. Hacky, are you there? Uh, let me see. Hacky, let me promote. Hacky, you're here? I Good. saw a hand. Um, can you uh, mute that? Gretchen, Gretchen, can you mute that? Thank you, Hacky, for joining. Um, any, any more speakers on the attendee list, list that I need to promote? Raise your hand if possible. Oh my God, 
Well, All right. Uh, let's see. I think uh, Magnus, you need to be back. Yes. All right. Are we are we ready? So I'm going to count to three and then uh, try to smile for a good like five seconds. Okay. <laughs> Okay, one, two, three. Okay. It's a motley crew. Magnus, I like the hat. I wasn't sure. I'll bring it back. That's cool. I'm I'm trying to manifest a <laughs> warm tropical place into the world. Some kind of post-COVID destination. It's still pretty warm here, so I'd like to manifest a little chilliness. It, it's only sixty degrees with a good time. right now. It's freezing. Uh, let's see. Where are you at, Magnus? I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. Got it. What are you going to do about all the English people who are still asleep, I think? <laughs> well, draw stick figures. <laughs> Lawrence, should we do a goofy picture? Uh, I think we need to take a couple more uh, because I, I'll, I'll let you take a look at this. Uh, okay, so apparently Judy is um, at, behind Zoom. So let let me right behind. Too. Yeah. So that. Let me stop my video and then that will kind of change people's positions. And then we'll see. Hi, Hecky. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Good to see you. Hi, Larry. Yep. Hey, how are you? <coughs> Great. Good. Thank you. Look at that. I have all good entry right next to one another. Whoa. Hey, Marcel. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to move Judy so that you are not behind the Zoom. So <laughs> we have uh, a couple of people in activate your, your video or, or we'll all inactivate our video and then uh, pop back in. Okay. How do you do that? Uh, stop video on the left lower corner and then start video again. I, I can, on my side, I can drag and drop people all around. Yeah, but- uh, Oh, you can too. But the Zoom- Hello? It's, it's picking its own people in, a, in, in this place. So there's the there's May I ask who's like going? It's the oh, pizza hey. guy. Oh God, we're supposed to pick up the food. Okay, I'll come get it. I'm in the middle of a conference. As soon as I'm done, I'll come and get it. Okay. 83 and people then, say hi. So for the attendees, hi. Well, there, there, there are, right there are not too many of you. We're okay. going to be able to include you after we take this picture or take maybe one or two pictures um this is looking a little bit better at, at least judy is not behind the zoom 
Obviously, it's beauty before age on this um, on this um, collection. Oh, let's see. Well, then you're in both. Um, okay. Ah. Oh. Okay. Let me. Do a little trick here. Sorry about that. <coughs> well, there's two Dr. Fungs. Which one is the imposter? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move people around a little bit because uh, oh now now it is. Oh, is this the Humvee or the Fung V? <laughs> okay, so no Iron Man fans. Uh, excuse you. I'm an Iron Man fan. Okay, now I'll stop video and then see. Hot Avengers assemble. Okay, just a few more seconds. Then we can shuffle people a little bit. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take the picture and I'll develop the film while you're, <laughs> while you're figuring this out. Okay. No. Yeah, we, we, we take the picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. your, your picture will look different from the Zoom one. The, uh, Judy is here behind the, the work Zoom. No I'm matter what I do. Too. So uh, let's look at the... So I count to three, and then we're going to just look at the camera for five seconds and smile at the camera. One, two, and three. <laughs> Very good, Magnus. That's good. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look. Okay, now um, we have to bring in attendees. So uh, any attendees that are interested and be, uh, be in the picture, yes, raise your hand. So um, the co-hosts, please help me with uh, bringing them into panelists, if you can. Lawrence, I have to run because I forgot I was supposed to pick up food. Uh, OK. <laughs> um, that's important, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, fun. Lawrence. I appreciate everything you did. It was amazing work. Thank you. It, it's a group effort. Bye, everybody. Bye. No. Okay, any, anyone else? I think I, I promoted everyone that wants to be promoted. Um, let's see. Different hat. Different hat. Magnus got light. Okay. Any, any other oh. attendees? I'm a, I'm a man of many hats. <laughs> and new, new accessories, too. 
<laughs> I'm playing a retro, the way that we used to do um, speakers in the good old days, sort of looking thoughtful and resting our heavy heads on our... <laughs> now we're all grinning like... Um, Magnus, Judith, Judith Singer is going to invent a new word for you, hatversity. <laughs> So it's going to be two pictures, okay? because uh, because it we cannot fit in. <laughs> okay, so let's do one at a time. So can can everyone see they they are on picture one or picture two? Can can you all see? Yeah, let's see. Mm -hmm. So yep. in any case, the the best bet is just smile, anyways when we are group one or group two, because uh, if the people may shift around. Okay. Uh, so one, two, three, smile. Okay, now we go to group two. All right, uh, don't walk away. Don't walk away, away. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> One, two, three, smile. All right. Okay. Yeah, you had noticed only you and I would sing Walk Away, Renee. Yeah. This is the first time all day my cat has walked into my lap and waved her tail in my face. <laughs> Hello, cat. What's the cat's name? Her name is Pepper. Hi, Pepper. She cares not. She cares Bye, not. Dr. Fong. Thank you. You're welcome. Cat's oh, thank, 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 thank you, Dr. Fong. Dr. Fong. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Fong. Thanks. Thanks. Dr. Fong. Dr. Fong. Dr. Fong. Dr. Fong. a standing ovation here. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Well done. Thank you, everyone. Incredible thank effort. You. Unbelievably good. Yes, thank you. Happy flopping. Very impressive. Been around for five full days. Thank you. How can we all just keep showing and have a bit of a party now? I want to have a party. Me too. Now the real fun can begin. You can organize it. For me, between Lawrence and Judy, three goals. Yay! Mm. We meeting Monday, Lawrence? Yes, we are meeting Monday. Uh, I I should have sent you the. You did. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure we still were. Yes, we are. Okay. So let let me show show you the photos. Yeah, Lawrence, are you planning to sleep between now and then? Basically. Of course. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll sleep a lot more the next two days. Don't don't forget about your own mental health. Kelly, I have to tell you, I really like your face. <laughs> Me? Yeah, you have such a sweet face. <laughs> you've, made my, you've made not just my day, but my week. I mean, I live with three teenagers, so I don't hear such nice things. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll be glowing the rest of the night now because you said that. So here's another picture <laughs> yeah, faces. with uh, some of our um, attendees. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Disappeared. There, there he is. Okay, anyway, looks good. Uh, I will, I will, if, if that's okay, I'll post the pictures sure. uh, to the to the website. So, um, so it may be easy for, for you to, um, to, to access. Thank you. 
Thank, Thank you. you. So finally, uh, at 6.19, where the meeting is adjourned. Good. You need a gavel. You need a gavel, Lawrence. No, we need Mr. Rogers. Thank you so much, all. It's a real uh, strong community. I look, at, I look at the tapes right. and stuff. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Thank you for Thank listening you. To, to us autistic voices and taking into consideration what we said. It was really appreciated. Oh. This is what we do. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. It's such a good feeling to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling growing inside. And when you wake up ready to say, I think I'll make a snappy new day. It's such a good feeling, a very good feeling. The feeling you know that I'll be back when the day is new and I'll have more ideas for you <laughs> and you'll have things you'll want to talk about. I will too. Goodbye neighbors. <laughs> My, Marcel, is that, is that sloth a stem toy? It was a stem toy. Yeah. Emotional support oh. animal. <laughs> All right, got it. Okay, bye everybody. Bye, Judy. Bye. Bye. Turn it off, click it off. Well, I'll see you on Monday, Arthur. I have to do it. All right. I'm going to end the meeting um, by pressing the red button. Are you ready? Press it. One, two, three. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you around.